Section 1 of The French Revolution, Volume 1, The Bastille. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Thomas Carroll. Volume 1, Book 1, Chapter 1. Louis the Well-Beloved. President Hinault, remarking on royal surnames of honor, how difficult it is often to ascertain not only why, but even when they were conferred, takes occasion in a sleek official way to make a philosophical re reflection. The surname of Bienne, well beloved, says he, which Louis the Fifteenth bears, will not leave posterity in the same doubt. This prince, in the year 1744, while hastening from one end of his kingdom to the other, and suspending his conquests in Flanders, that he might fly to the assistance of Alsace, was arrested at Metz by a milady who threatened to cut short his days. At the news of this, Paris, all in terror, seemed a city taken by a storm. The churches resounded with supplications and groans. The prayers of priests and people were every moment interrupted by their sobs, and it was from an interest so dear and tender that the surname of Bienname fashioned itself a title higher still than all the rest which this great prince has earned. Abridge, Chronology de l'Histoire de France, Paris, 1775, page 701. So stands it written in last memorial of that year, 1744. Thirty other years have come and gone, and this great prince again lies sick. But in how altered circumstances now! Churches resound not with excessive groanings. Paris is stoically calm. Sobs interrupt no prayers, for indeed none are offered, except priests' litanies, read or chanted at fixed money rate per hour, which are not liable to interruption. The shepherd of the people has been carried home from Little Trianon, heavy of heart, and has been put to bed in his own chateau of Versailles. The flock knows it and heeds it not. At most, in the immeasurable tide of French speech, which ceases not day after day, and only ebbs toward the short hours of night. May this of the royal sickness emerge from time to time is an article of news. Bets are doubtless depending, nay, some people express themselves loudly in the streets. Memoir de M. Le Baron, Bessonville, Paris, 1805, 59-90. But for the rest, on green field and steeple city, the May sun shines out, the May evening fades, and men ply their useful or useless business, as of no Lewis lay in danger. Dame Dubarry, indeed, might pray if she had a talent for it. Duke Davy Lord, too. My Pio in the Parliament, but May Pio. These, as they sit in their high places, with France harness under their feet, know well on what places they continue there. Look to it, Davy Lord, sharply as thou didst, or in the middle of St. Cast on Quiberon and the invading English. Thou. Covered if not with glory, yet with meal. Fortune was ever accounted inconstant, and each dog has but his day. Forlorn in our language, Duke de Guillon, some years ago, covered, as we said, with meal, nay, with worse. For Le Chalotes, the Breton parliamentier, accused him not only of poltroony and tyranny, but even of concussion, official plunder of money which accusations it was easier to get quashed by Baxter's influences than to get answered. Neither could th thoughts or even the tongues of men be tied. Thus, under disastrous eclipse, had this grand nephew of the great Richelieu to glide about, unworshipped by the world, resolute Toisio, the abrupt proud man, disdaining him, or even forgetting him. Little prospect but to glide into Gascony, to rebuild chateaus there. Arthur Young travels during the year 1787 to 889. Paris Saint Eminence, 1792, I 44. In die and glorious killing game. However, in the year 1770, a certain young soldier, Dumouri is by name, returning from Corsica, could see with sorrow at Compagne, the old king of France, on foot, with doffed hat, inside of his army, at the side of a Magnificent fight on, doing homage, the Dewberry. La Vie et Les, Memoirs du General Dumouriez, 
Paris, 1822. I, 141. Much lay therein. Thereby, for one thing, could de postpone the rebuilding of his chateau and build his fortunes first. For stout choice, so, would discern in the Dewberry nothing but a wonderfully dizzened scarlet woman, and go on his way as if she were not. Intolerable the source of sighs, tears, of pettings and pouting, which would not end till France, La France, as she named her royal valet, finally mustered heart to see Choiseul, and with that quivering elichil, tremblement du menton natural in such cases. Besson Vol Memoirs, 21. Faltered out a dismissal, dismissal of the last substantial man, but pacification of the scarlet woman. Thus de Beulon rose again, and culminated, and with him there rose Maupeu, the banisher of Parliament, who pledged to a refractory president at Kroll in Combrails on the top of steep rocks, inaccessible except by litters, there to consider himself. Likewise there rose A. There, dissolute financier, paying eight pence in the shilling, so that went to claim in some press at the playhouse. Where is Ab There? that he might reduce us to two-thirds. And so have these individuals built the Dom Daniel, or enchanted Dubery Dom, called in an Armida Palace, where they dwell pleasantly. Chancellor Malpio, playing blind man's buff with the scarlet enchantress, or gallantly presenting her with dwarf negroes. And the most Christian king has unspeakable peace within doors, whatever he may have without. My chancellor is a scoundrel, but I cannot do without him. Dulor, Histoire de Paris, Paris, 1824, 328. Beautiful Armida Palace, may the inmates live enchanted lives, wrapped in soft music of adoration, waited on by the splendors of the world, which nevertheless hangs wondrously as by a single hair. Should the most Christian king die? or even get seriously afraid of dying? For, alas, had not the fair haughty chateau to fly, with wet cheeks and flaming heart, from that fever she not met, driven forth by sour shavelings? She hardly returned, when fever and shavelings were both swept to the background. Pompadour, too, when Damien's wounded royalty slightly, under the fifth rib, and our drive to Trayanon went off futile, in shrieks and madly shaken torches, had to pack, and be in readiness, yet did not go, the wound not proving poisoned. For his majesty has religious faith, believes, at least in a devil, and now a third peril, and who knows what may be in it, for the doctors look grave, ask privily. If his majesty had not the smallpox long ago, and doubt it may be a, been a false kind, yes, my peril, pucker those sinister brows of thine, and peer out on it with thy malign rat eyes. It is a questionable case. Surely that man is mortal. That with the life of one mortal snaps irrevocably the wonderfulest talisman. An old dewberry dom rushes off with tumult into infinite space. And ye, as subterranean apparitions are wont, vanish utterly, leaving only a spell of sulfur. These and what hold of these may pray to Beelzebub, or whoever will hear them. But from the rest of France, there comes, as was said, no prayer, or one of an opposite character, expressed openly in the street. Chateau or hotel, where an enlightened philosophism scrutinizes many things, is not given to prayer. Neither are Rossbatch victories, Terry finances, nor say, only 60,000 betrays the cachet, which is no pure share, persuasives towards that, oh, head on prayers, who were fret spitting by black art, with plague after plague, and lying now in shame and pain, with the harlot's foot on its leg, what prayer can come? Those lake scarecrows, that proud hunger stricken through all highways and byways of French existence. Will they pray? The dull millions, that, in the workshop or furrow field, glide for that at the wheel of labor, like halter gin horses, that blind so much the quarter, 
or they that in the Bessetre Hospital ate to a bed, lie waiting in the Manumachin. Dim are those heads of theirs, dull stagnant those hearts. To them the great sovereign is known, mainly as the great the greater of bread. If they hear of his sickness, they will answer with a dull taunt, he poor Louis, or with the question, Will he die? Yes, will he die? That is now, for all Fred, the great question and hope, or by alone, the king's sickness has still some interest. End of section one. Section two of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 1, Chapter 2. Realized Ideals. Such a changed France have we, and a changed Louis, changed truly, and further than thou yet seest. To the eye of history many things, in that sick room of Louis, are now visible, which to the courtiers there present were invisible. For indeed it is well said, in every object there is inexhaustible meaning, the eye sees in it what the eye brings means of seeing. To Newton, and to Newton's dog diamond, what a different pair of universes, while the painting on the optical retina of both was, most likely, the same. Let the reader here, in this sick room of Louis, endeavour to look with the mind, too. Time was when men could, so to speak, of a given man, by nourishing and decorating him with fit appliances, to the due pitch, make themselves a king, almost as the bees do, and what was still more to the purpose, loyally obey him when made. The man so nourished and decorated, thenceforth named royal, does verily bear rule, and is said and even thought to be, for example, prosecuting conquests in Flanders, when he lets himself like luggage be carried thither, and no light luggage, covering miles of road. For he has his unblushing Chateau Roux, with her bandboxes and rouge pots, at his side, so that at every new station a wooden gallery must be run up between their lodgings. He has not only his maison bouche and valetaille, without end, but his very troop of players with their pasteboard coulisses, thunder barrels, their kettles, fiddles, stage wardrobes, portable larders, and chaffering and quarrelling enough, all mounted in wagons, tumbrils, second hand chaises, sufficient not to conquer Flanders but the patience of the world. With such a flood of loud jingling appurtenances does he lumber along, prosecuting his conquests in Flanders, wonderful to behold. So nevertheless it was and had been. To some solitary thinker it might seem strange, but even to him inevitable, not unnatural. For ours is a most fictile world, and man is the most vincent plastic of creatures, a world not fixable, not fathomable, an unfathomable somewhat, which is not we which we can work with, and live amidst, and model, miraculously in our miraculous being, and name world. But if the very rocks and rivers, as metaphysic teaches, are in strict language, made by those outward senses of ours, how much more, by the inward sense, are all phenomena of the spiritual kind, dignities, authorities, holies, unholies, which inward sense, moreover, is not permanent like the outward ones, but forever growing and changing. Does not the black African take of sticks and old clothes, say exported Monmouth Street cast clothes, what will suffice, and of these, cunningly combining them, fabricate for himself an eidolon, idol or thing seen, and name it Mumbo Jumbo, which he can thenceforth pray to, with upturned awestruck eye, not without hope, the white European mocks, but ought rather to consider, and see whether he, at home, could not do the like a little more wisely. So it was, we say, in those conquests of Flanders thirty years ago, but so it no longer is, Alas, much more lies sick than poor Louis, not the French king only, but the French kingship. This, too, after long rough tear and wear, is breaking down. The world is all so changed. So much that seemed vigorous has sunk decrepit. So much that was not is beginning to be. Born over the Atlantic, to the closing ear of Louis, king by the grace of God, what sounds are these? Muffled ominous, new in our centuries. Boston Harbor is black with unexpected tea. Behold the Pennsylvanian Congress gather and ere long, on Bunker Hill, democracy announcing, in rifle volleys, death-winged, under her star banner, to the tune of Yankee Doodle Doo, that she is born, and, whirlwind-like, will envelop the whole world. Sovereigns die in sovereignties. How all dies, and is for a time only, is a time phantasm, yet reckons itself real. The Merovingian kings, slowly wending on their bullock carts through the streets of Paris, with their long hair flowing, have all wended slowly on, 
into eternity. Charlemagne sleeps at Salzburg, with truncheon grounded, only fable expecting that he will awaken. Charles the Hammer, Pepin Bowlegged, where now is their eye of menace, their voice of command? Rollo and his shaggy northmen cover not the Seine with ships, but have sailed off on a longer voyage. The hair of Towhead, tete de dupe, now needs no combing. Iron cutter, tie affair, cannot cut a cobweb. Shrill Fredegonda, shrill Brunhilde have had out their hot life scold, and lie silent, their hot life frenzy cooled. Neither from that black tower de Nell descends now darkling the doomed gallant in his sack, to the Seine waters, plunging into night. For Dame de Nell how cares not for this world's gallantry, heeds not this world's scandal. Dame de Nell is herself gone into night, they're all gone, sunk, down, down, with the tumult they made. And the rolling and the trampling of ever new generations passes over them, and they hear it not any more forever. And yet withal has there not been realized somewhat? Consider, to go no further, these strong stone edifices, and what they hold, mud-town of the borderers, Lutetia Perisiorum, or Berisiorum, has paved itself, has spread over all the St. Islands, and far and wide on each bank, and become city of Paris, sometimes boasting to be Athens of Europe, and even capital of the universe. Stone towers frown aloft, long-lasting, grim with a thousand years. Cathedrals are there, and a creed, or memory of a creed, in them, palaces and a state and law. Thou seest the smoke vapor, unextinguished breath as of a thing living, labor's thousand hammers ring on her anvils. Also a more miraculous labor works noiselessly, not with the hand but with the thought. How have cunning workmen in all crafts, with their cunning head and right hand, tamed the four elements to be their ministers, yoking the winds to their sea chariot, making the very stars their nautical timepiece, and written and collected a bibliothèque du roi, among whose books is the Hebrew book, a wondrous race of creatures. These have been realized, and what of skill is in these? Call not the past time, with all its confused wretchedness, a lost one. Observe, however, that of man's whole terrestrial possessions and attainments, unspeakably the noblest are his symbols, divine or divine seeming, under which he marches and fights, with victorious assurance in this life battle, what we can call his realized ideals, of which realized ideals, omitting the rest, consider only these two, his church or spiritual guidance, his kingship or temporal one. The church, what a word was there, richer than Golconda and the treasures of the world. In the heart of the remotest mountains rises the little kirk, the dead all slumbering round it, under their white memorial stones, in hope of a happy resurrection. Dull wert thou, O reader, if never in any hour, say of moaning midnight, when such kirk hung spectral in the sky, and being was as if swallowed up of darkness, it spoke to thee, things unspeakable, that went into thy soul's soul. Strong was he that had a church, what we can call a church, he stood thereby, though, in the center of immensities, in the conflux of eternities, yet manlike towards God and man. The vague shoreless universe had become for him a firm city, and dwelling which he knew. Such virtue was in belief, in these words well spoken, I believe. Well might men prize their credo, and raise stateliest temples for it, and reverend hierarchies, and give it the tithe of their substance. It was worth living for and dying for. Neither was that an inconsiderable moment when wild-armed men first raised their strongest aloft on the buckler throne, and with clanging armor and hearts said solemnly, Be thou our acknowledged strongest. In such acknowledged strongest, well-named king, conning, canning, or man that was able, what a symbol shone now for them, significant with the destinies of the world, a symbol of true guidance in return for loving obedience. Properly, if he knew it, the prime want of man, a symbol which might be called sacred. For is there not, in reverence for what is better than we, an indestructible sacredness? On which ground, too, it was well said, there lay in the acknowledged strongest a divine right, as surely there might in the strongest, whether acknowledged or not, considering who made him strong. And so, in the midst of confusions and unutterable incongruities, as all growth is confused, did this of royalty, with loyalty environing it, spring up, and grow mysteriously, subduing and assimilating, for a principle of life was in it, till it also had grown world great, and was among the main facts of our modern existence, such a fact that Louis the Fourteenth, for example, could answer the expostulatory magistrate with his l'état c'est moi, the state, I am the state, and be replied to by silence and abashed looks. So far had accident and forethought, had your Louis Elevenths, with the leaden virgin in their hat-band, and torture-wheels and conical oubliettes, man-eating, under their feet, your Henri Fourths, 
with their prophesied social millennium, when every peasant should have his fowl in the pot, and on the whole, the fertility of this most fertile existence, named of good and evil, brought it, in the matter of the kingship. Wondrous, concerning which may we not again say, that in the huge mass of evil, as it rolls and swells, there is ever some good working imprisoned, working towards deliverance and triumph? How such ideals do realize themselves, and grow wondrously from amid the incongruous ever-fluctuating chaos of the actual. This is what world history, if it teach anything, has to teach us, how they grow, and after long stormy growth, bloom out mature, supreme, then quickly, for the blossom is brief, fall into decay, sorrowfully dwindle, and crumble down, or rush down, noisily or noiselessly disappearing. The blossom is so brief, as of some centennial cactus flower, which after a century of waiting shines out for hours. Thus from the day when rough Clovis, in the Champ de Mars, in sight of his whole army, had to cleave retributively the head of that rough Frank, with sudden battle-axe, and the fierce words, It was thus thou clavest the vase, son remis and mine, at Soissons. Forward to Louis the Grand and his l'état et moi, we count some twelve hundred years, and now this the very next Louis is dying, and so much dying with him. Nay, thus too, if Catholicism, with and against feudalism, but not against nature and her bounty, gave us English a Shakespeare and era of Shakespeare, and so produced a blossom of Catholicism, it was not till Catholicism itself, so far as law could abolish it, had been abolished here. But of those decadent ages in which no ideal either grows or blossoms, when belief and loyalty have passed away, and only the cant and false echo of them remains, and all solemnity has become pageantry, and the creed of persons in authority has become one of two things, an imbecility or a Machiavellianism. Alas, of these ages world history can take no notice. They have to become compressed more and more, and finally suppressed in the annals of mankind, blotted out as spurious, which indeed they are. Hapless ages, wherein, if ever in any, it is an unhappiness to be born. To be born, and to learn only, by every tradition and example, that God's universe is Belial's, and a lie, and the supreme quack, the hierarch of men, in which mournfulest faith, Nevertheless, do we not see whole generations, two and sometimes even three successively, live, what they call living, and vanish without chance of reappearance? In such a decadent age, or one fast verging that way, had our poor Louis been born. Grant also that if the French kingship had not, by course of nature, longed to live, he of all men was the man to accelerate nature. The blossom of French royalty, cactus-like, has accordingly made an astonishing progress. In those Metz days, it was still standing with all its petals, though bedimmed by Orléans regents and Rouet ministers and cardinals. But now, in 1774, we behold it bald, and the virtue nigh gone out of it. Disastrous indeed does it look with those same realized ideals, one and all. The church, which in its palmy season, 700 years ago, could make an emperor wait barefoot in penance shift three days in the snow, has for centuries seen itself decaying reduced even to forget old purposes and enmities, in joint interest with the kingship. On this younger strength it would fain stay its decrepitude, and these two will henceforth stand and fall together. Alas, the Sorbonne still sits there, in its old mansion, but mumbles only jargon of dotage, and no longer leads the consciences of men. Not the Sorbonne. It is encyclopédie, philosophie, and who knows what nameless innumerable multitude of ready writers, profane singers, romancers, players, disputators, and pamphleteers that now form the spiritual guidance of the world. The world's practical guidance too is lost, or has glided into the same miscellaneous hands. Who is it that the king, able man named also Roi, Rex, or director, now guides? His own huntsmen and prickers. When there is to be no hunt, it is well said, Le Roi ne fera rien. Today his majesty will do nothing. He lives and lingers there, because he is living there, and none has yet laid hands on him. The nobles, in like manner, have nearly ceased either to guide or misguide, and are now, as their master is, little more than ornamental figures. It is long since they have done with butchering one another or their king. The workers, protected, encouraged by majesty, have ages ago built walled towns, and there ply their crafts. Will permit no robber baron to live by the saddle, but maintain a gallows to prevent it. Ever since that period of the fronde, the noble has changed his fighting sword into a court rapier, and now loyally attends his king as ministering satellite, divides the spoil, not now by violence and murder, but by soliciting and finesse, 
These men call themselves supports of the throne, singular gilt pasteboard caryatides in that singular edifice. For the rest, their privileges every way are now much curtailed. That law authorizing a seigneur, as he returned from hunting, to kill not more than two serfs, and refresh his feet in their warm blood and bowels, has fallen into perfect desuetude, and even into incredibility. For if Deputy Lapoule can believe in it, and call for the abrogation of it, so cannot we. No Charleroi for these last fifty years, though never so fond of shooting, has been in use to bring down slaters and plumbers, and see them roll from their roofs, but contents himself with partridges and grouse. Close viewed, their industry and function is that of dressing gracefully and eating sumptuously. As for their debauchery and depravity, it is perhaps unexampled since the era of Tiberius and Commodus. Nevertheless, one has still partly a feeling with the Lady Marichal. Depend on it, sir. God thinks twice before damning a man of that quality. These people of old surely had virtues, uses, or they could not have been there. Nay, one virtue they are still required to have, for mortal man cannot live without a conscience, the virtue of perfect readiness to fight duels. Such are the shepherds of the people. And now how fares it with the flock? With the flock, as is inevitable, it fares ill, and ever worse. They are not tended, they are only regularly shorn. They are sent for, to do statute labor, to pay statute taxes, to fatten battlefields, named a bed of honor, with their bodies, in quarrels which are not theirs. Their hand and toil is in every possession of man, but for themselves they have little or no possession, untaught, uncomforted, unfed, to pine dully in thick obscuration, in squalid destitution and obstruction. This is the lot of the millions, peuple taillable et corvéable, à merci et miséricorde. In Brittany they once rose in revolt at the first introduction of pendulum clocks, thinking it had something to do with the gabelle. Paris requires to be cleared out periodically by the police, and the horde of hunger-stricken vagabonds to be sent wandering again over space, for a time. During one such periodical clearance, says Lecretel, in May 1750, the police had presumed withal to carry off some reputable people's children in the hope of extorting ransoms for them. The mothers fill the public places with cries of despair. Crowds gather, get excited. So many women in distraction run about exaggerating the alarm. An absurd and horrible fable arises among the people. It is said that the doctors have ordered a great person to take baths of young human blood for the restoration of his own, all spoiled by debaucheries. Some of the writers, adds Lacretel, quite coolly, were hanged on the following days. The police went on. O oh, ye poor naked wretches! And this, then, is your inarticulate cry to heaven, as of a dumb tortured animal, crying from uttermost depths of pain and debasement? Do these azure skies, like a dead crystalline vault, only reverberate the echo of it on you? Respond to it only by hanging on the following days? Not so, not forever. Ye are heard in heaven. And the answer, too, will come, in a horror of great darkness and shakings of the world, and a cup of trembling which all the nations shall drink. Remark, meanwhile, how from amid the wrecks and dust of this universal decay new powers are fashioning themselves, adapted to the new time and its destinies. Besides the old noblesse, originally of fighters, there is a new recognized noblesse of lawyers, whose gala day and proud battle day even now is, an unrecognized noblesse of commerce, powerful enough with money in its pocket. Lastly, powerfulest of all, least recognized of all, a noblesse of literature, without steel on their thigh, without gold in their purse, but with the grand thaumaturgic faculty of thought in their head. French philosophism has arisen, in which little word how much do we include? Here indeed lies properly the cardinal symptom of the whole widespread melody. Faith is gone out, skepticism is come in, evil abounds and accumulates, no man has faith to withstand it, to amend it, to begin by amending himself. It must even go on accumulating, while hollow languor and vacuity is the lot of the upper, and want and stagnation of the lower, and universal misery is very certain, what other thing is certain? That a lie cannot be believed. Philosophism knows only this. Her other belief is mainly that, in spiritual, supersensual matters, no belief is possible. Unhappy! Nay, as yet the contradiction of a lie is some kind of belief. But the lie with its contradiction once swept away, what will remain? The five unsatiated senses will remain the sixth insatiable sense of vanity, the whole demonic nature of man will remain, hurled forth to rage blindly without rule or reign, savage itself, 
yet with all the tools and weapons of civilization, a spectacle new in history. In such a France, as in a powder tower, where fire unquenched and now unquenchable is smoking and smouldering all around, has Louis the Fifteenth lain down to die. With pompadourism and dubariism, his fleur-de-lis has been shamefully struck down in all lands and on all seas. Poverty invades even the royal exchequer, and tax farming can squeeze out no more. There is a quarrel of twenty-five years standing with the Parliament. Everywhere want, dishonesty, unbelief, and hot-brained sciolists for state physicians. It is a portentous hour. Such things can the eye of history see in this sick room of King Louis, which were invisible to the courtiers there. It is twenty years, gone Christmas Day, since Lord Chesterfield, summing up what he had noted of this same France, wrote and sent off by post the following words that have become memorable. In short, all the symptoms which I have ever met with in history, previous to great changes and revolutions in government, now exist and daily increase in France. End of section 2「Section 3 of The French Revolution, Volume 1, by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Wayman. The French Revolution, by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 1, Chapter 3 viaticum for the present however the grand question with the governors of france is shall extreme unction or other ghostly viaticum to louis not to france be administered it is a deep question for if administered if so much is spoken of must not on the very threshold of the business which du barry vanish hardly to return should louis even recover with her vanishes duke d'aiguillon and company and all their armida palace as was said chaos swallows the whole again and there is left nothing but a smell of brimstone but then on the other hand what will the dauphinists and choiseulists say nay what may the royal martyr himself say should he happen to get deadly worse without getting delirious for the present he still kisses the dubarry hand so we from the ante-room can note but afterwards doctors bulletins may run as they are ordered but it is confluent smallpox of which as is whispered too the gatekeeper's once so buxom daughter lies ill and louis the fifteenth is not a man to be trifled with in his viaticum was he not wont to catechise his very girls in the parc aux cerfs and pray with and for them that they might preserve their orthodoxy a strange fact not an unexampled one for there is no animal so strange as man for the moment indeed it were all well could archbishop beaumont but be prevailed upon uh, to wink with one eye alas beaumont would himself so fain do it for singular to tell the church too and whole posthumous hope of jesuitism now hangs by the apron of this same unmentionable woman but then the force of public opinion rigorous christophe de beaumont who has spent his life in persecuting hysterical jansenists and incredulous non-confessors or even their dead bodies if no better might be how shall he now open heaven's gate and give absolution with the corpus delicti still under his nose our grand almoner rochemont for his part will not higgle with a royal sinner about turning of the key but there are other churchmen there is a king's confessor foolish abbe moudon and fanaticism and decency are not yet extinct on the whole what is to be done the doors can be well watched the medical bulletin adjusted and much as usual to be hoped for from time and chance the doors are well watched no improper figure can enter indeed few wish to enter for the putrid infection reaches even to the oeil de boeuf so that more than fifty fall sick and ten die madame the princesses alone wait at the loathsome sick-bed impelled by filial piety the three princesses grey sheaf 
Kosh, Rag, Snip, Pig, as he was wont to name them, are assiduous there, when all have fled. The fourth princess, Luke, Dud, as we guess, is already in the nunnery, and can only give her orisons. Poor Grey and sisterhood, they have never known a father. Such is the hard bargain grandeur must make. Scarcely at the debotte, when royalty took off its boots, could they snatch up their enormous hoops, gird the long train round their waists, huddle on their black cloaks of taffeta up to the very chin. And so, in fit appearance of full dress, every evening at six, walk majestically in, receive their royal kiss on the brow, and then walk majestically out again, to embroidery, small scandal, prayers, and vacancy if majesty came some morning with coffee of its own making and swallowed it with them hastily while the dogs were uncoupling for the hunt it was received as a grace of heaven poor withered ancient women in the wild tossings that yet await your fragile existence before it be crushed and broken as ye fly through hostile countries over tempestuous seas are almost taken by the turks and wholly in the sansculotic earthquake know not your right hand from your left be this always an assured place in your remembrance for the act was good and loving to us also it is a little sunny spot in that dismal howling waste where we hardly find another meanwhile what shall an impartial prudent courtier do in these delicate circumstances while not only death or life but even sacrament or no sacrament is a question the skilfullest may falter few are so happy as the duke d'orleans and the prince de conde who can themselves with volatile salts attend the king's antechamber and at the same time send their brave sons duke de chartres egalite that is to be duke de bourbon one day conde too and famous among dotards to wait upon the dauphin with another few it is a resolution taken jacta est alia old richelieu when beaumont driven by public opinion is at last for entering the sick-room will twitch him by the rocher into a recess and there with his old dissipated mastiff face and the oiliest vehemence be seen pleading and even as we judge by beaumont's change of colour prevailing that the king be not killed by a proposition in divinity duke de fronsac son of richelieu can follow his father when the curé of versailles whimpers something about sacraments he will threaten to throw him out of the window if he mentions such a thing happy these we may say but to the rest that hover between two opinions is it not trying he who would understand to what a pass catholicism and much else had now got and how the symbols of the holiest have become gambling dice of the basest must read the narrative of those things by Besenfal and Soulavi and the other court newsmen of the time. He will see the Versailles galaxy, all scattered asunder, grouped into new ever-shifting constellations. There are nods and sagacious glances, go-betweens, silk dowagers mysteriously gliding, with smiles for this constellation, sighs for that. There is tremor of hope or desperation in several hearts. There is the pale grinning shadow of death, ceremoniously ushered along by another grinning shadow of etiquette. At intervals the growl of chapel organs, like prayer by machinery, proclaiming, as in a kind of horrid diabolic horse-laughter, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. End of section 3《Section Section Four of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elliot Gage. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume One, Book One, Chapter Four. Louis the Unforgotten. Or Louis, with these it is a hollow phantasmagory, where like mimes they mope and maul and utter false sounds for hire. 
but with thee it is frightful earnest. Frightful to all men is death, from of old named King of Terrors, our little compact home of an existence where we dwelt complaining, yet as in a home is passing in dark agonies, into an unknown of separation, foreignness, unconditioned possibility. The heathen emperor asks of his soul, Into what places art thou departing? The Catholic king must answer, To the judgment bar of the Most High God. Yes, it is a summing up of life, a final settling, and giving in the accounts of the deeds done in the body. They are done now, and lie there unalterable and do bear their fruits, long as eternity shall last. Louis XV had always the kingliest abhorrence of death. Unlike that praying Duke of Orleans, Egalite's grandfather, for indeed several of them had a touch of madness, who honestly believed that there was no death. He, if the court newsman can be believed, started up once on a time, glowing with sulphurous contempt and indignation on his poor secretary, who had stumbled on the words, Fouwa de Spania, the late king of Spain. Fouwa, monsieur? Monseigneur, hastily answered the trembling but adroit man of business. C'est ton tetra qu'il prenant. Tis a title they take. Louis we say was not so happy but he did what he could he would not suffer death to be spoken of avoided the sight of churchyards funereal monuments and whatsoever could bring it to mind it is the resource of the ostrich who hard hunted sticks his foolish head in the ground and would fain forget that his foolish unseeing body is not unseen too or sometimes with a spasmodic antagonism significant of the same thing and of more he would go or stopping his court carriages would send into churchyards and ask how many new graves there were to-day though it gave his poor pompadour the disagreeablest qualms we can figure the thought of louis that day when all royally comparisoned for hunting he met at some sudden turning in the wood of senar a ragged peasant with a coffin for whom it was a poor brother's slave, whom Majesty had sometimes noticed slaving in those quarters. What did he die of? Of hunger. The king gave his steed the spur. But figure his thought when death is now clutching at his own heartstrings, unlooked for, inexorable. Yes, poor Louis. Death has found thee. No palace walls or lifeguards gorgeous tapestries of gilt buckram of stiffest ceremonial could keep him out but here he is here at thy very life breath and will extinguish it thou whose whole existence hitherto was a chimera and scenic show at length becomest a reality sumptuous versailles bursts asunder like a dream into a void immensity time is done and all the scaffolding of time falls wrecked with hideous clangor round thy soul the pale kingdoms yawn open there must thou enter naked and unkinged and await what is appointed thee unhappy man there as thou turnest in dull agony on thy bed of weariness what a thought is thine purgatory and hell-fire now all too possible in the prospect in the retrospect alas what things didst thou do that were not better undone what mortal didst thou generously help what sorrow hadst thou mercy on do the five hundred thousand ghosts who sank shamefully on so many battlefields from rossbach to quebec that thy harlot might take revenge on an epigram crowd around thee in this hour thy foul harem the curses of mothers the tears and infamy of daughters miserable man thou hast done evil as thou couldst thy whole existence seems one hideous abortion and mistake of nature the use and meaning of thee not yet known wert thou a fabulous griffin devouring the works of men daily dragging virgins to thy cave clad also in scales that no spear could pierce no spear but death a griffin not fabulous but real frightful o lewis seem these moments for thee we will pry no further into the horrors of a sinner's deathbed 
and yet let no meanest man lay flattering unction to his soul. Lewis was a ruler, but art thou not also one? His wide France, look at it from the fixed stars, themselves not yet infinitude, is no wider than thy narrow brickfield, where thou too didst faithfully or didst unfaithfully. Man, symbol of eternity, imprisoned into time, it is not thy works which are all mortal, infinitely little, and the greatest no greater than the least, but only the spirit thou workest in that can have worth or continuance. But reflect in any case what a life problem this of poor Louis, when he rose as bien ami from that met sickbed, really was. What son of Adam could have swayed such incoherences into coherence? Could he? Blindest fortune alone has cast him on top of it. He swims there, can as little sway it as the drift log sways the wind tossed, moon stirred Atlantic. What have I done to be so loved? he said then. He may say now, What have I done to be so hated? Thou hast done nothing, poor Louis. Thy fault is properly even this, that thou didst nothing. What could poor Louis do? Abdicate and wash his hands of it, in favor of the first that would accept? Other clear wisdom there was none for him. As it was, he stood gazing dubiously, the absurdest mortal extant, a very solecism incarnate, into the absurdest confused world wherein at last nothing seemed so certain as that he, the incarnate solecism, had five senses that were flying tables, tables volantes, which vanished through the floor to come back reloaded, and a parc aux serres, whereby at least we have again this historical curiosity, a human being in an original position, swimming passively, as on some boundless mother of dead dogs towards issues which he partly saw for lewis had withal a kind of insight in him so uh, when a new minister of marine or what else it might be came announcing his new era the scarlet woman would hear from the lips of majesty at supper he laid out his ware like another promised the beautifulest things in the world not a thing of which will come he does not know this region he will see or again tis the twentieth time i hear all that france will never get a navy i believe how touching also was this if i were lieutenant of police i would prohibit those paris cabriolets doomed mortal for is it not a doom to be a solecism incarnate a new wah when wah king do nothing but with the strangest new mayor of the palace no bow-legged pippin now but that same cloud-capped fire-breathing spectre of democracy incalculable which is enveloping the world was louis no wickeder than this or the other private do nothing and eat all such as we often enough see under the name of man and even man of pleasure cumbering god's diligent creation for a time say wretcheder his life solecism was seen and felt of a whole scandalized world him endless oblivion cannot engulf and swallow to endless depths not yet for a generation or two however be this as it will we remark not without interest that on the evening of the fourth dame du barry issues from the sick-room with perceptible trouble in her visage it is the fourth evening of may year of grace seventeen seventy four such a whispering in the Oya de Bouffe. He is dying, then? What can be said is that Dubarry seems making up her packages. She sails weeping through her gilt boudoirs as if leave-taking. D'Aiguillon and company are now near their last car, and nevertheless they will not yet throw up the game. But as for the sacramental controversy, it is as good as settled without being mentioned louis can send for his abbe moudon in the course of the next night be confessed by him some say for the space of seventeen minutes and demand the sacraments of his own accord 
nay already in the afternoon behold is not this your sorceress dubarry with her handkerchief at her eyes mounting d'aiguillon's chariot rolling off in his duchess's consolatory arms she is gone and her place knows her no more vanish false sorceress into space needless to hover at neighboring ruel for thy day is done shut are the royal palace gates for evermore hardly in coming years shalt thou under cloud of night descend once in black domino like a black night bird and disturb the fair antoinette's music party in the park all birds of paradise flying from thee and musical windpipes growing mute thou unclean yet unmalignant not unpitiable thing what a course was thine from that first truckle bed in joan of arc's country where thy mother bore thee with tears to an unnamed father forward through the lowest subterranean depths and over the highest sunlit heights of harlotdom and rascaldom to the guillotine axe which shears away thy vainly whimpering head rest there uncursed only buried and abolished what else befitted thee louis meanwhile is in considerable impatience for his sacraments sends more than once to the window to see whether they are not coming be of comfort louis what comfort thou canst they are under way those sacraments towards six in the morning they arrive cardinal ron almana rochemont is here in pontificals with his pyxes and his tools he approaches the royal pillow elevates his wafer mutters or seems to mutter somewhat and so as the abbe georgel in words that stick to one expresses it has louis made the amend honourable to god so does your jesuit construe it wah wah as the wild clotaire groaned out when life was departing what great god is this that pulls down the strength of the strongest kings the amman nor abel what legal apology you will to god but not if d'aiguillon can help it to man du barry still hovers in his mansion at ruel and while there is life there is hope ron almana rochemont accordingly for he seems to be in the secret has no sooner seen his pyxes and gear repacked than he is stepping majestically forth again as if the work were done but king's confessor abbe modoin starts forward with anxious acidulent face twitches him by the sleeve whispers in his ear whereupon the poor cardinal must turn round and declare audibly that his majesty repents of any subjects of scandal he may have given au pu donne and purposes by the strength of heaven assisting him to avoid the like for the future words listened to by richelieu with mastiff face growing blacker answered to aloud with an epithet which Val will not repeat old richelieu conqueror of minorca companion of flying table orgies perforator of bedroom walls is thy day also done alas the chapel organs may keep going the shrine of saint genevieve be let down and pulled up again without effect in the evening the whole court with dauphin and dauphiné assist at the chapel priests are hoarse with chanting their prayers of forty hours and the heaving bellows blow almost frightful for the very heaven blackens battering rain torrents dash with thunder almost drowning the organ's voice and the electric fire flashes make the very flambeau on the altar pale so that the most as we are told retired when it was over with hurried steps in a state of meditation of roquemont and said little or nothing so it has lasted for the better half of a fortnight the dubarry gone almost a week besenval says all the world was getting impatient que cela fini that poor louis would have done with it it is now the tenth of may seventeen seventy four he will soon have done now this tenth may day falls into the loathsome sickbed but dull unnoticed there for they that look out of the windows are quite darkened the cistern wheel moves discordant on its axis life like a spent steed is panting towards the goal in their remote apartments dauphine and dauphine stand road ready all grooms and equiaries booted and spurred waiting for some signal to escape the house of pestilence 
one grudges to interfere with the beautiful theatrical candle which madame campon has lit on this occasion and blown out at the moment of death what candles might be lit or blown out in so large an establishment as that of versailles no man at such distance would like to affirm at the same time it was two o'clock in a may afternoon and these royal stables must have been some five or six hundred yards from the royal sick-room the candle does threaten to go out in spite of us it remains burning indeed in her fantasy throwing light on much in those memoirs of hers and hark across the oya de bouffe what sound is that sound terrible and absolutely like thunder it is the rush of the whole court rushing as in wager to salute the new sovereigns hail to your majesties the dauphine and dauphine are king and queen overpowered with many emotions they fall on their knees together and with streaming tears exclaim o oh god guide us protect us we are too young to reign too young indeed thus in any case with a sound absolutely like thunder has the horror log of time struck and an old era passed away the louis that was lies forsaken a mass of abhorred clay abandoned to some poor persons and priests of the chapelle ardenant who make haste to put him in two lead coffins pouring in abundant spirits of wine the new louis with his court is rolling towards choisy through the summer afternoon the royal tears still flow but a word mispronounced by monsignor de artois sets them all laughing and they weep no more light mortals how he walk through your light life minuet over bottomless abysses divided from you by a film for the rest the proper authorities felt that no funeral could be too unceremonious Besenval himself thinks it was unceremonious enough two carriages containing two noblemen of usher species and a versailles clerical person some score of mounted pages some fifty palfreniers these with torches but not so much as in black start from versailles on the second evening with their leaden buyer at a high trot they start and keep up that pace for the jibes brocards of those parisians who stand planted in two rows all the way to st denis and give vent to their pleasantry the characteristic of the nation do not tempt one to slacken towards midnight the vaults of st denis receive their own unwept by any eye of all these if not by poor Locke, his neglected daughters whose nunnery is hard by him they crush down and huddle underground in this impatient way him and his era of sin and tyranny and shame for behold a new era is come the future all the brighter that the past was base end of section four recording by elliot gage Section 5 of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Golding. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 1, Astrea Redux. A paradoxical philosopher, carrying to the uttermost length that aphorism of Montesquieu's, happy the people whose annals are tiresome has said happy the people whose annals are vacant in which saying mad as it looks may there not still be found some grain of reason for truly as it has been written silence is divine and of heaven so in all earthly things too there is a silence which is better than any speech consider it well the event the thing which can be spoken of and recorded is it not in all cases some disruption some solution of continuity were it even a glad event it involves change involves loss of active force and so far either in the past or in the present is an irregularity a disease stillest perseverance were our blessedness not dislocation and alteration could they be avoided the oak grows silently in the forest a thousand years only in the thousandth year when the woodsman arrives with his axe is there heard an echoing through the solitudes and the oak announces itself when, with a far-sounding crash, it falls. How silent, too, was the planting of the acorn, scattered from the lap of some wandering wind. 
Nay, when our oak flowered, or put on its leaves, its glad events, what shout of proclamation could there be? Hardly from the most observant a word of recognition. These things befell not, they were slowly done, not in an hour, but through the flight of days. What was to be said of it? This hour seemed altogether as the last was, as the next would be. It is thus everywhere that foolish rumour babbles not of what was done, but of what was misdone or undone, and foolish history, ever more or less the written epitomised synopsis of rumour, know so little that were not as well unknown. Attila invasions, Walter the penniless crusades, Sicilian vespers, thirty years' wars, mere sin and misery, not work, but hindrance of work. For the earth, all this while, was yearly green and yellow with her kind harvests. The hand of the craftsman, the mind of the thinker, rested not. And so, after all, and in spite of all, we have this so glorious high-domed blossoming world, concerning which poor history may well ask, with wonder, whence it came. She knows so little of it, knows so much of what obstructed it, what would have rendered it impossible. Such, nevertheless, by necessity or foolish choice, is her rule and practice, whereby that paradox, happy the people whose annals are vacant, is not without its true side. And yet, what seems more pertinent to note here, there is a stillness, not of unobstructed growth, but of passive inertness, and symptom of imminent downfall. As victory is silent, so is defeat. Of the opposing forces, the weaker has resigned itself. The stronger marches on, noiseless now, but rapid, inevitable. The fall and overturn will not be noiseless. How all grows, and has its period, even as the herbs of the fields, be it annual, centennial, millennial. All grows and dies, each by its own wondrous laws, in wondrous fashion of its own. Spiritual things most wondrously of all. Inscrutable, to the wisest, are these latter, not to be prophesied of or understood. If, when the oak stands proudliest flourishing to the eye, you know that its heart is sound, it is not so within the man, how much less with the society, with the nation of men. Of such it may be affirmed, even at the superficial aspect, that the inward feeling of full health is generally ominous, for indeed, it is of apoplexy, so to speak, and a plethoric lazy habit of body, that churches, kingships, social institutions, oftenest die. Sad, when such institution plethorically says to itself, Take thy ease, thou hast goods laid up, like the fool of the gospel, to whom it was answered, Fool, this night thy life shall be required of thee. Is it the healthy peace, or the ominous unhealthy, that rests on France for these next ten years? over which the historian can pass lightly, without call to linger, for as yet events are not, much less performances. Time of sunniest stillness. Shall we call it, what all men thought it, the new age of God? Call it at least of paper, which in many ways is the succedaneum of gold. Bank paper, wherewith you can still buy when there is no gold left. Book paper, splendent with theories, philosophies, sensibilities, beautiful art, not only of revealing thought, but also of so beautifully hiding from us the want of thought. Paper is made from the rags of things that did once exist. There are endless excellences in paper. What wisest philosoph in this halcyon uneventful period could prophesy that there was approaching, big with darkness and confusion, the event of events? Hope ushers in a revolution, as earthquakes are preceded by bright weather. On the 5th of May, fifteen years hence, old Louis will not be sending for the sacraments, but a new Louis, his grandson, with the whole pomp of astonished, intoxicated France, will be opening the States General. Dubaridum and its d'Aguillon are gone forever. There is a young, still docile, well-intentioned king, a young, beautiful and bountiful, well-intentioned queen, and with them all France, as it were, become young. Maupieu and his Parlement have to vanish into thick night. Respectable magistrates, not indifferent to the nation, were it only for having been opponents of the court, can descend unchained from their steep rocks at Croy in Cambrai and elsewhere, and return singing praises. The old Parlement of Paris resumes its functions. Instead of a profligate bankrupt Abbe Terray, we have now, for Controller General, a virtuous philosophic Turgot, with a whole reformed France in his head. 
by whom whatsoever is wrong, in finance or otherwise, will be righted, as far as possible. Is it not as if wisdom herself were henceforth to have seat and voice in the council of kings? Turgot has taken office with the noblest plainness of speech to that effect, being listened to with the noblest royal trustfulness. Turgot's letter, Condorcet, Vie de Turgot, Oeuvre de Condorcet, page 67. The date is 24th August, 1774. It is true, as King Louis objects, they say he never goes to Mass, but liberal France likes him little worse for that. Liberal France answers, the Abbe Terre always went. Philosophism sees, for the first time, a philosoph, or even a philosopher, in office. She in all things will applausively second him. Neither will light old Maurepas obstruct, if he can easily help it. Then how sweet are the manners, vice losing all its deformity, becoming decent, as established things, making regulations for themselves, do, becoming almost a kind of sweet virtue. Intelligence so abounds, irradiated by wit and the art of conversation. Philosophism sits joyful in her glittering saloons, the dinner guest of opulence grown ingenuous, the very nobles proud to sit by her, and preaches, lifted up over all Bastille, a coming millennium. From far Fernie, Patriarch Voltaire gives sign. Veterans Diderot, d'Alembert, have lived to see this day. These with their younger Marmontels, Morellet, Chamfort, Renel, make glad the spicy board of rich ministering dowager, of philosophic farmer-general. O knights and suppers of the gods! Of a truth, the long demonstrated will now be done. The age of revolutions approaches, as Jean-Jacques wrote. But then of happy blessed ones. Man awakens from his long somnambulism, chases the phantasms that beleaguered and bewitched him. Behold the new morning glittering down the eastern steeps. Fly, false phantasms, from its shafts of light. Let the absurd fly utterly forsaking this lower earth for ever. It is truth and astria redux that, in the shape of philosophism, henceforth reign. For what imaginable purpose was man made, if not to be happy? By victorious analysis and progress of the species, happiness enough now awaits him. Kings can become philosophers, or else philosophers kings. Let but society be once rightly constituted, by victorious analysis. The stomach that is empty shall be filled, the throat that is dry shall be wetted with wine. Labor itself shall be all one as rest, not grievous, but joyous. Wheat fields, one would think, cannot come to grow untilled, no man made clayey or made weary thereby, unless, indeed, machinery will do it. Gratuitous tailors and restaurateurs may start up, at fit intervals, one as yet sees not how. But, if each will, according to rule of benevolence, have a care for all, then surely no one will be uncared for. Nay, who knows but, by sufficiently victorious analysis, human life may be indefinitely lengthened, and men get rid of death, as they have already done of the devil. We shall then be happy in spite of death and the devil. So preaches magniloquent philosophum, her redunt Saturnia Regna. The prophetic song of Paris and its philosophes is audible enough in the Versailles Eau de Boeuf, and the Eau de Boeuf, intent chiefly on nearer blessedness, can answer at worse with a polite, why not? Good old cheery Maurepas is too joyful a prime minister to dash the world's joy. Sufficient for the day to be its own evil. Cheery old man, he cuts his jokes, and hovers careless along, his cloak well adjusted to the wind, if so be he may please all persons. The simple young king, whom a Maurepas cannot think of troubling with business, has retired into the interior apartments, taciturn, irresolute, though with a sharpness of temper at times. He at length determines on a little smith work, and so, in apprenticeship with a Sir Germain, whom one day he shall have little cause to bless, is learning to make locks. Campan, 1, 125. It appears further he understood geography, and could read English. Unhappy young king, his childlike trust in that foolish old Maurepas deserved another return, but friend and foe, destiny and himself, have combined to do him hurt. Meanwhile the fair young queen, in her halls of state, walks like a goddess of beauty, the cynosure of all eyes, as yet mingles not with affairs, heeds not the future, least of all dreads it. Weber and Campin, L.B., I., 100 to 151, Weber, I., 11 to 50, have pictured her, 
there within the royal tapestries in bright boudoirs baths peignoirs and the grand and little toilette with a whole brilliant world waiting obsequious on her glance fair young daughter of time what things has time in store for thee like earth's brightest appearance she moves gracefully environed with the grandeur of earth a reality and yet a magic vision for behold shall not utter darkness swallow it the soft young heart adopts orphans portions meritorious maids delights to succour the poor such poor as come picturesquely in her way and sets the fashion of doing it for as was said benevolence has now begun reigning in her duchess de polignac in princess de lamballe she enjoys something almost like friendship now, too, after seven long years, she has a child, and soon even a dauphin of her own, can reckon herself, as queens go, happy in a husband. Events? The grand events are but charitable feasts of morals, fête de meur, with their prizes and speeches. Poissard processions to the dauphin's cradle, above all flirtations, their rise, progress, decline, and fall. There are snow statues raised by the poor in hard winter to a queen who has given them fuel. There are masquerades, theatricals, beautifyings of little Trianon, purchase and repair of St. Cloud, journeyings from the summer court Elysium to the winter one. There are poutings and grudgings from the Sardinian sisters-in-law, for the princes too are wedded, little jealousies, which court etiquette can moderate, wholly the lightest-hearted, frivolous foam of existence, yet an artfully refined foam, pleasant were it not so costly, like that which mantles on the wine of champagne the king's elder brother has set up for a kind of wit and leans towards the philosophe's side monseigneur d'artois pulls the mask from a fair impertinent fights a duel in consequence almost drawing blood ben senval two two eighty two to three thirty he has breeches of a kind new in this world a fabulous kind four tall lackeys says mercier as if he had seen it hold him up in the air that he may fall into the garment without vestige of wrinkle from which rigorous encasement the same four in the same way and with more effort must deliver him at night mercier nouveau paris three one forty seven this last is he who now as a grey time-worn man sits desolate at gratz a d eighteen thirty four having winded up his destiny with the three days in such sort are poor mortals swept and shovelled to and fro end of section five Recording by Greg Golding, Georgetown, Ontario, Canada. Section 6 of The French Revolution, Volume 1, by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Wayman Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 2 Petition in Hieroglyphs With the working people, again, it is not so well. Unlucky, for there are twenty to twenty-five millions of them, whom, however, we lump together into a kind of dim, compendious unity, monstrous but dim, far off, as the canai or more humanely as the masses masses indeed and yet singular to say if with an effort of imagination thou follow them over broad france into their clay hovels into their garrets and hutches the masses consist all of units every unit of whom has his own heart and sorrows stands covered there with his own skin and if you prick him he will bleed o oh, purple sovereignty holiness reverence thou for example cardinal grand almoner with thy plush covering of honour who hast thy hands strengthened with dignities and monies and art set on thy world watch tower solemnly in sight of god for such ends what a thought that every unit of these masses is a miraculous man even as thyself art struggling with vision or with blindness for his infinite kingdom this life which he has got once only in the middle of eternities with a spark of the divinity what thou callest an immortal soul in him dreary languid do these struggle in their obscure remoteness 
their hearth cheerless their diet thin for them in this world rises no era of hope hardly now in the other if it be not hope in the gloomy rest of death for their faith too is failing untaught uncomforted unfed a dumb generation their voice only an inarticulate cry spokesman in the king's council in the world's forum they have none that finds credence at rare intervals as now in seventeen seventy five they will fling down their hoes and hammers and to the astonishment of thinking mankind flock hither and thither dangerous aimless get the length even of versailles turco is altering the corn trade abrogating the absurdest corn laws there is dearth real or were it even factitious an indubitable scarcity of bread and so on the second day of may seventeen seventy five these waste multitudes do hear at versailles chateau in widespread wretchedness in sallow faces squalor winged raggedness present as in legible hieroglyphic writing their petition of grievances the chateau gates have to be shut but the king will appear on the balcony and speak to them they have seen the king's face their petition of grievances has been if not read looked at for answer two of them are hanged on a new gallows forty feet high and the rest driven back to their dens for a time clearly a difficult point for government that of dealing with these masses if indeed it be not rather the sole point and problem of government and all other points mere accidental crotchets superficialities and beatings of the wind for let charter chests use and wont law common and special say what they will the masses count to so many millions of units made to all appearance by god whose earth this is declared to be besides the people are not without ferocity they have sinews and indignation do but look what holiday old marquis mirabeau the crabbed old friend of men looked on in these same years from his lodging at the baths of mont the savages descending in torrents from the mountains our people ordered not to go out the curate in surplice and stole justice in its peruke marechaussee sabre in hand guarding the place till the bagpipes can begin the dance interrupted in a quarter of an hour by battle the cries the squealings of children of infirm persons and other assistants tarring them on as the rabble does when dogs fight frightful men or rather frightful wild animals clad in jupes of coarse woollen with large girdles of leather studded with copper nails of gigantic stature heightened by high wooden clogs sabots rising on tiptoe to see the fight tramping time to it rubbing their sides with their elbows their faces haggard figure ave and covered with their long greasy hair the upper part of the visage waxing pale the lower distorting itself into the attempt at a cruel laugh and a sort of ferocious impatience and these people pay the tie and you want further to take their salt from them and you know not what it is you are stripping bearer or as you call it governing what by the spurt of your pen in its cold dusted indifference you will fancy you can starve always with impunity always till the catastrophe come ah madame such government by blind man's buff stumbling along too far will end in the general overturn culbut general undoubtedly a dark feature this in an age of gold age at least of paper and hope meanwhile trouble us not with thy prophecies o croaking friend of men 
tis long that we have heard such and still the old world keeps wagging in its old way end of section six section seven of the french revolution by thomas carlyle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Golding. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 3. Questionable. Or is this same age of hope itself but a simulacrum, as hope too often is? Cloud vapor with rainbows painted on it, beautiful to see, to sail towards, which hovers over Niagara Falls? In that case, victorious analysis will have enough to do. Alas, yes, a whole world to remake, if she could see it. Work for another than she, for all is wrong, and gone out of the joint, the inward spiritual and the outward economical. Head or heart, there is no soundness in it. As indeed evils of all sorts are more or less of kin, and do usually go together, especially it is an old truth, that wherever huge physical evil is, there, as the parent and origin of it, has moral evil to a proportionate extent been. Before those five-and-twenty laboring millions, for instance, could get that haggardness of face which old Mirabeau now looks on, in a nation calling itself Christian, and calling man the brother of man, what unspeakable, nigh infinite dishonesty of seeming and not being, in all manner of rulers, and appointed watchers, spiritual and temporal, must there not, through long ages, have gone on accumulating? It will accumulate. Moreover, it will reach ahead, for the first of all Gospels is this, that a lie cannot endure for ever. In fact, if we pierce through that rose-pink vapour of sentimentalism, philanthropy, and feasts of morals, there lies behind it one of the sorriest spectacles. You might ask, what bonds that ever held a human society happily together, or held it together at all, are in force here? It is an unbelieving people, which has suppositions, hypotheses, and froth systems of victorious analysis, and for belief this mainly, that pleasure is pleasant. Hunger they have for all sweet things, and the law of hunger. But what other law? Within them or over them? Properly none. Their king has become a king popinjay, with his moropa government, gyrating as the weathercock does, blown about by every wind. Above them they see no god, or they even do not look above, except with astronomical glasses. The church indeed still is, but in the most submissive state, quite tamed by philosophism, in a singularly short time, for the hour was come. Some twenty years ago, your Archbishop Beaumont would not even let the poor Jansenists get buried. Your Lomini Brienne, a rising man, whom we shall meet with yet, could, in the name of the clergy, insist on having the anti-Protestant laws, which condemned to death for preaching, put in execution. And alas, now not so much as Baron Holbach's atheism can be burnt, except as pipe matches, by the private speculative individual. Our church stands haltered dumb like a dumb ox, lowing only for provender of tithes, content if it can have that, or dumbly, dully expecting its further doom. And the twenty millions of haggard faces, and as finger-post and guidance to them in their dark struggle, a gallows forty feet high. Certainly a singular golden age, with its feasts of morals, its sweet manners, its sweet institutions, institutions douce, betokening nothing but peace among men. Peace? O oh, philosophe sentimentalism, what hast thou to do with peace, when thy mother's name is Jezebel? Foul product of still fouler corruption, thou with the corruption art doomed. Meanwhile it is singular how long the rotten will hold together, provided you do not handle it roughly. For whole generations it continues standing, with a ghastly affectation of life, after all life and truth has fled out of it, so loath are men to quit their old ways, and conquering indolence and inertia venture on new. Great truly is the actual, is the thing that has rescued itself from bottomless deeps of theory and possibility, and stands there as a definite indisputable fact, whereby men do work and live, or once did so. Widely shall men cleave to that, while it will endure, and quit it with regret, when it gives way under them. 
rash enthusiast of change, beware. Hast thou well considered all that habit does in this life of ours, how all knowledge and all practice hang wondrous over infinite abysses of the laboriously built together? But if every man, as it has been written, holds confined within him a madman, what must every society do? Society, which in its commonest state is called the standing miracle of this world. Without such earth-rind of habit, continues our author, Call it system of habits. In a word, fixed ways of acting and of believing, society would not exist at all. With such it exists, better or worse. Herein, too, in this its system of habits, acquired, retained how you will, lies the true law code and constitution of a society, the only code, though an unwritten one, which it can in no wise disobey. The thing we call written code, constitution, form of government, and the like, what is it but some miniature image and solemnly expressed summary of this unwritten code? Is, or rather, alas, is not, but only should be, and always tends to be, in which latter discrepancy lies struggle without end. And now, we add in the same dialect, let but by ill chance in such ever-enduring struggle your thin earth rind be once broken. The fountains of the great deep boil forth, fire fountains enveloping engulfing your earth rind is shattered swallowed up instead of a green flowery world there is a waste wild weltering chaos which has again with tumult and struggle to make itself into a world on the other hand be this conceited where thou findest a lie that is oppressing thee extinguish it lies exist there only to be extinguished they wait and cry earnestly for extinction think well meanwhile in what spirit thou wilt do it, not with hatred, with headlong selfish violence, but in clearness of heart, with holy zeal, gently, almost with pity. Thou wouldst not have replaced such extinct lie by a new lie, which a new injustice of thine own were, the parent of still other lies, whereby the latter end of that business were worse than the beginning. So, however, in this world of ours, which has both an indestructible hope in the future and an indestructible tendency to preserve as in the past, must innovation and conservation wage their perpetual conflict, as they may and can. Wherein the demonic element that lurks in all human things may doubtless some once in the thousand years get vent. But indeed may we not regret that such conflict, which, after all, is but like that classical one of hate-filled Amazons with heroic youths, and will end in embraces, should usually be so spasmodic. For conservation, strengthened by that mightiest quality in us, our indolence, sits for long ages, not victorious only, which she should be, but tyrannical, incommunicative. She holds her adversary as if annihilated, such adversary lying all the while, like some buried Enceladus, who, to gain the smallest freedom, must stir a whole trinacria with it etnas. Wherefore, on the whole, we will honour a paper age too, an era of hope. For in this same frightful process of Enceladus revolt, when the task, on which no mortal would willingly enter, has become imperative, inevitable, is it not even a kindness of nature that she lures us forward by cheerful promises, fallacious or not, and a whole generation plunges into the Erebus blackness, lighted on by an era of hope. It has been well said, man is based on hope. He has properly no other possession but hope. This habitation of his is named the place of hope. End of section 7. Recording by Greg Golding, Georgetown, Ontario, Canada. Section 8 of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Golding. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 4. Maurepas. But now, amongst French hopes, is not that of old Monsieur de Maurepas one of the best grounded? who hopes that he, by dexterity, shall contrive to continue minister. Nimble old man, who for all emergencies has his light jest, and ever in the worst confusion will emerge, cork-like, unsunk. Small care to him is perfectibility, progress of the species, and astria redux, 
good only that a man of light wit verging towards fourscore can in the seat of authority feel himself important among men shall we call him as haughty chateaurieux was wont of old monsieur faquinet diminutive of scoundrel in courtier dialect he is now named the nestor of france such governing nestor as france has at bottom nevertheless it might puzzle one to say where the government of france in these days specially is in that chateau of versailles we have nestor king queen ministers and clerks with paper bundles tied in tape but the government for government is a thing that governs that guides and if need be compels visible in france there is not such a thing invisible inorganic on the other hand there is in philosophes saloons in eux de boeuf galleries in the tongue of the babbler in the pen of the pamphleteer her majesty appearing at the opera is applauded she returns all radiant with joy anon the applauses wax fainter or threaten to cease she is heavy of heart the light of her face has fled is sovereignty some poor montgolfier which blown into by the popular wind grows great and mounts or sinks flaccid if the wind be withdrawn france was long a despotism tempered by epigrams and now it would seem the epigrams have got the upper hand happy were a young louis the desired to make france happy if it did not prove too troublesome and he only knew the way but there is endless discrepancy round him so many claims and clamours a mere confusion of tongues not reconcilable by man not manageable suppressible saved by some strongest and wisest men which only a light jesting lightly gyrating m de maurepas can so much as subsist amidst philosophism claims her new era meaning thereby innumerable things and claims it in no faint voice for france at large hitherto mute is now beginning to speak also and speaks in that same sense a huge many-toned sound distant yet not unimpressive on the other hand the oeil de boeuf which as nearest one can hear best claims with shrill vehemence that the monarchy be as heretofore a horn of plenty wherefrom loyal courtiers may draw to the just support of the throne let liberalism and a new era if such is the wish be introduced only no curtailment of the royal monies which latter condition alas is precisely the impossible one philosophism as we saw has got her turgot made controller general and there shall be endless reformation unhappily this turgot could continue only twenty months with the miraculous fornatus's purse in his treasury it might have lasted longer with such purse indeed every french controller general that would prosper in these days ought first to provide himself but here again may we not remark the bounty of nature in regard to hope man after man advances confident to the augean stable as if he could clean it expends his little fraction of an ability on it with such cheerfulness does in so far as he was honest accomplish something turgot has faculties honesty insight heroic volition but the fernatus's purse he has not sanguine controller general a whole pacific french revolution may stand schemed in the head of the thinker but who shall pity the unspeakable indemnities that will be needed alas far from that on the very threshold of the business he proposes that the clergy the noblesse the very parliament be subjected to taxes one shriek of indignation and astonishment reverberates through all the chateau galleries m de maurepas has to gyrate the poor king who had written a few weeks ago il n'y a que vous et moi qui aimions le peuple there is none but you and i that has the people's interest at heart must write now a dismissal and let the french revolution accomplish itself pacifically or not as it can hope then is deferred deferred not destroyed or abated is not this for example our patriarch voltaire after long years of absence revisiting paris with face shrivelled to nothing with huge peruke a la louis quatorze which leaves only two eyes visible glittering like carbuncles the old man is here what an outburst sneering paris has suddenly grown reverent devotional with hero worship nobles have disguised themselves as tavern waiters to obtain sight of him the loveliest of france would lay their hair beneath his feet his chariot is the nucleus of a comet whose train fills the whole streets they crown him in the theatre with immortal viva finally stifle him under roses for old richelieu recommended opium in such state of the nerves and the excessive patriarch took too much 
Her Majesty herself had some thought of sending for him, but was dissuaded. Let Majesty consider it, nevertheless. The purport of this man's existence has been to wither up and annihilate all whereon Majesty and worship for the present rests. And is it so that the world recognizes him? With apotheosis as its prophet and speaker, who has spoken wisely the thing it longed to say? Add only that the body of this same rose-stifled, beatified patriarch cannot get buried except by stealth. It is wholly a notable business, and France without doubt is big, what the Germans call of good hope. We shall wish her a happy birth-hour and blessed fruit. Beaumarchais, too, now has winded up his law-pleadings, not without result, to himself and to the world. Caron Beaumarchais, or de Beaumarchais, for he got ennobled, had been born poor, but aspiring, assyriant, with talents, audacity, adroitness, above all, with the talent for intrigue, a lean, but also a tough, indomitable man. Fortune and dexterity brought him to the harpsichord of Mesdames, our good princesses Logue, Grey, and Sisterhood. Still better, Paris du Vernier, the court banker, honoured him with some confidence, to the length even of transactions in cash, which confidence, however, du Vernier's heir, a person of quality, would not continue. Quite otherwise, there springs a lawsuit from it, wherein tough Beaumarchais, losing both money and repute, is, in the opinion of Judge Reporter Guzman, of the Parlement Montpieu, of a whole indifferent acquiescing world, miserably beaten, in all men's opinions, only not in his own. Inspired by the indignation, which makes, if not verses, satirical law-papers, the withered music-master, with a desperate heroism, takes up his lost cause in spite of the world, fights for it, against reporters, parlement, and principalities, with light banter, with clear logic, adroitly, with an inexhaustibly toughness and resource, like the skilfullest fencer, on whom, so skilful is he, the whole world now looks. Three long years it lasts, with wavering fortune, in fine, after labours comparable to the twelve of Hercules, our unconquerable Caron triumphs, regains his lawsuit and lawsuits, strips reporter Guzman of the judicial ermine, covering him with a perpetual garment of obloquy instead, and in regard to the Parlement Maupieu, which he has helped to extinguish, to parliaments of all kinds, and to French justice generally, gives rise to endless reflections in the minds of men. Thus has Beaumarchais, like a lean French Hercules, ventured down, driven by destiny, into the nether kingdoms, and victoriously tamed hell-dogs there. He also is henceforth among the notabilities of his generation. End of section 8. Recording by Greg Golding, Georgetown, Ontario, Canada. Section 9 of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Golding. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 5. Astria Redux Without Cash. Observe, however, beyond the Atlantic. Has not the new day verily dawned? Democracy, as we said, is born. Stormgirt is struggling for life and victory. A sympathetic France rejoices over the rights of man. In all saloons, it is said, what a spectacle! Now to behold our Dean, our Franklin, American plenipotentiaries, here in position, soliciting. The sons of the Saxon Puritans, with their old Saxon temper, old Hebrew culture, sleek Silas, sleek Benjamin, here on such errand, among the light children of heathenism, monarchy, sentimentalism, and the scarlet woman. A spectacle indeed, over which saloons may cackle joyous, though Kaiser Joseph, questioned on it, gave this answer, most unexpected from a philosophe. Madame, the trade I live by is that of royalist. Mon métier et moi, c'est d'être royaliste. So thinks light Morapa too, but the wind of philosophism and the force of public opinion will blow him round. Best wishes, meanwhile, are sent. Clandestine privateers armed. Paul Jones shall equip his bonhomme Richard. Weapons, military stores can be smuggled over, if the English do not seize them. Wherein, once more Beaumarchais, dimly as the giant smuggler becomes visible, filling his own lank pocket with all. But surely, in any case, France should have a navy. 
For which great object were not now the time, now when that proud termagant of the seas has her hands full? It is true, an impoverished treasury cannot build ships, but the hint once given, which Beaumarchais says he gave, this and the other loyal seaport, Chamber of Commerce, will build and offer them, goodly vessels bound into the waters, a ville de Paris, leviathan of ships. And now when gratuitous three-deckers dance there at our anchor, with streamers flying, and a Lutheromaniac philosophidum grows ever more clamorous, what can a Maurepas do but gyrate? Squadrons cross the ocean, gauges, lees, rough Yankee generals, with woollen nightcaps under their hats, present arms to the far-glancing chivalry of France, and new-born democracy sees, not without amazement, despotism tempered by epigrams, fight at her side. So, however, it is. King's forces and heroic volunteers, Rochambeau's, Bouy, Lameth's, Lafayette, have drawn their swords in this sacred quarrel of mankind, shall draw them again elsewhere in the strangest way. Off you shan't some naval thunder is heard, in the course of which did our young prince, Duke de Chartres, hide in the hold, or did he materially, by active heroism, contribute to the victory? Alas, by a second edition we learn that there was no victory, or that English Keppel had it. Our poor young prince gets his opera plaudits changed into mocking tee-hees, and cannot become Grand Admiral, the source to him of woes which one may call endless. Woe also for Ville de Paris, the leviathan of ships. English Rodney has clutched it, and led it home with the rest. So successful was his new manoeuvre of breaking the enemy's line. It seems as if, according to Louis the Fifteenth, France were never to have a navy. Brave Suffren must return from Hyder Ali and the Indian waters, with small result, yet with great glory, for six non-defeats, which indeed, with such seconding as he had, one may reckon heroic. Let the old sea-hero rest now, honoured of France, in his native Cévennes mountain, send smoke not of gunpowder, but mere culinary smoke, through the old chimneys of the castle of jails, which one day, in other hands, shall have other fame. Brave La Perouse shall by and by lift anchor on philanthropic voyage of discovery, for the king knows geography. But alas, this also will not prosper. The brave navigator goes and returns not. The seekers search far seas for him in vain. He has vanished trackless into blue immensity, and only some mournful mysterious shadow of him hovers long in all heads and hearts. Neither, while the war yet lasts, will Gibraltar surrender. Not though Creon, Nassau Segan, with the ablest projectors extant, are there, and Prince Condé and Prince d'Artois have hastened to help. Wondrous leather-roofed floating batteries, set afloat by French-Spanish Pacte de Famille, give gallant summons to which, nevertheless, Gibraltar answers plutonically, with mere torrents of red-hot iron, as if stone calp had become a throat of the pit, and utters such a doom's blast of a no as all men must credit. And so, with this loud explosion, the noise of war has ceased. An age of benevolence may hope for ever. Our noble volunteers of freedom have returned to be her missionaries. Lafayette, as the matchless of his time, glitters in the Versailles Oeil de Boeuf, has his bust set up in the Paris Hotel de Ville. Democracy stands inexpungable, immeasurable, in her new world, has even a foot lifted towards the old, and our French finances, little strengthened by any such work, are in no healthy way. What to do with the finance? This indeed is the great question. A small but most black weather symptom, which no radiance of universal hope can cover. We saw Turgot cast forth from a controllership, with shrieks, for want of a fortunatus's purse. As little could M. de Cluny manage the duty, or indeed do anything, but consume his wages. Attain a place in history, where as an ineffectual shadow thou beholdest him still lingering, and let the duty manage itself. Did Genevese Necker possess such a purse, then? He possessed banker's skill, banker's honesty, credit of all kinds, for he had written academic prize essays, struggled for India companies, given dinners to philosophes, and realized a fortune in twenty years. He possessed, further, a taciturnity and solemnity of depth, or else of dullness. How singular for Celadon Gibbon, false swain as he had proved, whose father, keeping most notably his own gig, would not hear of such a union to find now his forsaken demoiselle Courchot sitting in the high places of the world, as minister's madame, and Necker not jealous. 
A new young demoiselle, one day to be famed as a madame in Distail, was romping about the knees of the decline and fall. The Lady Necker founds hospitals, gives solemn philosoph dinner parties, to cheer her exhausted controller general. Strange things have happened. By clamor of philosophism, management of Marquis de Pezé, and poverty constraining even kings. And so Necker, Atlas-like, sustains the burden of the finances for five years long? without wages, for he refused such, cheered only by public opinion, and the ministering of his noble wife. With many thoughts in him, it is hoped, which, however, he is shy of uttering. His Comte Rendu, published by the royal permission, fresh sign of a new era, shows wonders, which what but the genius of some Atlas Necker can prevent from becoming portents. In Necker's head, too, there is a whole Pacific French Revolution of its kind, and in that taciturn dull depth, or deep dullness, ambition enough. Meanwhile, alas, his Fortunatus's purse turns out to be little other than the old Victigil of parsimony. Nay, he too has to produce his scheme of taxing. Clergy, noblesse to be taxed, provincial assemblies, and the rest, like a mere Turgot. The expiring Marquis de Maurepas must gyrate one other time. Let Necker also depart, not unlamented. Great in a private station, Necker looks on from the distance, abiding his time. Eighty thousand copies of his new book, which he calls Administration des Finances, will be sold in a few days. He is gone, but shall return, and that more than once, borne by a whole shouting nation. Singular Controller General of the Finances, once clerk in Thelusson's Bank. End of Section 9 Recording by Greg Golding, Georgetown, Ontario, Canada Section 10 of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Golding. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 6, Windbags. So marches the world in this its paper age, or era of hope. Not without obstructions, war explosions, which, however, heard from such distance, are little other than a cheerful marching music. If indeed that living chaos of ignorance and hunger, five and twenty million strong, under your feet, were to begin playing. For the present, however, consider Longchamp, now when Lent is ending, and the glory of Paris and France has gone forth as an annual want. Not to assist at Tenebri Mass, but to sun itself, and show itself, and salute the young spring. Manifold, bright-tinted, glittering with gold, all through the Bois de Boulogne, in long-drawn, variegated rows, like long-drawn, living flower-borders, tulips, dahlias, lilies of the valley, all in their moving flower-pots of new gilt carriages, pleasure of the eye and pride of life. So rolls and dances the procession, steady, of firm assurance, as if it rolled on adamant and the foundations of the world, not on mere heraldic parchment, under which smoulders a lake of fire. Dance on, ye foolish ones, ye sought not wisdom, neither have ye found it. Ye and your fathers have sown the wind, ye shall reap the whirlwind. Was it not, from of old written, the wages of sin is death? But at Longchamp, as elsewhere, we remark for one thing, that dame and cavalier are waited on each by a kind of human familiar, named jockey. Little elf or imp, though young, already withered, with its withered air of premature vice, of knowingness, of completed elfhood useful in various emergencies. The name jockey comes from the English, as the thing also fancies that it does. Our Anglomania, in fact, is grown considerable, prophetic of much. If France is to be free, why shall she not, now when mad war is hushed, love neighboring freedom? Cultivated men, your Dukes de Léoncourt, de la Rochefoucauld, admire the English constitution, the English national character, would import what of it they can. Of what is lighter, especially if it be light as wind, how much easier the freightage. Non-admiral Duc de Chartres, not yet d'Orléans, or Egalité, flies to and fro across the strait, importing English fashions. This he, as hand and glove with an English Prince of Wales, is surely qualified to do. Carriages and saddles, top-boots and redingotes, as we call riding-coats, nay, the very mode of riding, for now no man on a level with this age but will trot à l'anglaise, rising in the stirrups, scornful of the old sit-fast method, in which, according to Shakespeare, butter and eggs go to market. 
Also he can urge the fervid wheels, this brave Chartres of ours. No whip in Paris is rasher and surer than the unprofessional one of Monseigneur. Elf jockeys we have seen, but see now real Yorkshire jockeys and what they ride on and train. English racers for French races. These likewise we owe first, under the providence of the devil, to Monseigneur. Prince d'Artois also has his stud of racers. Prince d'Artois has with all the strangest horse-leech, a moon-struck, much-enduring individual, of Neuchâtel in Switzerland, named Jean-Paul Marat, a problematic Chevalier Dion, now in petticoats, now in breeches, is no less problematic in London than in Paris, and causes bets and lawsuits. Beautiful days of international communion. Swindlery and blackguardism have stretched hands across the channel, and saluted mutually. On the race course of Vincennes or Sablon, behold in English curricle and four, wafted glorious among the principalities and rascalities, an English Dr. Dodd, for whom also the two early gallows gapes. Duke de Chartres was a young prince of great promise, as young princes often are, which promise unfortunately has belied itself. With the huge Orléans property, with Duke de Pontrièvre for father-in-law, and now the young brother-in-law Lamballe killed by excesses, he will one day be the richest man in France. Meanwhile, his hair is all falling out, his blood is quite spoiled, by early transcendentalism of debauchery. Carbuncles stud his face, dark studs on a ground of burnished copper. A most signal failure, this young prince. The stuff prematurely burnt out of him, little left but foul smoke and ashes of expiring sensualities. What might have been thought, insight, and even conduct, gone now, or fast going, to confused darkness, broken by bewildering dazzlements, to obstreperous crochet, to activities which you may call semi-delirious, or even semi-galvanic. Perry affects to laugh at his charioteering, but he heeds not such laughter. On the other hand, what a day, not of laughter, was that when he threatened, for lucre's sake, to lay sacrilegious hand on the Palais Royal Garden. The flower parterres shall be riven up, the chestnut avenues shall fall, time-honoured bocage, under which the opera hamadryads were wont to wander, not inexecrable to men. Perry moans aloud, Philidor from his Café de la Régence shall no longer look on greenness. The loungers and losers of the world, where now shall they haunt? In vain is moaning, the axe glitters, the sacred groves fall crashing, for indeed Monseigneur was short of money. The opera hamadryads fly with shrieks, Shriek not, ye opera hamadryads, or not as those that have no comfort. He will surround your garden with new edifices and piazzas. Though narrowed, it shall be replanted, dizened with hydraulic jets, cannon which the sun fires at noon, things bodily, things spiritual, such as man has not imagined. And in the Palais Royal shall again, and more than ever, be the sorcerer's Sabbath and Satan at home of our planet. What will not mortals attempt? From remote Enronne in the Viverin, the brothers Montgolfier send up their paper dome, filled with the smoke of burnt wool. The Viverin Provincial Assembly is to be prorogued this same day. Viverin Assembly members applaud, and the shouts of congregated men. Will victorious analysis scale the very heavens, then? Perry hears with eager wonder. Perry shall ere long see. From Reveillon's paper warehouse there in the Rue Saint-Antoine, a noted warehouse, the new Montgolfier airship launches itself. Ducks and poultry are born skyward, but now shall men be born. Nay, chemist Charles thinks of hydrogen and glazed silk. Chemist Charles will himself ascend from the Tuileries garden, Montgolfier solemnly cutting the cord. By heaven he also mounts, he and another? Ten times ten thousand hearts go palpitating. All tongues are mute with wonder and fear, till a shout, like the voice of seas, rolls after him on his wild way. He soars, he dwindles upwards, has become a mere gleaming circlet, like some turgotine snuff-box, what we call turgotine platitude, like some new daylight moon. Finally he descends, welcomed by the universe. Duchess Polignac, with a party, is in the Bois de Boulogne, waiting, though it is drizzly winter, the 1st of December, 1783. The whole chivalry of France, Duc de Chartres foremost, gallops to receive him. Beautiful invention, mounting heavenward so beautifully, so unguidably, emblem of much, and of our age of hope itself, which shall mount, specifically light, majestically in this same manner, and hover, tumbling whither fate will. Well, if it do not, pilatra-like, explode, and demount all the more tragically. 
So, riding on windbags, will men scale the Imperium. Or observe Herr Dr. Mesmer in his spacious magnetic halls. Long stoled he walks, reverend, glancing upwards, as in rapt commerce, an antique Egyptian hierophant in this new age. Soft music flits, breaking fitfully the sacred stillness. Round their magnetic mystery, which to the eye is mere tubs with water, sit breathless, rod in hand, the circles of beauty and fashion, each circle a living circular passion flower, expecting the magnetic afflatus and new manufactured heaven on earth. O women, O men, great is your infidel faith. A parliamentary du port, a bergasse, d'Espremenil, we notice there. Chemist Berthollet, too, on the part of Monseigneur de Chartres. Had not the Academy of Sciences, with its Baileys, Franklins, Lavoisier, interfered? But it did interfere. Mesmer may pocket his hard money and withdraw. Let him walk silent by the shore of the Bodensee, by the ancient town of Constance, meditating on much. For so, under the strangest new vesture, the old great truth, since no vesture can hide it, begins again to be revealed. That man is what we call a miraculous creature, with miraculous power over men, and on the whole with such a life in him, and such a world round him, as victorious analysis, with her physiologies, nervous systems, physic and metaphysic, will never completely name, to say nothing of explaining, wherein also the quack shall, in all ages, come in for his share. End of section 10. Recording by Greg Golding, Georgetown, Ontario, Canada. Section 11 of The French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeremiah Sutherland, Victoria, British Columbia. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 2, Chapter 7, Contrat Social. In such succession of singular prismatic tints, flush after flush suffusing our horizon, does the era of hope dawn on towards fulfillment? Questionable. As indeed with an era of hope that rests on mere universal benevolence, victorious analysis, vice cured of its deformity, and in the long run on twenty-five dark savage millions looking up in hunger and weariness to that ecce signum of theirs forty feet high how could it but be questionable through all time if we read aright sin was is will be the parent of misery this land calls itself most christian and has crosses and cathedrals but its high priest is some roche aimon some necklace cardinal louis de rohan the voice of the poor through long years ascends inarticulate in jacquerie meal mobs low whimpering of infinite moan unheeded of the earth not unheeded of heaven always moreover where the millions are wretched there are the thousands straitened unhappy only the units can flourish or say rather be ruined the last industry all noosed and haltered as if it too were some beast of chase for the mighty hunters of this world to bait and cut slices from cries passionately to these its well-paid guides and watchers not guide me but laissez faire leave me alone of your guidance what market has industry in this france for two things there may be market and demand for the coarser kind of field fruits since the millions will live for the fine kinds of luxury and spicery of multiform taste from opera melodies down to racers and courtesans since the units will be amused it is at bottom but a mad state of things to mend and remake all which we have indeed victorious analysis honour to victorious analysis nevertheless out of the workshop and laboratory what thing was victorious analysis yet known to make detection of incoherences mainly destruction of the incoherent from of old doubt was but half a magician she evokes the spectres which we cannot quell we shall have endless vortices of froth logic whereon first words and then things are whirled and swallowed remark accordingly as acknowledged grounds of hope at bottom mere precursors of despair this perpetual theorizing about man the mind of man philosophy of government progress of the species and such like the main thinking furniture of every head time and so many montesquieu's mabley's spokesmen of time have discovered innumerable things and now has not jean-jacques promulgated his new evangile of a contrat social explaining the whole mystery of government and how it is contracted and bargained for to universal satisfaction theories of government 
such have been and will be in ages of decadence acknowledge them in their degree as processes of nature who does nothing in vain as steps in her great process meanwhile what theory is so certain as this that all theories were they never so earnest painfully elaborated are and by the very conditions of them must be incomplete questionable and even false thou shalt know that this universe is what it professes to be an infinite one attempt not to swallow it for thy logical digestion be thankful if skilfully planting down this and the other fixed pillar in the chaos thou prevent its swallowing thee that a new young generation has exchanged the sceptic creed what shall i believe for passionate faith in this gospel according to jean jacques is a further step in the business and betokens much blessed also is hope and always from the beginning there was some millennium prophesied millennium of holiness but what is notable never till this new era any millennium of mere ease and plentiful supply in such prophesied lubberland of happiness benevolence and vice cured of its deformity trust not my friends man is not what one calls a happy animal his appetite for sweet victual is so enormous how in this wild universe which storms in on him infinite vague menacing shall poorer man find say not happiness but existence and footing to stand on if it be not by girding himself together for continual endeavour and endurance woe if in his heart there dwelt no devout faith if the word duty had lost its meaning for him or as to this of sentimentalism so useful for weeping with over romances and on pathetic occasions it otherwise verily will avail nothing nay less the healthy heart that said to itself how healthy am i was already fallen into the fatalist sort of disease is not sentimentalism twin sister to kant if not one and the same with it is not kant the materia prima of the devil from which all falsehoods imbecilities abominations body themselves from which no true thing can come for kant is itself properly a double distilled lie the second power of a lie and now if a whole nation fall into that in such case i answer infallibly they will return out of it for life is no cunningly devised deception or self-deception it is a great truth that thou art alive that thou hast desires necessities neither can these subsist and satisfy themselves on delusions but on fact to fact depend on it we shall come back to such fact blessed or cursed as we have wisdom for the lowest least blessed fact one knows of on which necessitous mortals have ever based themselves seems to be the primitive one of cannibalism that i can devour thee what if such primitive fact were precisely the one we had with our improved methods to revert to and begin anew from end of section eleven section twelve of the french revolution by thomas carlyle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg golding the french revolution by thomas carlyle volume one book two chapter eight printed paper in such a practical france let the theory of perfectibility say what it will discontents cannot be wanting your promised reformation is so indispensable yet it comes not who will begin it with himself discontent with what is around us still more with what is above us goes on increasing seeking ever new vents of street ballads of epigrams that from of old tempered despotism we need speak not nor of manuscript newspapers nouvelles à la main do we speak bacomont and his journeymen and followers may close those thirty volumes of scurrilous eavesdropping and quit that trade for at length if not liberty of the press there is license pamphlets can be surreptitiously vended and read in paris did they even bear to be printed at pekin we have a courier de l'europe in those years regularly published at london by a de morand whom the guillotine has not yet devoured there too an unruly languet still unguillotined when his own country has become too hot for him and his brother advocates have cast him out can emit his hoarse wailings in bastille de Boyer, bastille unveiled loquacious abbe renault at length has his wish sees the histoire philosophique with its lubricity unveracity loose loud eleutheromaniac rant contributed they say by philosophedom at large though in the abbe's name and to his glory 
burnt by the common hangman, and sets out on his travels as a martyr. It was the edition of 1781, perhaps the last notable book that had such fire beatitude, the hangman discovering now that it did not serve. Again, in courts of law, with their money quarrels, divorce cases, wheresoever a glimpse into the household existence can be had, what indications! The Parlement of Besançon and O Ring, audible to all France, with the amour and destinies of young Mirabeau. He, under the nurture of a friend of men, has, in state prisons, in marching regiments, Dutch authors' garrets, and quite other scenes, been for twenty years learning to resist despotism, despotism of men, and, alas, also of gods. How, beneath this rose-coloured veil of universal benevolence and astria redux, is the sanctuary of home so often a dreary void, or a dark contentious hell on earth? The old friend of men has his own divorce case too, and at times his whole family but one under lock and key. He writes much about reforming and enfranchising the world, and for his own private behoof he has needed sixty lettres de cachet. A man of insight too, with resolution, even with manful principle, but in such an element, inward and outward, which he could not rule but only madden. Edacity, rapacity, quite contrary to the finer sensibilities of the heart, fools that expect your verdant millennium and nothing but love and abundance brooks running wine winds whispering music with the whole ground and basis of your existence champed into a mud of sensuality which daily growing deeper will soon have no bottom but the abyss or consider that unutterable business of the diamond necklace red-hatted cardinal louis de rohan sicilian jailbird balsamo cagliostro Milliner Dame de Lamotte, with a face of some piquancy, the highest church dignitaries waltzing in Walpurgis dance, with quack prophets, pick purses, and public women, a whole Satan's invisible world displayed, working there continually under the daylight visible one, the smoke of its torment going up for ever. The throne has been brought into scandalous collision with the treadmill. Astonished Europe rings with the mystery for ten months, seas only lie unfold itself from lie, corruption among the lofty and the low, gulosity, credulity, imbecility, strength nowhere but in the hunger. Weep, fair queen, thy first tears of unmixed wretchedness. Thy fair name has been tarnished by foul breath, irremediably while life lasts. No more shalt thou be loved and pitied by living hearts, till a new generation has been born, and thy own heart lies cold, cured of all its sorrows. The epigrams henceforth become not sharp and bitter, but cruel, atrocious, unmentionable. On that 31st of May, 1786, a miserable Cardinal Grand Almoner Rohan, on issuing from his Bastille, is escorted by hurrying crowds, unloved he, and worthy of no love but important since the court and queen are his enemies. How is our bright era of hope dimmed, and the whole sky growing bleak with signs of hurricane and earthquake? It is a doomed world, gone all obedience that made men free, fast going the obedience that made men slaves, at least to one another. Slaves only of their own lust they now are, and will be. Slaves of sin, inevitably also of sorrow, Behold the mouldering mass of sensuality and falsehood, round which plays foolishly itself a corrupt phosphorescence, some glimmer of sentimentalism, and over all, rising, as ark of their covenant, the grim patibulary fork, forty feet high, which also is now nigh rotted. Add only that the French nation distinguishes itself among nations by the characteristic of excitability, with the good, but also with the perilous evil which belongs to that. Rebellion, explosion, of unknown extent is to be calculated on. There are, as Chesterfield wrote, all the symptoms I have ever met with in history. Shall we say, then, woe to philosophism, that it destroyed religion, what it called extinguishing the abomination, écrasé l'infâme? Woe, rather, to those that made the holy an abomination, and extinguishable. Woe at all men that live in such a time of world abomination and world destruction. Nay, answer the courtiers, it was Turgot, it was Necker, with their mad innovating, it was the Queen's want of etiquette, it was he, it was she, it was that. Friends, it was every scoundrel that had lived, and quack-like pretended to be doing, and been only eating and misdoing, in all provinces of life, as shoe-black or as sovereign lord, each in his degree, 
from the time of Charlemagne and earlier. All this, for be sure no falsehood perishes, but is as seed sown out to grow, has been storing itself for thousands of years, and now the account day has come, and rude will the settlement be, of wrath laid up against the day of wrath. O my brother, be not thou a quack, die rather, if thou wilt take counsel. Tis but dying once, and thou art quit of it for ever. Cursed is that trade, and bears curses, thou knowest not how long ages after thou art departed, and the wages thou hadst are all consumed. Nay, as the ancient wise have written, through eternity itself, and is verily marked in the doom-book of a god. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, and yet, as we said, hope is but deferred, not abolished, not abolishable. It is very notable and touching how this same hope does still light onwards the French nation through all its wild destinies. For we shall still find hope shining, be it for fond invitation, be it for anger and menace, as a mild heavenly light it shone. As a red conflagration it shines, burning sulphurous blue, through darkest regions of terror. It still shines, and goes sent out at all, since desperation itself is a kind of hope. Thus is our era still to be named of hope, though in the saddest sense, when there is nothing left but hope. But if any one would know summarily what a Pandora's box lies there for the opening, he may see it in what by its nature is the symptom of all symptoms, the surviving literature of the period. Abbé Reynaud, with his lubricity and loud loose rant, has spoken his word, and already the fast-hastening generation responds to another. Glance at Beaumarchais's Mariage de Figaro, which now, after difficulty enough, has issued on the stage, and runs its hundred nights to the admiration of all men. By what virtue or internal vigour it so ran, the reader of our day will rather wonder, and indeed will know so much the better that it flattered some pruriency of the time, that it spoke what all were feeling and longing to speak. Small substance in that Figaro, thin wire-drawn intrigues, thin wire-drawn sentiments and sarcasms, a thing lean, barren, yet which winds and whisks itself, as through a wholly mad universe, adroitly, with a high sniffing air, wherein each, as was hinted, which is the grand secret, may see some image of himself, and of his own state and ways. So it runs its hundred nights, and all France runs with it, laughing applause. If the soliloquizing barber ask, What has your lordship done to earn all this, and can only answer, You took the trouble to be born, Vous vous êtes donne la peine de naître? All men must laugh, and a gay horse-racing Anglomaniac noblesse loudest of all. For how can small books have a great danger in them? asked the Sir Caron, and fancies his thin epigram may be a kind of reason. Conqueror of a golden fleece, by giant smuggling, tamer of hell-dogs in the Parlement Maupieux, and finally crowned Orpheus in the Théâtre Francais. Beaumarchais has now culminated, and unites the attributes of several demigods. We shall meet him once again in the course of his decline. Still more significant are two books produced on the eve of the ever-memorable explosion itself, and read eagerly by all the world. Saint-Pierre's Paul et Virginie, and Louvet's Chevalier de Faublas, noteworthy books, which may be considered as the last speech of old feudal France. In the first there rises, melodiously, as it were, the wail of a moribund world, everywhere wholesome nature in unequal conflict with diseased perfidious art, cannot escape from it in the lowest hut, in the remotest island of the sea. Ruin and death must strike down the loved one, and what is most significant of all, death even here not by necessity, but by etiquette. What a world of prurient corruption lies visible in that super-sublime of modesty! Yet on the whole, our good Saint-Pierre is musical, poetical, though most morbid, we will call his book the swan song of old dying france louvet's again let no man account musical truly if this wretched faublas is a death speech it is one under the gallows and by a felon that does not repent wretched cloaca of a book without depth even as a cloaca what picture of french society is here picture properly of nothing if not of the mind that gave it out as some sort of picture yet symptom of much above all of the world that could nourish itself thereon. End of section 12. Recording by Greg Golding, Georgetown, Ontario.
Section 13 of The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dustin Tuttle. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 3, Chapter 1 Dishonored Bills. While the unspeakable confusion is everywhere weltering within, and through so many cracks in the surface sulphur smoke is issuing, the question arises, through what crevice will the main explosion carry itself? Through which of the old craters or chimneys, or must it at once form a new crater for itself? In every society are such chimneys, or institutions serving as such. Even Constantinople is not without its safety valves. There, too, discontent can vent itself, in material fire, by the number of nocturnal conflagrations, or of hanged bakers, the reigning power can read the signs of the times, and change course according to these. We may say that this French explosion will doubtless first try all the old institutions of escape, for by each of these there is, or at least there used to be, some communication with the interior deep. They are national institutions in virtue of that. Had they even become personal institutions, and what we can call choked up from their original uses, there nevertheless must the impediment be weaker than elsewhere. Through which of them, then, an observer might have guessed, through the law parliaments, above all through the Parliament of Paris. Men, never so thickly clad in dignities, sit not inaccessible to the influences of their time, especially men whose life is business who at all turns, were it even from behind judgment seats, have come in contact with the actual workings of the world. The Councilor of Parliament, the President himself, who has bought his place with hard money that he might be looked up to by his fellow creatures, how shall he, in all philosophy soirees and saloons of elegant culture, become notable as a friend of darkness? Among the Paris long robes there may be more than one patriotic Mazerba whose rule is conscience and the public good. There are clearly more than one hot-headed d'Espremille, to whose confused thought any loud reputation of the brutus sort may seem glorious. The Le Peltier, La Mignons, have titles and wealth, yet at court are only styled nobles of the robe. There are duports of deep scheme, fratus, saboteurs, of incontinent tongue, all nursed more or less on the milk of the contract social. Nay, for the whole body, is not this patriotic opposition also a fighting for oneself? Awake, Parliament of Paris, renew thy long warfare. Was not the Parliament Mapu abolished with ignominy? Not now hast thou to dread a Louis the Fourteenth with a crack of his whip and his Olympian looks. Not now a Richelieu and Bastille. No, the whole nation is behind thee. Thou, too, O oh heavens, mayest become a political power and with the shakings of thy horsehair wig shake principalities and dynasties, like a very Jove with his ambrosial curls. Light old Monsieur de Maupas, since the end of 1781, has been fixed in the frost of death. Nevermore, said the good Louis, shall I hear his step overhead. His light jestings and gyratings are at an end. No more can the importunate reality be hidden by pleasant wit, and today's evil be deftly rolled over upon tomorrow. The morrow itself has arrived, and now nothing but a solid phlegmatic Monsieur de Vergennes sits there, in dull matter of fact, like some dull punctual clerk, which he originally was, admits what cannot be denied, let the remedy come whence it will. In him is no remedy, only clerk-like dispatch of business according to routine. The poor king, grown older yet hardly more experienced, must himself, with such no faculty as he has, begin governing, wherein also his queen will give help, bright queen with her quick clear glances and impulses, clear and even noble, but all too superficial, vehement shallow, for that work. To govern France were such a problem, and now it has grown well nigh too hard to govern even the Oya de Buck. For if a distressed people has its cry, so likewise, and more audibly, has a bereaved court. 
To the Oye de Boeuf it remains inconceivable how, in a France of such resources, the Horn of Pliny should run dry. Did it not use to flow? Nevertheless, Necker, with his revenue of parsimony, has suppressed above six hundred places before the courtiers could oust him, parsimonious finance pedant as he was. Again, a military pedant, Saint-Germain, with his Prussian maneuvers, with his Prussian notions, as if merit and not coat of arms should be the rule of promotion, has disaffected military men. The mousquetaires, with much else, are suppressed. For he, too, was one of your suppressors, and unsettling and oversetting did mere mischief to the Ouya de Boeuf. Complaints abound, scarcity, anxiety. It is a changed Ouya de Boeuf. Bezonval says, already in these years, 1781, there was such a melancholy, such a tristesse, about court, compared with former days, as made it quite dispiriting to look upon. No wonder that the Ouya de Boeuf feels melancholy, when you are suppressing its places. Not a place can be suppressed, but some purse is the lighter for it, and more than one heart the heavier. For did it not employ the working classes too, manufacturers, male and female, of laces, essences, of pleasure generally, whosoever could manufacture pleasure? Miserable economies, never felt over twenty-five millions. So however it goes on, and it is not yet ended. Few years more, and the wolfhounds shall fall suppressed, the bearhounds, the falconry. Places shall fall, thick as autumnal leaves. Duc de Polignac demonstrates to the complete silencing of ministerial logic that his place cannot be abolished, then gallantly turning to the queen surrenders it, since her majesty so wishes. Less chivalrous was Duc de Cogne, and yet not luckier. We got into a real quarrel, Cogne and I, said King Louis, but if he had even struck me, I could not have blamed him. In regard to such matters, there can be but one opinion. Baron Bassenval, with that frankness of speech which stamps the independent man, plainly assures Her Majesty that it is frightful, affreux. You go to bed and are not sure but you shall rise impoverished on the morrow. One might as well be in Turkey. It is indeed a dog's life. How singular this perpetual distress of the royal treasury! And yet it is a thing not more incredible than undeniable, a thing mournfully true, the stumbling block on which all ministers successively stumble and fall. Be it want of fiscal genius or some far other want, there is the palpless discrepancy between revenue and expenditure, a deficit of the revenue. You must choke, combler, the deficit, or else it will swallow you. This is the stern problem, hopeless seemingly, as squaring of the circle. Controller Jolet de Flore, who succeeded Necker, could do nothing with it, nothing but propose loans, which were tardily filled up, impose new taxes, unproductive of money, productive of clamor and discontent. As little could Controller Dormison do, or even less, for if Jolet maintained himself beyond year and day, Dormison reckons only by months, till the king purchased Rambouillet without consulting him, which he took as a hint to withdraw. And so, towards the end of 1783, matters threatened to come to still stand. Vain seems human ingenuity. In vain has our newly devised Council of Finances struggled. Our intendants of finance, controller general of finances, there are unhappily no finances to control. Fatal paralysis invades the social movement. Clouds, of blindness or of blackness, envelop us. Are we breaking down, then, into the black horrors of national bankruptcy? Great is bankruptcy, the great bottomless gulf into which all falsehoods, public and private, do sink, disappearing. Whither, from the first origin of them, they are all doomed. For nature is true and not a lie. No lie you can speak or act, but it will come, after longer or shorter circulation, like a bill drawn on nature's reality, and be presented there for payment, with the answer, no effects. Pity only that it often had so long a circulation, that the original forger were so seldom he who bore the final smart of it. Lies, and the burden of evil they bring, are passed on, shifted from back to back and from rank to rank, and so land ultimately on the dumb lowest rank, who with spade and mattock, with sore heart and empty wallet, daily come in contact with reality, and can pass the cheat no further. Observe nevertheless how, 
by a just compensating law if the lie with its burden in this confused whirlpool of society sinks and is shifted ever downwards then in return the distress of it rises ever upwards and upwards whereby after the long pining and demi starvation of those twenty millions a duke de cogne and his majesty come also to have their real quarrel such is the law of just nature bringing though at long intervals and were it only by bankruptcy matters round again to the mark but with a fortunatus purse in his pocket through what length of time might not almost any falsehood last your society your household practical or spiritual arrangement is untrue unjust offensive to the eye of god and man nevertheless its hearth is warm its larder well replenished the innumerable swiss of heaven with a kind of natural loyalty gather round it or prove by pamphleteering musketeering that it is a truth or if not an unmixed unearthly impossible truth then better a wholesomely a tempered one as wind is to the shorn lamb and works well changed outlook however when purse and larder grow empty was your arrangement so true so accordant to nature's ways then how in the name of wonder has nature with her infinite bounty come to leave it famishing there to all men to all women and all children it is now indutiable that your arrangement was false honor to bankruptcy ever righteous on the great scale though in detail it is so cruel under all falsehoods it works unweariedly mining no falsehood did it rise heaven high and cover the world but bankruptcy one day will sweep it down and make us free of it end of section 13 recording by dustin tuttle Section 14 of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Golding. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 3, Chapter 2. Controller Calonne. Under such circumstances of tristesse, obstruction, and sic langueur, when to an exasperated court it seems as if fiscal genius had departed from among men what apparition could be welcomer than that of monsieur de cologne cologne a man of indisputable genius even fiscal genius more or less of experience both in managing finance and parlement for he has been intendant at metz at lille king's procureur at douai a man of weight connected with the moneyed classes of unstained name if it were not some peccadillo of showing a client's letter in that old deguillon la charlotte business as good as forgotten now he has kinsmen of heavy purse felt on the stock exchange our foulon berthier intrigue for him old foulon who has now nothing to do but intrigue who is known and even seen to be what they call a scoundrel but of unmeasured wealth who from commissariat clerk which he once was may hope some think if the game go right to be minister himself one day such propping and backing has m de calonne and then intrinsically such qualities hope radiates from his face persuasion hangs on his tongue for all straits he has present remedy and will make the world roll on wheels before him on the third of november seventeen eighty three the oeil de boeuf rejoices in its new controller general calonne also shall have trial Cologne, also in his way, as Turgot and Necker had done in theirs, shall forward the consummation, suffuse, with one other flush of brilliancy, our now too leaden-coloured era of hope, and wind it up into fulfilment. Great, in any case, is the felicity of the Oeil de Boeuf. Stinginess has fled from these royal abodes. Suppression ceases. Your Besenval may go peaceably to sleep, sure that he shall awake unplundered smiling plenty as if conjured by some enchanter has returned scatters contentment from her new flowing horn and mark what suavity of manners a bland smile distinguishes our controller to all men he listens with an air of interest nay of anticipation makes their own wish clear to themselves and grants it or at least grants conditional promise of it i fear this is a matter of difficulty said her majesty madame answered the controller if it is but difficult it is done if it is impossible it shall be done sifar a man of such facility withal 
to observe him in the pleasure vortex of society, which none partakes of with more gusto. You might ask, when does he work? And yet his work, as we see, is never behindhand, above all, the fruit of his work, ready money. Truly a man of incredible facility, facile action, facile elocution, facile thought, how, in mild suasion, philosophic depth sparkles up from him, as mere wit and lambent sprightliness, and in Her Majesty's soirees, with the weight of a world lying on him, he is the delight of men and women. By what magic does he accomplish miracles? By the only true magic, that of genius. Men name him the minister, as indeed, when was there another such? Crooked things are become straight by him, rough places plain, and over the Oeil de Boeuf there rests an unspeakable sunshine. Nay, in seriousness, let no man say that Cologne had not genius, genius for persuading, before all things for borrowing. With the skilfulest judicious appliances of underhand money, he keeps the stock exchanges flourishing, so that loan after loan is filled up as soon as opened. Calculators likely to know have calculated that he spent, in extraordinaries, at the rate of one million daily, which indeed is some fifty thousand pounds sterling. But did he not procure something with it, namely peace and prosperity, for the time being? Philosophidum grumbles and croaks, buys, as we said, eighty thousand copies of Necker's new book. But non parai calon, in Her Majesty's apartment, with the glittering retinue of dukes, duchesses, and mere happy admiring faces, can let Necker and Philosophidum croak. The misery is, such a time cannot last. Squandering, and payment by loan, is no way to choke a deficit. Neither is oil the substance for quenching conflagrations, but only for assuaging them, not permanently. To the non parai himself, who wanted not insight, it is clear at intervals, and dimly certain at all times, that his trade is by nature temporary, growing daily more difficult, that changes incalculable lie at no great distance. Apart from financial deficit, the world is wholly in such a new-fangled humor, all things working loose from their old fastenings, towards new issues and combinations. There is not a dwarf jockey, a cropped Brutus's head, or anglomaniac horseman rising on his stirrups that does not betoken change. But what then? The day, in any case, passes pleasantly, for the morrow, if the morrow come, there shall be counsel too. Once mounted, by munificence, suasion, magic of genius, high enough in favour with the Oeil de Boeuf, with the king, queen, stock exchange, and so far as possible with all men, an empere controller may hope to go careering through the inevitable, in some unimagined way, as handsomely as another. At all events, for these three miraculous years, it has been expedient heaped on expedient, till now, with such cumulation and height, the pile topples perilous. And here has this world's wonder of a diamond necklace brought it at last to the clear verge of tumbling. Genius in that direction can no more. Mounted high enough, or not mounted, we must fare forth. Hardly is poor Rohan, the necklace cardinal, safely bestowed in the Auvergne mountains, Dame de la Motte unsafely in the Salpetriere, and that mournful business hushed up, when our sanguine controller once more astonishes the world. An expedient, unheard of for these hundred and sixty years, has been propounded, and by dint of suasion, for his light audacity, his hope and eloquence are matchless, has been got adopted. Convocation of the Notables. Let notable persons, the actual or virtual rulers of their districts, be summoned from all sides of France. Let a true tale of His Majesty's patriotic purposes and wretched pecuniary impossibilities be suasively told them, and then the question put, what are we to do? Surely to adopt healing measures, such as the magic of genius will unfold, such as, once sanctioned by notables, all Parlement and all men must, with more or less reluctance, submit to. End of section 14. Recording by Greg Golding, Georgetown, Ontario, Canada. Section 15 of The French Revolution, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 3, Chapter 3. The Notables. Here, then, is verily a sign and wonder, visible to the whole world, bodeful of much. The old de Boeuf dolorously grumbles. 
Were we not well as we stood, quenching conflagrations by oil? Constitutional philosophdom starts with joyful surprise, stares eagerly what the result will be. The public creditor, the public debtor, the whole thinking and thoughtless public have their several surprises, joyful and sorrowful. Count Mirabeau, who has got his matrimonial and other lawsuits huddled up, better or worse, and works now in the dimmest element at Berlin, compiling Prussian monarchies, pamphlets on Cagliostro, writing with pay but not with honorable recognition, innumerable despatches for his government, sense or descries richer quarry from afar. He, like an eagle or vulture, or mixture of both, preens his wings for flight homewards. Monsieur de Calon has stretched out an errand's rod over France, miraculous, and is summoning quite unexpected things. Audacity and hope alternate in him with misgivings, though the sanguine valiant side carries it. Anon he writes to an intimate friend, Je me fais pitié à moi-même. I am an object of pity to myself. Anon invites some dedicating poet or poetaster to sing, This assembly of the notables and the revolution that is preparing. Preparing indeed, and a matter to be sung only not till we have seen it, and what the issue of it is. In deep obscure unrest, all things have so long gone rocking and swaying, will Monsieur de Calon, with this his alchemy of the notables, fasten all together again, and get new revenues, or wrench all asunder, so that it go no longer rocking and swaying, but clashing and colliding? Be this as it may, in the bleak short days we behold men of weight and influence threading the great vortex of French locomotion, each on his several line, from all sides of France towards the Chateau of Versailles, summoned thither de par le roi. There on the 22nd day of February, 1787, they have met, and got installed. Notables to the number of 137, as we count them name by name. Add seven princes of the blood, it makes the round gross of notables, men of the sword, men of the robe, peers dignified clergy, parliamentary presidents, divided into seven boards, bureaux, under our seven princes of the blood, Monsieur d'Artois, Pontiever, and the rest, among whom let not our new Duke d'Orléans, for since 1785 he is Chartres no longer, be forgotten, never yet made admiral, and now turning the corner of his fortieth year, with spoiled blood and prospects, half weary of a world which is more than half weary of him, Monsignor's future is most questionable. Not in illumination and insight, not even in conflagration, but as was said, in dull smoke and ashes of outburnt sensualities does he live and digest sumptuosity and sordidness revenge life weariness ambition darkness putrescence and say in sterling money three hundred thousand a year were this poor prince once to burst loose from his court moorings to what regions with what phenomena might he not sail and drift happily as yet he affects to hunt daily sits there since he must sit presiding that bureau of his with dull moon visage dull glassy eyes, as if it were a mere tedium to him. We observe, finally, that Count Mirabeau has actually arrived. He descends from Berlin, on the scene of action, glares into it with flashing sun-glance, discerns that it will do nothing for him. He had hoped that these notables might need a secretary. They do need one, but have fixed on Dupont de Nemours, a man of smaller fame, but then of better, who indeed, as his friends often hear, labors under this complaint, surely not a universal one, of having five kings to correspond with. The pen of a Mirabeau cannot become an official one. Nevertheless, it remains a pen. In defect of secretaryship, he sets to denouncing stock brokerage, denunciation de l'ajotage, testifying, as his wont is, by loud brute, that he is present and busy. Till, warned by friend Talleyrand, and even by Calhoun himself underhand, that a seventeenth lettre de cachet may be launched against him, he timefully flits over the marches. And now, in stately royal apartments, as pictures of that time still represent them, our hundred and forty-four notables sit organized, ready to hear and consider. Controller Callon is dreadfully behindhand with his speeches, his preparatives. However, the men's facility of work is known to us. For freshness of style, lucidity, ingenuity, largeness of view, that opening harangue of his was unsurpassable, had not the subject matter been so appalling. A deficit, concerning which accounts vary, and the controller's own account is not unquestioned, but which all accounts agree in representing as enormous. This is the epitome of our controller's difficulties. And then his means? Mere turgoism. For thither, it seems, we must come at last. Provincial assemblies. New taxation. Nay, strangest of all, new land tax. What he calls subvention territoriale, from which neither privileged nor unprivileged, noblemen, clergy, nor parliamenteers shall be exempt. Foolish enough, 
These privileged classes have been used to tax, levying toll, tribute, and custom, at all hands, while a penny was left, but to be themselves taxed. Of such privileged persons, meanwhile, do these notables all but the merest fraction consist. Headlong Calon had given no heed to the composition or judicious packing of them, but chosen such notables as were really notable, trusting for the issue to offhand ingenuity, good fortune and eloquence that never yet failed. Headlong controller general, eloquence can do much, but not all. Orpheus, with eloquence grown rhythmic, musical, what we call poetry, drew iron tears from the cheek of Pluto, but by what witchery of rhyme or prose wilt thou from the pocket of Plutus draw gold? Accordingly the storm that now rose and began to whistle around Calon, first in these seven bureaus, and then on the outside of them, awakened by them, spreading wider and wider over all France, threatens to become unappeasable, a deficit so enormous. Mismanagement, profusion is too clear. Peculation itself is hinted at. Nay, Lafayette and others go so far as to speak it out, with attempts at proof. The blame of his deficit, our brave Calon, as was natural, had endeavored to shift from himself on his predecessors, not excepting even Necker. But now Necker vehemently denies, whereupon an angry correspondence, which also finds its way into print. In the Eure de Boeuf, and Her Majesty's private apartments, an eloquent controller, with his Madame, if it is but difficult, had been persuasive. But, alas, the cause is now carried elsewhither. Behold him, one of these sad days in Monsieur's bureau, to which all the other bureaus have sent deputies. He is standing at bay, alone, exposed to an incessant fire of questions, interpolations, objurgations, from those hundred and thirty-seven pieces of logic ordnance, what we may well call bouche à feu, fire-mouths, literally. Never, according to Bazanvel, or hardly ever, had such display of intellect, dexterity, coolness, suasive eloquence, been made by man. To the raging play of so many fire-mouths he opposes nothing angrier than light-beams, self-possession and fatherly smiles. With the imperturbablest bland clearness, he, for five hours long, keeps answering the incessant volley of fiery captious questions, reproachful interpellations, in words prompt as lightning, quiet as light. Nay, the cross-fire, too, such side-questions and incidental interpellations as, in the heat of the main battle, he, having only one tongue, could not get answered. These also he takes up at the first slake, answers even these. Could blandest suasive eloquence have saved France, she were saved heavy-laden controller. In the seven bureaus seems nothing but hindrance. In Monsieur's bureau, a Lomini de Brienne, Archbishop of Toulouse, with an eye himself to the controllership, stirs up the clergy. There are meetings, underground intrigues. Neither from without anywhere comes sign of help or hope. For the nation, where Mirabeau is now with stentor lungs, denouncing Agio, the controller has hitherto done nothing, or less. For Philosophdom he has done as good as nothing, sent out some scientific La Perouse or the like, and is he not in angry correspondence with its necker? The very Eau de Boeuf looks questionable. A falling controller has no friends. Solid Monsieur de Vergin, who with his phlegmatic judicious punctuality might have kept down many things, died the very week before these sorrowful notables met, and now a seal-keeper, Garde de Sceaux Miraminil, is thought to be playing the traitor, spinning plots for Lomini Brienne. Queen's reader, Abbé de Vermont, unloved individual, was Brienne's creature, the work of his hands from the first. It may be feared the backstairs passage is open, ground getting mined under our feet. Treacherous garde des Sceaux Miraminil, at least, should be dismissed. Lamoignon, the eloquent notable, a stanch man with connections and even ideas, Parlement president yet intent on reforming Parlement, were not he the right keeper? So, for one, thinks busy Bosonval, and at dinner-table, rounds the same into the controller's ear who always, in the intervals of landlord duties, listens to him as with charmed look, but answers nothing positive. Alas, what to answer? The force of private intrigue, and then also the force of public opinion, grows so dangerous, confused. Philosophdom sneers aloud, as if its necker already triumphed. The gaping populace gapes over woodcuts or copper cuts, where, for example, a rustic is represented convoking the poultry of his barnyard, with this opening address. Dear animals, I have assembled you to advise me what sauce I should dress you with, to which a cock responding, We don't want to be eaten, is checked by, You wander from the point, vous vous écartez de la question, laughter and logic, ballad singer, pamphleteer epigram and caricature, what wind of public opinion is this, as if the cave of the winds were bursting loose. At nightfall, 
President Lamagnon steals over to the controllers, finds him walking with large strides in his chamber like one out of himself. With rapid confused speech the controller begs Monsieur de Lamagnon to give him an advice. Lamagnon candidly answers that, except in regard to his own anticipated keepership, unless that would prove remedial, he really cannot take upon him to advise. On the Monday after Easter, the ninth of April, 1787, a date one rejoices to verify, for nothing can excel the indolent falsehood of these histoires and memoirs. On the Monday after Easter, as I, Bosanval, was riding towards Romainville to the Marshal de Segur's, I met a friend on the boulevards, who told me that Monsieur de Calon was out. A little further on came Monsieur the Duc de Orleans, dashing towards me, head to the wind, trotting à l'anglaise, and confirmed the news. It is true news treacherous garde des sceaux Mirmenil is gone, and Lamagnon is appointed in his room, but appointed for his own profit only, not for the controller's. Next day, the controller also has had to move. A little longer he may linger near, be seen among the money-changers, and even working in the controller's office, where much lies unfinished, but neither will that hold. Too strong blows and beats this tempest of public opinion, of private intrigue, as from the cave of all the winds, and blows him higher authority giving sign, out of Paris and France, over the horizon, into invisibility, or utter darkness. Such destiny the magic of genius could not forever avert. Ungrateful Old de Boeuf, did he not miraculously rain gold manna on you? So that, as a courtier said, all the world held out its hand, and I held out my hat, for a time. Himself is poor, penniless, had not a financier's widow in Lorraine offered him, though he was turned of fifty, her hand and the rich purse it held. Dim henceforth shall be his activity, though unwearied. Letters to the king, appeals, prognostications, pamphlets, from London, written with the old suasive facility, which however do not persuade. Luckily his widow's purse fails not. Once in a year or two, some shadow of him shall be seen hovering on the northern border, seeking election as national deputy, but be sternly beckoned away. Dimmer then, far borne over utmost European lands, in uncertain twilight of diplomacy, he shall hover, intriguing for exiled princes, and have adventures, be overset into the Rhine stream and half drowned, nevertheless save his papers dry, unwearied, but in vain. In France he works miracles no more, shall hardly return thither to find a grave. Farewell, thou facile sanguine controller general, with thy light rash hand, thy suasive mouth of gold. Worse men there have been, and better, but to thee also was allotted a task of raising the wind, and the winds, and thou hast done it. But now, while ex-controller Calon flies storm-driven over the horizon, in this singular way, what has become of the controllership? It hangs vacant, one may say, extinct like the moon in her vacant interlunar cave. Two preliminary shadows, poor Monsieur Foucault, poor Monsieur Villedoil, do hold in quick succession some simulacrum of it, as the new moon will sometimes shine out with a dim preliminary old one in her arms, be patient, ye notables. An actual new controller is certain, and even ready, were the indispensable manoeuvres but gone through. Long-headed Lamagnon, with Home Secretary Bretoil and Foreign Secretary Montmorin, have exchanged looks. Let these three once meet and speak. Who is it that is strong in the Queen's favour, and the Abbé de Ramon's, that is a man of great capacity, or at least that has struggled these fifty years to have it thought great, now in the clergy's name demanding to have Protestant death penalties put in execution, no flaunting it in the Earl de Boeuf, as the gayest man-pleaser and woman-pleaser, gleaning even a good word from Philosophedom and your Voltaires and D'Alemberts, with a party ready-made for him in the notables, Lomini de Brienne, Archbishop of Toulouse, answer all the three, with the clearest instantaneous concord, and rush off to propose him to the king, in such haste, says Bosonval, that Monsieur de Lamagnon had to borrow a simar, seemingly some kind of cloth apparatus necessary for that. Lomini Brienne, who had all his life felt a kind of predestination for the highest offices, has now therefore obtained them. He presides over the finances. He shall have the title of Prime Minister itself, and the effort of his long life be realized, unhappy only that it took such talent and industry to gain the place, that to qualify for it hardly any talent or industry was left disposable. Looking now into his inner man, what qualification he may have, Lomini beholds, not without astonishment, next to nothing but vacuity and possibility. Principles or methods, acquirement outward or inward, for his very body is wasted, by hard tear and wear, he finds none, not so much as a plan, 
even an unwise one. Lucky in these circumstances that Calon has had a plan. Calon's plan was gathered from Turgos and Neckers by compilation, shall become Lomenese by adoption. Not in vain has Lomenese studied the working of the British constitution, for he professes to have some Anglomania of a sort. Why, in that free country, does one minister, driven out by Parliament, vanish from his king's presence, and another enter, borne in by Parliament? Surely not for mere change, which is ever wasteful, but that all men may have share of what is going, and so the strife of freedom indefinitely prolong itself, and no harm be done. The notables, mollified by Easter festivities, by the sacrifice of Calon, are not in the worst humour. Already his majesty, while the interlunar shadows were in office, had held session of notables, and from his throne delivered promissory conciliatory eloquence. The queen stood waiting at a window, till his carriage came back, and monsieur from afar clapped hands to her, in sign that all was well. It has had the best effect, if such do but last. Leading notables, meanwhile, can be caressed. Brienne's new gloss, La Mignon's long head, will profit somewhat. Conciliatory eloquence shall not be wanting. On the whole, however, is it not undeniable that this of ousting Calonde and adopting the plans of Calonde is a measure which, to produce its best effect, should be looked at from a certain distance, cursorily, not dwelt on with minute near scrutiny, in a word, that no service the notables could now do were so obliging as, in some handsome manner, to take themselves away. Their six propositions, about provisional assemblies, suppression of corvées and such like, can be accepted without criticism. The subvention on land tax, and much else, one must glide hastily over, safe nowhere but in flourishes of conciliatory eloquence, till at length, on this 25th of May, year 1787, in solemn final session, there bursts forth what we can call an explosion of eloquence. King, Lomenie, Lamagnon, and Retinue, taking up the successive strain, in harangues to the number of ten, besides his majesties, which last the livelong day whereby, as in a kind of choral anthem, or bravura appeal, of thanks, praises, promises, the notables are, so to speak, organed out, and dismissed to their respective places of abode. They had sat and talked some nine weeks. They were the first notables since Richelieu's, in the year 1626. By some historians, sitting much at their ease, in the safe distance, Lomeny has been blamed for this dismissal of his notables. Nevertheless, it was clearly time. There are things, as we said, which should not be dwelt on with minute close scrutiny. Over hot coals you cannot glide too fast. In these seven bureaus, where no work could be done, unless talk were work, the questionablest matters were coming up. Lafayette, for example, in Monsignor d'Artois' bureau, took upon him to set forth more than one deprecatory oration about lettres de cachet, liberty of the subject, agio, and such like, which Monsignor endeavouring to repress, was answered that a notable being summoned to speak his opinion must speak it. Thus too his grace the Archbishop of X perorating once with a plaintive pulpit tone in these words, Tithe, that free will offering of the piety of Christians. Tithe, interrupted Duke La Rochefoucauld, with the cold business manner he has learned from the English, that free will offering of the piety of Christians on which there are now forty thousand lawsuits in this realm. Nay, Lafayette, bound to speak his opinion, went the length one day of proposing to convoke a national assembly. "'You demand states-general?' asked Monsignor, with an air of minatory surprise. "'Yes, Monsignor, and even better than that.' "'Write it,' said Monsignor to the clerks. "'Written accordingly it is, and, what is more, will be acted by and by.'" End of section 15「Section 16 of The French Revolution, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 3, Chapter 4. Lomenie's Edicts. Thus, then, have the notables returned home, carrying to all quarters of France such notions of deficit, decrepitude, distraction, and that states-general will cure it, or will not cure it, but kill it. Each notable, we may fancy, is as a funeral torch, 
disclosing hideous abysses better left hid the unquietest humor possesses all men ferments seeks issue in pamphleteering caricaturing projecting declaiming vain jangling of thought word and deed it is spiritual bankruptcy long tolerated verging now towards economical bankruptcy and becoming intolerable for from the lowest dumb rank the inevitable misery as was predicted has spread upwards in every man is some obscure feeling that his position oppressive or else oppressed is a false one all men in one or the other acrid dialect as assaulters or as defenders must give vent to the unrest that is in them of such stuff national well-being and the glory of rulers is not made o lomeni what a wild heaving waste looking hungry and angry world hast thou after lifelong effort got promoted to take charge of lomeni's first edicts are mere soothing ones creation of provincial assemblies for apportioning the imposts when we get any suppression of corvée or statute labor alleviation of gabelle soothing measures recommended by the notables long clamored for by all liberal men oil cast on the waters has been known to produce a good effect before venturing with great essential measures lomeni will see this singular swell of the public mind abate somewhat most proper surely but what if it were not a swell of the abating kind there are swells that come of the upper tempest and wind gust but again there are swells that come of subterranean pent wind some say and even of inward decomposition of decay that has become self-combustion as when according to neptuno plutonic geology the world is all decayed down into due atritis of this sort and shall now be exploded and new made these latter abate not by oil the fool says in his heart how shall not to-morrow be as yesterday as all days which were once to-morrows the wise man looking on this france moral intellectual economical sees in short all the symptoms he has ever met with in history unabatable by soothing edicts meanwhile abate or not cash must be had and for that quite another sort of edicts namely bursal or fiscal ones how easy were fiscal edicts did you know for certain that the parlement of paris would what they call register them such right of registering properly of mere writing down the parlement has got by old want and though but a law court can remonstrate and higgle considerably about the same hence many quarrels desperate mopu devices and victory and defeat a quarrel now near forty years long hence fiscal edicts which otherwise were easy enough become such problems for example is there not calon's subvention territoriale universal unexempting land tax the sheet anchor of finance or to show so far as possible that one is not without original finance talent lomeni himself can devise an edit du tambre or stamp tax 
borrowed also it is true but then from america may it prove luckier in france than there france has her resources nevertheless it cannot be denied the aspect of that parlement is questionable already among the notables in that final symphony of dismissal the paris president had an ominous tone adrien dupour quitting magnetic sleep in this agitation of the world threatens to rouse himself into preternatural wakefulness shallower but also louder there is magnetic despremenil with his tropical heat he was born at madras with his dusky confused violence holding of illumination animal magnetism public opinion adam weishaupt harmodius and aristogiton and all manner of confused and violent things of whom can come no good the very peerage is infected with the leaven our peers have in too many cases laid aside their frogs laces bagwigs and go about in english costume or ride rising in their stirrups in the most headlong manner nothing but insubordination eleutheromania confused unlimited opposition in their heads questionable not to be ventured upon if we had a fortunatus purse but lomeny has waited all june casting on the waters what oil he had and now be tied as it may the two finance edicts must out on the sixth of july he forwards his proposed stamp tax and land tax to the parlement of paris and as if putting his own leg foremost not his borrowed calon's leg places the stamp tax first in order alas the parlement will not register the parlement demands instead a state of the expenditure a state of the contemplated reductions states enough which his majesty must decline to furnish discussions arise patriotic eloquence the peers are summoned does the nemean lion begin to bristle here surely is a duel which france and the universe may look upon with prayers at lowest with curiosity and bets paris stirs with new animation the outer courts of the palais de justice roll with unusual crowds coming and going their huge outer hum mingles with the clang of patriotic eloquence within and gives vigor to it poor lomeny gazes from the distance little comforted has his invisible emissaries flying to and fro assiduous without result so pass the sultry dog days in the most electric manner and the whole month of july and still in the sanctuary of justice sounds nothing but harmodious aristogiton eloquence environed with the hum of crowding paris and no registering accomplished and no states furnished states said a lively parlementeer monsieur the states that should be furnished us in my opinion are the states general on which timely joke there followed cachinatory buzzes of approval what a word to be spoken in the palais de justice old dormison the ex-controller's uncle shakes his judicious head far enough from laughing but the outer courts and paris and france catch the glad sound 
and repeat it, shall repeat it, and re-echo and reverberate it till it grow a deafening peal. Clearly enough, here is no registering to be thought of. The pious proverb says, There are remedies for all things but death. When a parlement refuses registering, the remedy, by long practice, has become familiar to the simplest. A bed of justice. One complete month this parlement has spent in mere idle jargoning, and sound and fury. The tumbra edict, not registered, or like to be. The subvention, not yet so much as spoken of. On the 6th of August, let the whole refractory body roll out, in wheeled vehicles, as far as the king's chateau of Versailles. There shall the king, holding his bed of justice, order them, by his own royal lips, to register. They may remonstrate in an undertone, but they must obey, lest a worse unknown thing befall them. It is done. The Parlement has rolled out on royal summons, has heard the express royal order to register, whereupon it has rolled back again amid the hushed expectancy of men. And now, behold, on the morrow, this Parlement, seated once more in its own palais, with crowds inundating the outer courts, not only does not register, but, O oh, portent, declares all that was done on the prior day to be null, and the bed of justice as good as a futility. In the history of France, here verily is a new feature. Nay, better still, our heroic Parlement, getting suddenly enlightened on several things, declares that, for its part, it is incompetent to register tax edicts at all, having done it by mistake during these late centuries, that for such act one authority only is competent, the assembled three estates of the realm. To such length can the universal spirit of a nation penetrate the most isolated body corporate, say rather with such weapons, homicidal and suicidal, in exasperated political duel, will bodies corporate fight. But in any case, is not this the real death grapple of war and internecine duel, Greek meeting Greek, whereon men had they even no interest in it, might look with interest unspeakable. Crowds, as was said, inundate the outer courts. Inundation of young, eleutheromaniac noblemen in English costume, uttering audacious speeches. Of procurers, bazosh clerks, who are idle in these days of loungers, newsmongers, and other nondescript classes, rolls tumultuous there. From three to four thousand persons, waiting eagerly to hear the arrêt, resolutions, you arrive at within, applauding with bravos, with the clapping of from six to eight thousand hands. Sweet also is the mead of patriotic eloquence, when your despremenil, your froteau, or sabatier, issuing from his Demosthenic Olympus, the thunder being hushed for the day, is welcomed in the outer courts with a shout from four thousand throats, is borne home shoulder high with benedictions and strikes the stars with his sublime head. End of section 16
Section 17 of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 3, Chapter 5. Lomini's Thunderbolts. Aris Lomini Brienne. Here is no case for letters of gestion, for faltering or compromise. Thou seest the whole loose, fluent population of Paris, whatsoever is not solid and fixed to work, inundating these outer courts like a loud, destructive deluge. The very basoche of lawyers' clerks talks sedition. The lower classes, in this duel of authority with authority, Greek throttling Greek, have ceased to respect the city watch. Police satellites are marked on the back with chalk. The M signifies Musha, or spy. They are hustled, hunted like ferrae naturae. Subordinate rural tribunals send messengers of congratulation, of adherence. Their fountain of justice is becoming a fountain of revolt. The provincial parliaments look on with intent eye, with breathless wishes, while their elder sister of Paris does battle. The whole twelve are of one blood and temper. The victory of one is that of all. Ever worse it grows. On the 10th of August there is a plant omitted touching the prodigalities of Calon and permission to proceed against him no registering but instead of it denouncing of dilapidation peculation and even the burden of the song states general have the royal armories no thunderbolt that thou couldst o lomini with red right hand launch it among these demosthenic theatrical thunder barrels mere resin and noise for the most part and shatter and smite them silent on the night of the 14th of August, Lomini launches his thunderbolt, or handful of them. Letters named of the seal, de cachet, as many as needful, some six score and odd, are delivered overnight. And so, next day betimes, the whole Parliament, once more set on wheels, is rolling incessantly towards Troy in Champagne, escorted, says history, with the blessings of all people. The very innkeepers and postilions looking gratuitously reverent. This is the fifteenth of August, seventeen eighty seven. What will not people bless in their extreme need? Seldom had the Parliament of Paris deserved much blessing or received much. An isolated body corporate, which, out of old confusions, while the sceptre of the sword was confusedly struggling to become a sceptre of the pen, had got itself together better and worse as bodies corporate do to satisfy some dim desire of the world and many clear desires of individuals and so had grown in the course of centuries on concession on acquirement and usurpation to be what we see it a prosperous social anomaly deciding lawsuits sanctioning or rejecting laws and withal disposing of its places and offices by sale for ready money which method sleek president henon after meditation will demonstrate to be the indifferent best in such a body existing by purchase for ready money there could not be excess of public spirit there might well be excess of eagerness to divide the public spoil men in helmets have divided that with swords men in wigs with quill and inkhorn to divide it and even more hatefully these latter if more peaceably, for the Whig method is at once irresistibler and baser. By long experience, says Bessonval, it had been found useless to sue a parliamentaire at law. No officer of justice will serve a writ on one. His wig and gown are his Vulcan's panoply, his enchanted cloak of darkness. The Parliament of Paris may count itself an unloved body, mean, not magnanimous on the political side were the king weak always as now has his parliament barked cur-like at his heels and what popular cry there might be 
were he strong it barked before his face hunting for him as his alert beagle an unjust body where foul influences have more than once worked shameful perversion of judgment does not in these very days the blood of murdered lally cry aloud for vengeance baited circumvented driven mad like the snared lion valour had to sink extinguished under vindictive chicane behold him that hapless lally his wild dark soul looking through his wild dark face trailed on the ignominious death hurdle the voice of his despair choked by a wooden gag the wild fire soul that has known only peril and toil and for three score years has buffeted against fate's obstruction and men's perfidy like genius and courage amid poltroonery dishonesty and commonplace faithfully enduring and endeavouring o parliament of paris dost thou reward it with a gibbet and a gag the dying lally bequeathed his memory to his boy a young lally has arisen demanding redress in the name of god and man the parliament of paris does its utmost to defend the indefensible abominable nay what is singular dusky glowing aristogiton despremenil is the man chosen its spokesman in that such social anomaly is it that france now blesses an unclean social anomaly but in duel against another worse the exiled parliament is felt to have covered itself with glory there are quarrels in which even satan bringing help were not unwelcome even satan fighting stiffly might cover himself with glory of a temporary sort but what a stir in the outer courts of the palais where paris finds its parliament trumbled off to troyes and champagne and nothing left but a few mute keepers of records a demosthenic thunder become extinct the martyrs of liberty clean gone confused wail and menace rises from the four thousand throats of procurers bassoche clerks nondescripts and anglomaniac noblesse ever new idlers crowd to see and hear rascality with increasing numbers and vigour hunts mouchal loud whirlpool rolls through these spaces the rest of the city fixed to its work cannot yet go rolling audacious placards are legible in and about the palais the speeches are as good as seditious surely the temper of paris is much changed on the third day of this business eighteenth of august monsieur and monseigneur d'artois coming in stage carriages according to use and wont to have these late obnoxious arrêtes and protests expunged from the records are received in the most marked manner monsieur who is thought to be in opposition is met with vivats and strewed flowers monseigneur on the other hand with silence with murmurs which rise to hisses and groans nay an irreverent rascality presses towards him in floods with such hissing vehemence that the captain of the guards has to give order Ole's arms handle arms at which thunder word indeed and the flash of the clear iron the rascal flood recoils through all avenues fast enough new features these indeed as good as monsieur de malazurde's pertinently remarks it is a quite new kind of contest this with the parliament no transitory sputter as from collision of hard bodies but more like the first sparks of what if not quenched may become a great conflagration this good malazurbs sees himself now again in the king's council after an absence of ten years lomini would profit if not by the faculties of the man yet by the name he has as for the man's opinion it is not listened to wherefore he will soon withdraw a second time back to his books and his trees in such king's council what can a good man profit turgo tries it not a second time turgo has quitted france and this earth some years ago and now cares for none of these things singular enough turgo this same lomini 
and the Abbe Morellet were once a trio of young friends, fellow scholars in the Sorbonne. Forty new years have carried them severally thus far. Meanwhile, the Parliament sits daily at Troy, calling cases, and daily adjourns, no procurer making his appearance to plead. Troy's is as hospitable as could be looked for. Nevertheless, one has comparatively a dull life. No crowds now to carry you, shoulder high to the immortal gods. Scarcely a patriot or two will drive out so far and bid you be of firm courage. You are in furnished lodgings, far from home and domestic comfort, little to do but wander over the unlovely champagne fields, seeing the grapes ripen, taking counsel about the thousand times consulted, a prey to tedium, in danger even that Paris may forget you. Messengers come and go. Pacific Lomini is not slack in negotiating, promising. Dormesson and the prudent elder members see no good in strife. After a dull month, the Parliament, yielding and retaining, makes truce, as all Parliaments must. The stamp tax is withdrawn. The subvention land tax is also withdrawn. But, in its stead, there is granted what they call a prorogation of the second twentieth itself a kind of land tax but not so oppressive to the influential classes which lies mainly on the dumb class moreover secret promises exist on the part of the elders that finances may be raised by loan of the ugly word states general there shall be no mention and so on the twentieth of september our exiled parliament returns Despremenil said it went out covered with glory, but had come back covered with mud Not so Aristogiton or if so thou surely art the man to clean it End of section 17section 18 of the French Revolution this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 3, Chapter 6. Lomenie's Plots. Was ever unfortunate chief minister so bested as Lomenie Brienne? The reins of the state fairly in his hand these six months, and not the smallest motive power of finance to stir from the spot with, this way or that. He flourishes his whip, but advances not. Instead of ready money, there is nothing but rebellious debating in recalcitrating. Far is the public mind from having calmed. It goes chafing and fuming even worse, and in the royal coffers, and such yearly deficit running on, there is hardly the colour of coin. Ominous prognostics. Mal Serbs, seeing an exhausted, exasperated France grow hotter and hotter, talks of conflagration. Mirabeau, without talk, has, as we perceive, descended on Paris again, close to the rear of Parlement, not to quit his native soil any more. Over the frontiers, behold, Holland invaded by Prussia, October 1787. The French party oppressed, England and the Stadtholder triumphing, to the sorrow of War Secretary Montmorin, and all men, but without money, sinews of war, as of work, and of existence itself, what can a chief minister do? Taxes profit little. This of the second twentieth falls not due till next year, and will then, with its strict valuation, produce more controversy than cash taxes on the privileged classes cannot be registered are intolerable to our supporters themselves taxes on the unprivileged yield nothing as from a thing drained dry more cannot be drawn hope is nowhere if not in the old refuge of loans to lomini aided by the long head of la moignon deeply pondering this sea of troubles the thought suggested itself why not have a successive loan on prince successive or loan that went on lending year after year 
as much as needful say till seventeen ninety two the trouble of registering such loan were the same we had then breathing time money to work with at least to subsist on edict of a successive loan must be proposed to conciliate the philosophes let a liberal edict walk in front of it for emancipation of protestants let a liberal promise guard the rear of it and when our loan ends in that final seventeen ninety two the states general shall be convoked such liberal edict of protestant emancipation the time having come for it shall cost a lomini as little as the death penalties to be put in execution did as for the liberal promise of states general it can be fulfilled or not the fulfilment is five good years off in five years much intervenes but the registering ah truly there is the difficulty however we have that promise of the elders given secretly at Troyes. judicious gratuities cajoleries underground intrigues with old foulon named arm damne familiar demon of the parlement may perhaps do the rest at worst and lowest the royal authority has resources which ought it not to put forth if it cannot realize money the royal authority is as good as dead dead of that surest and miserablest death inanition risk and win without risk all is already lost for the rest as in enterprises of pith a touch of stratagem often proves furthersome his majesty announces a royal hunt for the nineteenth of november next and all whom it concerns are joyfully getting their gear ready royal hunt indeed but of two-legged unfeathered game at eleven in the morning of that royal hunt day nineteenth of november seventeen eighty seven unexpected blare of trumpeting tumult of charioteering and cavalcading disturbs the seat of justice his majesty is come with garde des sceaux la Mignon, and peers and retinue to hold royal session and have edicts registered what a change since louis the fourteenth entered here in boots and whip in hand ordered his registering to be done with an olympian look which none durst gainsay and did without stratagem in such unceremonious fashion hunt as well as register for louis the sixteenth on this day the registering will be enough if indeed he and the day suffice for it meanwhile with fit ceremonial words the purpose of the royal breast is signified two edicts for protestant emancipation for successive loan of both which edicts our trusty garde des sceaux lamoignon will explain the purport on both which a trusty parlement is requested to deliver its opinion each member having free privilege of speech and so la moignon too having perorated not amiss and wound up with that promise of states-general the sphere music of parliamentary eloquence begins explosive responsive sphere answering sphere it waxes louder and louder the peers sit attentive of diverse sentiment unfriendly to states-general unfriendly to despotism which cannot reward merit and is suppressing places but what agitates his highness d'orleans the rubicund moonhead goes wagging darker beams the copper visage like unscoured copper in the glazed eye is disquietude he rolls uneasy in his seat as if he meant something amid unutterable satiety has sudden new appetite for new forbidden fruit been vouchsafed him disgust and audacity laziness that cannot rest futile ambition revenge non-admiralship oh within that carbuncled skin what a confusion of confusion sits bottled eight couriers in course of the day gallop from versailles where lomini waits palpitating and gallop back again not with the best news in the outer courts of the palais huge buzz of expectation reigns it is whispered the chief minister has lost six votes overnight and from within resounds nothing but forensic eloquence pathetic and ever indignant heart-rending appeals to the royal clemency that the majesty would please to summon states-general forthwith and be the saviour of france wherein dusky glowing desbremenil but still more sabatier de cabre and fretto since named comer fretto goody fretto are among the loudest 
for six mortal hours it lasts in this manner the infinite hubbub unslackened and so now when brown dusk is falling through the windows and no end visible his majesty on hint of garde des sceaux lamoignon opens his royal lips once more to say in brief that he must have his loan edict registered momentary deep pause see monseigneur d'orleans rises the moon visage turned towards the royal platform he asks with a delicate graciosity of manner covering unutterable things whether it is a bed of justice then or a royal session fire flashes on him from the throne and neighbourhood surly answers that it is in session in that case monseigneur will crave leave to remark that edicts cannot be registered by order of a session and indeed to enter against such registry his individual humble protest vous êtes bien le maître you will do your pleasure answers the king and thereupon in high state marches out escorted by his court retinue d'orleans himself as in duty bound escorting him but only to the gate which duty done d'orleans returns in from the gate redacts his protest in the face of an applauding parlement and applauding france and so has cut his court moorings shall we say and will now sail and drift fast enough towards chaos thou foolish d'orleans equality that art to be is royalty grown a mere wooden scarecrow whereon thou pert scold-headed crow mayst alight at pleasure and peck not yet wholly next day a lettre de cachet sends d'orleans to bethink himself in his chateau of vie cotteret where alas is no paris with its joyous necessaries of life no fascinating indispensable madame de buffon light wife of a great naturalist much too old for her monseigneur it is said does nothing but walk distractedly at vie cotteret cursing his stars versailles itself shall hear penitent wail from him so hard is his doom by a second simultaneous lettre de cachet goody fretto is hurled into the stronghold of ham amid the norman marshes by a third sabatier de cabre into mont saint michel amid the norman quicksands as for the parlement it must on summons travel out to versailles with its register book under its arm to have the protest beef expunged not without admonition and even rebuke a stroke of authority which one might have hoped would quiet matters unhappily no it is a mere taste of the whip to rearing coursers which make them rear worse when a team of twenty-five millions begins rearing what is lomini's whip the parlement will no wise acquiesce meekly and set to register the protestant edict and do its other work in salutary fear of these three lettres de cachet far from that it begins questioning lettres de cachet generally their legality endurability emits dolorous objurgation petition on petition to have its three martyrs delivered cannot till that be complied with so much as think of examining the protestant edict but puts it off always till this day week in which objurgatory strain paris and france joins it or rather has preceded it making fearful chorus and now also the other parlement at length opening their mouths begin to join some of them as at grenoble and rennes with portentous emphasis threatening by way of reprisal to interdict the very tax-gatherer in all former contests as malsherbes remarks it was the parlement that excited the public but here it is the public that excites the parlement end of section 18section 19 of the french revolution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson the french revolution by thomas carlyle volume 1 book 3 chapter 7 internecine 
What a France through these winter months of the year 1787! The very Eau de Boeuf is doleful, uncertain, with a general feeling among the suppressed that it were better to be in Turkey. The wolf hounds are suppressed, the bear hounds, Duc de Coigny, Duc de Polignac, in the Triana Little Heaven, Her Majesty one evening takes Bensonval's arm, asks his candid opinion. The intrepid Bessonval, having, as he hopes, nothing of the sycophant in him, plainly signifies that, with a Parlement in rebellion and an eau de boeuf in suppression, the King's crown is in danger, whereupon, singular to say, Her Majesty, as if hurt, changed the subject, et ne me parle plus de rien. To whom, indeed, can this poor Queen speak? In need of wise counsel, if ever mortal was, yet beset here only by the hubbub of chaos. Her dwelling-place is so bright to the eye, and confusion and black care darkens it all. Sorrows of the sovereign, sorrows of the woman, think coming sorrows environ her more and more. La Motte, the necklace countess, has in these late months escaped, perhaps been suffered to escape, from the Salpetriere. Vain was the hope that Paris might thereby forget her, and this ever-widening lie and heap of lies subside. The La Motte, with a V for voleur's thief, branded on both shoulders, has got to England, and will therefrom emit lie on lie, defiling the highest queenly name, mere distracted lies, which, in its present humour, France will greedily believe. For the rest, it is too clear our successive loan is not filling, as indeed, in such circumstances, a loan registered by expunging of protests was not the likeliest to fill. Denunciation of lettres de cachet, of despotism generally, abates not. The twelve parlements are busy, the twelve hundred placarders, ballad singers, pamphleteers. Paris is what in figurative speech they call flooded with pamphlets, regorge de brochures, flooded and eddying again, hot deluge from so many patriot ready writers, all at the fervid or boiling point, each ready writer now in the hour of eruption going like an Iceland geyser, against which what can a judicious friend Maurier do? A riverol, an unruly langue well paid for it spouting cold now also at length does come discussion for the protestant edict but only for new embroilment in pamphlet and counter pamphlet increasing the madness of men not even orthodoxy bedrid as she seemed but will have a hand in this confusion she once again in the shape of abbe l'enfant whom prelates strive to visit and congratulate raises audible sound from her pulpit drum or mark how despreminil who has his own confused way in all things produces at the right moment in parliamentary harangue a pocket crucifix with the apostrophe will you crucify him afresh him o despreminil without scruple considering what poor stuff of ivory and filigree he is made of to all which add only that poor brienne has fallen sick so hard was the tear and wear of his sinful youth, so violent incessant is his agitation of his foolish old age. Baited, bayed at through so many throats, his grace growing consumptive, inflammatory, with humeur de dart, lies reduced to milk diet, in exasperation, almost in desperation, with repose precisely the impossible recipe, prescribed as the indispensable. On the whole, what can a poor government do, but once more recoil ineffectual? The king's treasury is running towards the less, the Paris eddies with a flood of pamphlets. At all rates, let the latter subside a little. D'Orléans gets back to Rancy, which is nearer Paris, and the fair frail Buffon, finally to Paris itself. Neither are Fréteau and Sabatier banished for ever. The Protestant edict is registered to the joy of Boissy d'Anglas and good Malzerbe. Successive loan, all protests expunged or else withdrawn, remains open, the rather as few or none come to fill it. States-general, for which the Parlement has clamoured, 
and now the whole nation clamours will follow in five years if indeed not sooner oh parlement of paris what a clamour was that messieurs said old domesson you will get states general and you will repent it like the horse in the fable who to be avenged of his enemy applied to the man the man mounted did swift execution of the enemy but unhappily would not dismount instead of five years let three years pass and this clamorous parlement will have both seen its enemy hurled prostrate and itself ridden to foundering say rather jugulated for hide and shoes and lie dead in the ditch under such omens however we have reached the spring of seventeen eighty eight by no path can the king's government find passage for itself but is everywhere shamefully flung back beleaguered by twelve rebellious parliaments which are grown to be the organs of an angry nation it can advance no whither can accomplish nothing obtain nothing not so much as money to subsist on but must sit there seemingly to be eaten up of deficit the measure of the iniquity then of the falsehood which had been gathering through long centuries is nearly full at least that of the misery is for the hovels of the twenty-five millions the misery permeating upwards and forwards as its law is has gone so far to the very eau de boeuf of versailles man's hand in this blind pain is set against man not only the low against the higher but the higher against each other provincial noblesse is bitter against court noblesse robe against sword rocher against pen but against the king's government who is not bitter not even besenval in these days to all men and bodies of men are become as enemies it is the centre whereon infinite contentions unite and clash what new universal vertiginous movement is this of institution social arrangements individual minds which once worked cooperative now rolling and grinding in distracted collision inevitable it is the breaking up of a world solecism worn out at last down even to bankruptcy of money and so this poor versailles court as the chief or central solecism finds all the other solecisms arrayed against it most natural for your human solecism be it person or combination of persons is ever by law of nature uneasy if verging towards bankruptcy it is even miserable and when would the meanest solecism consent to blame or amend itself while there remained another to amend these threatening signs do not terrify lomini much less teach him lomini though of light nature is not without courage of a sort nay we have not read of lightest creatures trained canary birds that could fly cheerfully with lighted matches and fire cannon fire whole powder magazines to sit and die of deficit is no part of lomini's plan the evil is considerable but can he not remove it can he not attack it at lowest he can attack the symptom of it these rebellious parlements he can attack and perhaps remove much is dim to lomini but two things are clear that such parliamentary duel with royalty is growing perilous nay internecine above all that money must be had take thought brave lomini thou garde so lamoignon who hast ideas so often defeated bolt cruelly when the golden fruit seemed within clutch rally for one other struggle to tame the parlement to fill the king's coffers these are now life and death questions parlements have been tamed more than once set to perch on the peaks of rocks inaccessible except by litters a parlement grows reasonable oh mopo thou bold man had we left thy work where it was but apart from exile or other violent methods is there not one method whereby all things are tamed even lions the method of hunger what if the parlement's supplies were cut off namely its lawsuits minor courts for the trying of innumerable minor causes might be instituted these we could call grombaillage whereupon the parlement shortened of its prey would look with yellow despair 
but the public fond of cheap justice would favor and hope then for finance for registering of edicts why not from our own oeil de boeuf dignitaries our princes dukes marshals make a thing we could call plenary court and there so to speak do our registering ourselves st louis had his plenary court of great barons most useful to him our great barons are still here at least the name of them is still here our necessity is greater than his such is the lomini lamoignon device welcome to the king's council as a light beam in great darkness the device seems feasible it is eminently needful be it once well executed great deliverance is wrought silence then and steady now or never the world shall see one other historical scene and no singular a man as lomini de brienne still the stage manager there behold accordingly a home secretary britoy beautifying paris in the peaceablest manner in this hopeful spring weather of seventeen eighty eight the old hovels and hutches disappearing from our bridges as if for the state too there were halcyon weather and nothing to do but beautify parlement seems to sit acknowledged victor brienne says nothing of finance or even says and prints that it is all well how is this such halcyon quiet though the successive loan did not fill in a victorious parlement councillor goslard de monsabert even denounces that levying of the second twentieth on strict valuation and gets decree that the valuation shall not be strict not on the privileged classes nevertheless brienne endures it launches no lettre de cachet against it how is this smiling is such vernal weather but treacherous sudden for one thing we hear it whispered the intendants of provinces have all got order to be at their posts on a certain day still more singular what incessant printing is this that goes on in the king's chateau under lock and key sentries occupy all gates and windows the printers come not out they sleep in their workrooms their very food is handed into them a victorious parliament smells new danger Despremenil has ordered horses to versailles prowls round that guarded printing office prying snuffing if so be the sagacity and ingenuity of man may penetrate it to a shower of gold most things are penetrable Despremenil descends on the lap of a printer's dane in the shape of five hundred louis d'or the dane's husband smuggles a ball of clay to her which she delivers to the golden councillor of parlement needed within it their stick printed proof sheets by heaven the royal edict of that same self-registering plenary court and those grand bayages that shall cut short our lawsuits it is to be promulgated over all france on one and the same day this then is what the intendants were bid wait for at their posts this is what the court sat hatching as its accursed cockatrice egg and would not stir though provoked till the brood were out high with it despremenil home to paris convoke instantaneous sessions let the parlement and the earth and the heavens know it end of section 19section 20 of the french revolution by thomas carlyle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the french revolution by thomas carlyle volume 1 book 3 chapter 8 lomini's death throes on the morrow which is the 3rd of may 1788 an astonished parliament sits convoked listen speechless to the speech of disprimenil unfolding the infinite misdeed deed of treachery of unhallowed darkness such as despotism loves denounce it o parliament of paris awaken france and the universe roll what thunder barrels of forensic eloquence thou hast with thee too it is verily now or never the parliament is not wanting at such juncture in the hour of his extreme jeopardy the lion first incites himself by roaring by lashing his sides so here the parliament of paris on the motion of disprimenil 
a most patriotic oath of the one and all sort is sworn with united throat an excellent new idea which in these coming years shall not remain unimitated next comes indomitable declaration almost of the rights of man at least of the rights of parliament invocation to the friends of french freedom in this and in subsequent time all which or the essence of all which is brought to paper in a tone wherein something of plaintiveness blends with and tempers heroic valor and thus having sounded the storm-bell which paris hears which all france will hear and hurled such defiance in the teeth of lomanian despotism the parliament retires as from a tolerable first day's work but how lomany felt to see his cockatrice egg so essential to the salvation of france broken in this premature manner let readers fancy indignant he clutches at his thunderbolts de cachet of the seal and launches two of them a bolt for disprimenil a bolt for that busy goeslard whose service in the second twentieth and strict valuation is not forgotten such bolts clutched promptly overnight and launched with the early new morning shall strike agitated paris if not into requiescence yet into wholesome astonishment ministerial thunderbolts may be launched but if they do not hit disprimenil and goeslard warned both of them as is thought by the singing of some friendly bird elude the lomini tipstaves escape disguised through sky windows over roofs to their own palais de justice the thunderbolts have missed paris for the buzz flies abroad is struck into astonishment not wholesome the two martyrs of liberty doff their disguises don their long gowns behold in the space of an hour by aid of ushers and swift runners the parliament with its councillors presidents even peers sits anew assembled the assembled parliament declares that these its two martyrs cannot be given up to any sublunary authority moreover that the session is permanent admitting of no adjournment till pursuit of them has been relinquished and so with forensic eloquence denunciation and protest with couriers going and returning the parliament in the state of continual explosion that shall cease neither night nor day waits the issue awakened paris once more inundates those outer courts boils in floods wilder than ever through all avenues dissonant hubbub there is jargon as of babel in the hour when they were first smitten as here with mutual unintelligibility and the people had not yet dispersed paris city goes through its diurnal epochs of working and slumbering and now for the second time most european and african mortals are asleep but here in this whirlpool of words sleep falls not the night spreads her coverlet of darkness over it in vain within is the sound of mere martyr invincibility tempered with the due tone of plaintiveness without is the infinite expectant hum growing drowsier a little so has it lasted for six and thirty hours but hark through the dead of midnight what tramp is this tramp as of armed men foot and horse gare de Française, gare de suisse marching hither in silent regularity in the flare of torchlight there are sappers too with axes and crowbars apparently if the doors open not they will be forced it is captain d'auguste missioned from versailles d'auguste a man of known firmness who once forced prince conde himself by mere incessant looking at him to give satisfaction in fight he now with axes and torches is advancing on the very sanctuary of justice sacrilegious yet what help the man is a soldier looks merely at his orders impassive moves forward like an inanimate engine the doors open on summons there need no axes door after door and now the innermost door opens discloses the long-gowned senators of france a hundred and sixty-seven by tail seventeen of them peers sitting there majestic in permanent session were not the men military and of cast iron this sight this silence re-echoing the clank of his own boots might stagger him for the hundred and sixty-seven receive him in perfect silence which some liken to that of the roman senate overfallen by brennus some to that of a nest of coiners surprised by officers of the police monsieur said d'auguste de par le roi express order has charged d'auguste with the sad duty of arresting two individuals m du val de Spriminil and m goslar de montsabert which respectable individuals as he has not the honour of knowing them are hereby invited in the king's name to surrender themselves profound silence buzz which grows a murmur we are all de Spriminis ventures a voice which other voices repeat the president inquires whether he will employ violence captain d'auguste honoured with his majesty's commission has to execute his majesty's order would so gladly do it without violence will in any case do it grants an august senate space to deliberate which method they prefer and thereupon d'auguste with grave military courtesy 
has withdrawn for the moment. What boots it, august senators? All avenues are closed with fixed bayonets. Your courier gallops to Versailles, through the dewy night, but also gallops back again, with tidings that the order is authentic, that it is irrevocable. The outer courts simmer with idle population, but d'Auguste's grenadier ranks stand there as immovable floodgates. There will be no revolting to deliver you. Monsieur, thus spoke de Spriminil, when the victorious Gauls entered Rome, which they had carried by assault, the Roman senators, clothed in their purple, sat there in their curial chairs, with a proud and tranquil countenance, awaiting slavery or death. Such, too, is the lofty spectacle which you, in this hour, offer to the universe, after having generously, with much more of the like as can still be read. In vain, Otis Brimenil, here is this cast-iron Captain d'Auguste, with his cast-iron military air, come back. Despotism, constraint, destruction sit waving in his plumes. Disprimenil must fall silent, heroically give himself up, lest worse to befall. Him Goslard heroically imitates. With spoken and speechless emotion, they fling themselves into the arms of their parliamentary brethren for a last embrace. And so amid plaudits and plaints from a hundred and sixty-five throats, amid wavings, sobbings, a whole forest sigh of parliamentary pathos, they are led through winding passages to the rear gate, where, in the grey of the morning, two coaches with exempts stand waiting. There must the victims mount, bayonets menacing behind. Disprimenil's stern question to the populace, whether they have courage, is answered by silence. They mount and roll, and neither the rising of the May sun, it is the sixth morning, nor its setting shall lighten their heart. But they fare forward continually, Desprimenil towards the utmost isles of Sainte Marguerite, or Yeres, supposed by some, if that is any comfort, to be Calypso's island, Goslard towards the land fortress of Pierre on Seas, extant then near the city of Lyon. Captain d'Auguste may now therefore look forward to majorship, to commandantship of the Tuileries, and withal vanish from history, where nevertheless he has been fated to do a notable thing, for not only are Desprimenil and Goslard safe whirling southward, but the Parliament itself has straightway to march out. To that also his inexorable order reaches. Gathering up their long skirts, they file out, the whole hundred and sixty-five of them, through two rows of unsympathetic grenadiers, a spectacle to gods and men. The people revolt not. They only wonder and grumble. Also, we remark, these unsympathetic grenadiers are Garde Française, who one day will sympathize. In a word, the Palais de Justice is swept clear. The doors of it are locked and d'Auguste returns to Versailles with the key in his pocket, having, as was said, merited preferment. As for this Parliament of Paris, now turned out to the street, we will without reluctance leave it there. The beds of justice it had to undergo, in the coming fortnight, at Versailles, in registering, or rather refusing to register, those new hatched edicts, and how it assembled in taverns and taprooms there, for the purpose of protesting, or hovered disconsolate, without spread skirts, not knowing where to assemble and was reduced to lodge protest with a notary, and in the end to sit still in a state of forced vacation, and do nothing. All this, natural now as the burying of the dead after battle, shall not concern us. The Parliament of Paris has as good as performed its part, doing and misdoing, so far, but hardly further could it stir the world. Lomini has removed the evil then? Not at all, not so much as the symptom of the evil, scarcely the twelfth part of the symptom, and exasperated the other eleven. The intendant of provinces, the military commandants are at their posts, on the appointed 8th of May, but in no parliament, if not in the single one of Douai, can these new edicts get registered. Not peaceable signing with ink, but browbeating, bloodshedding, appeal to primary club law, against these bayages, against this plenary court, exasperated Themis everywhere shows face of battle. The provincial noblesse are of her party, and whoever hates Lomini in the evil time, with her attorneys and tipstaves, she enlists and operates down even to the populace, at Rennes in Brittany, where the historical Bertrand de Molville is intendant, it has passed from fatal continual dueling between the military and gentry, to street fighting, to stone volleys and musket shot, and still the edicts remain unregistered. The afflicted Bretons send remonstrance to Lomini, by a deputation of twelve, whom, however, Lomini, having heard them, shuts up in the Bastille a second larger deputation he meets, by his scouts, on the road, and persuades or frightens back. But now a third largest deputation is indignantly sent by many roads. Refused audience on arriving, it meets to take counsel, 
invites Lafayette and all patriot Bretons in Paris to assist, agitates itself, becomes the Breton Club, first germ of the Jacobin Society. So many as eight parliaments get exiled. Others might need that remedy, but it is not always easy of appliance. At Grenoble, for instance, where a Mounier, a Barnav, have not been idle, the parliament had due order, by lettre de cachet, to depart and exile itself. But on the morrow, instead of coaches getting yoked, the alarm bell bursts forth ominous and peals and booms all day. Crowds of mountaineers rush down, with axes, even with firelocks, whom, most ominous of all, the soldiery shows no eagerness to deal with. Axe overhead, the poor general has to sign capitulation, to engage that the lettre de cachet shall remain unexecuted, and a beloved parliament stay where it is. Besançon, Dijon, Rouen, Bordeaux, are not what they should be. At Pau and Bayarn, where the old commandant had failed, the new one, a Grammont, native to them, is met by a procession of townsmen with the cradle of Henri IV, the palladium of their town, is conjured as he venerates this old tortoise shell, in which the great Henri was rocked, not to trample on Bayarnese liberty, is informed withal that his majesty's cannon are all safe, in the keeping of his majesty's faithful burghers of Pau, and do now lie pointed on the walls there, ready for action. At this rate, your grand voyages are like to have a stormy infancy. As for the plenary court, it has literally expired in the birth. The very courtiers looked shy at it. Old Marshal Broye declined the honor of sitting therein. Assaulted by a universal storm of mingled ridicule and execration, this poor plenary court met once, and never any second time. Distracted country, contention hisses up with forked hydrotongues, wheresoever poor Lomeny sets his foot. Let a commandant, a commissioner of the king, says Weber, enter one of these parliaments to have an edict registered, the whole tribunal will disappear, and leave the commandant alone with the clerk and first president, the edict registered and the commandant gone, the whole tribunal hastens back to declare such registration null, the highways are covered with grand deputations of parliaments, proceeding to Versailles, to have their registers expunged by the king's hand, or returning home, to cover a new page with a new resolution still more audacious. Such is the France of this year, 1788, not now a golden or paper age of hope, with its horse racings, balloon flyings, and finer sensibilities of the heart. Ah, gone is that, its golden effulgence paled, be darkened in this singular manner, brewing towards preternatural weather. For, as in that wreck-storm of Paul et Virginie and Saint-Pierre, one huge motionless cloud, say of sorrow and indignation, girdles our whole horizon, streams up, hairy, copper-edged, over a sky of the color of lead, motionless itself, but small clouds, as exiled parliaments and such like, parting from it, fly over the zenith, with the velocity of birds, till at last, with one loud howl, the whole four winds be dashed together, and all the world exclaim, There is the tornado, tout le monde s'écrie, voilà l'ouragan. For the rest, in such circumstances, the successive loan very naturally remains unfilled, Neither indeed can that impost of the second twentieth, at least not on strict valuation, be levied to good purpose. Lenders, says Weber, in his hysterical vehement manner, are afraid of ruin, tax-gatherers of hanging. The very clergy turn away their face. Convoked in extraordinary assembly, they afford no gratuitous gift, if it be not that of advice. Here too, instead of cash, is clamor for states-general. O oh, Lomini Brienne, with thy poor flimsy mind all bewildered, and now three actual cauteries on thy worn-out body, who art like to die of inflammation, provocation, milk diet, d'autre vive, and maladie, best untranslated, and presidest over a France with innumerable actual cauteries, which also is dying of inflammation in the rest. Was it wise to quit the bosque verdures of Brienne, and thy new Ashlar chateau there, and what it held, for this? Soft were those shades and lawns, sweet the hymns of poetasters, the blandishments of high-rouged graces, and always this and the other philosophe Marelet, nothing deeming himself or thee a questionable sham priest, could be so happy in making happy, and also, hadst thou known it, in the military school hard by there sat, studying mathematics, a dusky-complexioned, taciturn boy, under the name of Napoleon Bonaparte, with fifty years of effort, and one final dead-lift struggle, thou hast made an exchange, thou hast got thy robe of office, as Hercules had his Nessus shirt, on the 13th of July of this 1788, there fell, on the very edge of harvest, the most frightful hailstorm, scattering into wild waste the fruits of the year, which had otherwise suffered grievously by drought, 
For sixty leagues round Paris especially, the ruin was almost total. To so many other evils, then, there is to be added that of dearth, perhaps of famine. Some days before this hailstorm, on the 5th of July, and still more decisively some days after it, on the 8th of August, Lomini announces that the States General are actually to meet in the following month of May, till after which period this of the plenary court and the rest shall remain postponed. Further, as in Lomini there is no plan of forming or holding these most desirable States General, thinkers are invited to furnish him with one, through the medium of discussion by the public press. What could a poor minister do? There are still ten months of respite reserved. A sinking pilot will fling out all things, his very biscuit bags, lead, log, compass and quadrant, before flinging out himself. It is on this principle of sinking, and the incipient delirium of despair, that we explain likewise the almost miraculous invitation to thinkers, invitation to chaos to be so kind as build, out of its tumultuous driftwood, an arc of escape for him. In these cases not invitation but command has usually proved serviceable. The queen stood that evening, pensive, in a window, with her face turned towards the garden. The chef de Goblet had followed her with an obsequious cup of coffee, and then retired till it were sipped. Her majesty beckoned Dame Campon to approach. Grand Dieu, murmured she with the cup in her hand, what a piece of news will be made public today. The king grants states general. Then raising her eyes to heaven, if Campon were not mistaken, she added, tis a first beat of the drum, a ill omen for France. This noblesse will ruin us. During all that hatching of the plenary court, while Lamagnon looked so mysterious, Bazonval had kept asking him one question, whether they had cash, to which, as Lamagnon always answered on the faith of Lomini, that the cash was safe, judicious Bazonval rejoined that then all was safe. Nevertheless, the melancholy fact is that the royal coffers are almost getting literally void of coin. Indeed, apart from all other things, this invitation to thinkers and the great change now at hand are enough to arrest the circulation of capital, and forward only that of pamphlets. A few thousand gold louis are now all of money or money's worth that remains in the king's treasury. With another movement as of desperation, Lomeny invites Necker to come and be controller of finances. Necker has other work in view than controlling finances for Lomeny. With a dry refusal, he stands taciturn, awaiting his time. What shall a desperate prime minister do? He has grasped at the strongbox of the king's theatre. Some lottery had been set on foot for those sufferers by the hailstorm. In his extreme necessity, Lomeny lays hands even on this. To make provision for the passing day, on any terms, will soon be impossible. On the 16th of August, poor Weber heard, at Paris and Versailles, hawkers, with a hoarse stifled tone of voice, drawling and snuffling, through the streets, an edict concerning payments, such was the soft title Riverol had contrived for it. All payments at the royal treasury shall be made henceforth, three-fifths in cash, and the remaining two-fifths in paper bearing interest. Poor Weber almost swooned at the sound of these cracked voices, with their bodeful raven note, and will never forget the effect it had on him. But the effect on Paris, on the world generally, from the dens of stock brokerage, from the heights of political economy, of necrism and philosophism, from all articulate and inarticulate throats, rise hootings and howlings, such as ear had not yet heard. Sedition itself may be imminent. Monsignor d'Artois, moved by Duchesse Polignac, feels called to wait upon Her Majesty, and explain frankly what crisis matters stand in. The Queen wept. Brienne himself wept, for it is now visible and palpable that he must go. Remains only that the court, to whom his manners and garrulities were always agreeable, shall make his fall soft. The grasping old man has already got his archbishopship of Toulouse exchanged for the richer one of Sens and now, in this hour of pity, he shall have the coadjutorship for his nephew, hardly yet of due age, a dameship of the palace for his niece, a regiment for her husband, for himself a red cardinal's hat, a coupe de bois, cutting from the royal forests, and on the whole from five to six hundred thousand livres of revenue. Finally, his brother, the Comte de Brienne, shall still continue war minister. Buckled round with such bolsters and huge feather beds of promotion, let him now fall as soft as he can. And so Lomini departs, rich if court titles and money bonds can enrich him, but if these cannot, perhaps the poorest of all extant men. Hissed at by the people of Versailles, he drives forth to Jardy, to Brienne, for recovery of health, then to Nice, to Italy, but shall return, shall glide to and fro, tremulous, faint twinkling, fallen on awful times, till the guillotine snuff out his weak existence? Alas worse, for it is blown out, or choked out, foully, pitiably, on the way to the guillotine 
in his palace of Sons, rude Jacobin bailiffs made him drink with them from his own wine cellars, feast with them from his own larder, and on the morrow morning the miserable old man lies dead. This is the end of Prime Minister, Cardinal Archbishop, Lomini de Brienne. Flimsier mortal was seldom fated to do as weighty a mischief, to have a life as despicable envied, an exit as frightful, fired as the phrase is, with ambition, blown like a kindled rag, the sport of winds, not this way, not that way, but of all ways, straight towards such a powder mine, which he kindled. Let us pity the hapless Lomini, and forgive him, and as soon as possible forget him. End of section 20《ヴォルムワン》この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」というのは、この「ヴォルムワン」During these extraordinary operations of payment two fifths in paper and change of prime minister, had been out on a tour through his district of command, and indeed for the last months peacefully drinking the waters of Contrexeville. Returning now in the end of August towards Moulins, and knowing nothing, he arrives one evening at Langres, finds the whole town in a state of uproar, grande rumeur, doubtless some sedition, a thing too common in these days. He alights, nevertheless, inquires of a man tolerably dressed what the matter is. How, answers the man, you have not heard the news? The Archbishop is thrown out, and Monsieur Necker is recalled, and all is going to go well. Such rumour and vociferous acclaim has risen round Monsieur Necker, even from that day when he issued from the Queen's apartments a nominated minister. It was on the twenty fourth of August. The galleries of the chateau, the courts, the streets of Versailles, in a few hours the capital, and as the news flew, all France resounded with the cry of Vive le roi, vive Monsieur Necker. In Paris, indeed, it unfortunately got the length of turbulence. Petards, rockets go off in the Place Dauphine, more than enough. A wicker figure, mannequin d'osier, in archbishop's stole, made emblematically three-fifths of it satin, two-fifths of it paper, is promenaded, not in silence, to the popular judgment bar, is doomed, shriven by a mock abbé de Vermond, then solemnly consumed by fire at the foot of Henri's statue on the Pont Neuf, with such petarding and huzzaing that Chevalier du Bois and his city watch see good finally to make a charge, more or less ineffectual, and there wanted not burning of sentry-boxes, forcing of guard-houses, and also dead bodies thrown into the Seine overnight, to avoid new effervescence. Parlement, therefore, shall return from exile. Plenary court, payment two-fifths in paper, have vanished, gone off in smoke at the foot of Henri's statue. States-general, with a political millennium, are now certain, nay, it shall be announced in our fond haste, for January next, and all, as the long man said, is going to go. To the prophetic glance of Bessonval, one other thing is too apparent, that friend Lamoignon cannot keep his keepership. Neither he nor war minister Comte de Brienne. Already old Foulon, with an eye to be war minister himself, is making underground movements. This is that same Foulon, named Am Damne du Parlement, a man grown grey in treachery, in griping, projecting, intriguing, and iniquity, who once, when it was objected to some finance scheme of his, what will the people do? Made answer in the fire of discussion, the people may eat grass. Hasty words which fly abroad irrevocable, and will send back tidings. Foulon, to the relief of the world, fails on this occasion, and will always fail. Nevertheless, it steads not Monsieur de Lamoignon. It steads not the doomed man that he have interviews with the king, and be seen to return radieux, emitting rays. Lamoignon is the hated of Parlement. Comte de Brienne is brother to the Cardinal Archbishop. 
the twenty fourth of august has been and the fourteenth of september is not yet when they too as their great principal had done descend made to fall soft like him and now as if the last burden had been rolled from its heart and assurance were at length perfect paris bursts forth anew into extreme jubilee the basoche rejoices aloud that the foe of parlement is fallen nobility gentry commonalty have rejoiced and rejoice nay now with new emphasis rascality itself starting suddenly from its dim depths will arise and do it for down even thither the new political evangel in some rude version or other has penetrated it is monday the fourteenth of september seventeen eighty eight rascality assembles anew in great force in the place dauphine lets off petards fires blunderbusses to an incredible extent without interval for eighteen hours there is again a wicker figure mannequin of osier the centre of endless howlings also neckel's portrait snatched or purchased from some print shop is borne processionally aloft on a perch with hussars an example to be remembered but chiefly on the pont neuf where the great henri in bronze rides sublime there do the crowds gather all passengers must stop till they have bowed to the people's king and said audibly vive henri iv au diable la moignon no carriage but must stop not even that of his highness d'orleans your coach doors are opened monsieur will please to put forth his head and bow or even if refractory to alight altogether and kneel from madame a wave of her plumes a smile of her fair face there where she sits shall suffice and surely a coin or two to buy fusée were not unreasonable from the upper classes friends of liberty in this manner it proceeds for days in such rude horseplay not without kicks the city watch can do nothing hardly save its own skin for the last twelve months, as we have sometimes seen, it has been a kind of pastime to hunt the watch. Bessonval, indeed, is at hand, with soldiers, but they have orders to avoid firing, and are not prompt to stir. On Monday morning the explosion of petards began, and now it is near midnight of Wednesday, and the wicker mannequin is to be buried, apparently in the antique fashion. Long rows of torches following it move towards the Hôtel La Moignon, but a servant of mine's, Bessonval's, has run to give warning, and there are soldiers come. Gloomy La Moignon is not to die by conflagration, or this night, not yet for a year, and then by gunshot. Suicidal or accidental is unknown. Foiled rascality burns its mannequin of osier under his windows, tears up the sentry box, and rolls off to try Brienne, to try Dubois, captain of the watch. Now, however, all is bestirring itself. Gardes Francaises, Invalides, Horse Patrol. The torch procession is met with sharp shot, with the thrusting of bayonets, the slashing of sabres. Even Dubois makes a charge with that cavalry of his, and the cruelest charge of all there are a great many killed and wounded not without clangour complaint subsequent criminal trials and official persons dying of heartbreak so however with steel besom rascality is brushed back into its dim depths and the streets are swept clear not for a century and a half had rascality ventured to step forth in this fashion not for so long showed its huge rude lineaments in the light of day a wonder and a new thing, as yet gambling merely, in awkward brobdingnag sport, not without quaintness, hardly in anger, yet in its huge half-vacant laugh lurks a shade of grimness, which could unfold itself. However, the thinkers invited by Lomini are now far on with their pamphlets. States-general on one plan or another will infallibly meet, if not in January, as was once hoped, yet at latest in May. Old Duc de Richelieu, moribund in these autumn days, opens his eyes once more, murmuring, What would Louis XIV, whom he remembers, have said? Then closes them again, forever, before the evil time.
End of section 21「Section 22 of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 4, Chapter 1. States General. The Notables again. The universal prayer, therefore, is to be fulfilled. Always in days of national perplexity, when wrong abounded and help was not. This remedy of states general was called for by a malzerbe, nay, by a fenelon. Even parliaments calling for it were escorted with blessings. And now, behold, it is vouchsafed us. States general shall verily be. To say, let states general be, was easy. To say in what manner they shall be, is not so easy. Since the year of 1614, there have no states general met in France. All trace of them has vanished from the living habits of men. Their structure, powers, methods of procedure, which were never in any measure fixed, have now become wholly a vague possibility. Clay which the potter may shape, this way or that, say, rather, the twenty-five millions of potters, for so many have now, more or less, a vote in it. How to shape the states general? There is a problem. Each body corporate, each privileged, each organized class has secret hopes of its own in that matter, and also secret misgivings of its own. For, behold, this monstrous twenty million class hitherto the dumb sheep which these others had to agree about the manner of shearing, is now also arising with hopes. It has ceased, or is ceasing to be dumb. It speaks through pamphlets, or at least brays and growls behind them, in unison, increasing wonderfully their volume of sound. As for the Parliament of Paris, it has at once declared for the old form of 1614, which form had this advantage, that the tiers etat, third estate or commons, figured there as a show mainly, whereby the noblesse and clergy had but to avoid quarrel between themselves, and decide unobstructed what they thought best. Such was the clearly declared opinion of the Paris Parliament. But, being met by a storm of mere hooting and howling from all men, such opinion was blown straight away to the winds, and the popularity of the Parliament along with it, never to return. The Parliament's part, we said above, was as good as played, concerning which, however, there is this further to be noted, the proximity of dates. It was on the 22nd of September that the Parliament returned from vacation, or exile in its estates, to be reinstalled amid boundless jubilee from all Paris. Precisely next day it was that the same Parliament came to its clearly declared opinion, and then on the morrow after that you behold it covered with outrages, its outer court, one vast sibilation, and the glory departed from it forevermore. A popularity of twenty-four hours was, in those times, no uncommon allowance. On the other hand, how superfluous was that invitation of Lomenese, the invitation to thinkers, thinkers and unthinkers, by the million, are spontaneously at their post, doing what is in them. Clubs labor, Société Publicole, Breton Club, Enraged Club, Club des Enrages, likewise dinner parties in the Palais Royal. Your Mirabeaus, Talleyrands, dining there, in company with Chamfort, Morellet, with Duponts and hot parliamentiers, not without object for a certain Necurian lions provider, whom one could name, assembles them there, or even their own private determination to have dinner does it. And then, as to pamphlets, in figurative language, it is a sheer snowing of pamphlets, like to snow up the government thoroughfares. Now is the time for friends of freedom, sane and even insane. Count, or self-styled Count, d'Entrigue, the young Languedocian gentleman, with perhaps Chamfort the cynic to help him, rises into furor almost pithic, highest where many are high, foolish young Languedocian gentleman, who himself so soon, emigrating among the foremost, must fly indignant over the marches, with the contrat social in his pocket, towards outer darkness, thankless intriguings, ignis fatuous hoverings, and death by the stiletto. Abbe C.A.S. has left Chartres Cathedral, and canonry and bookshelves there, has let his tonsure grow, and come to Paris with a secular head, of the most irrefragable sort, to ask three questions and answer them. What is the third estate? All. What has it hitherto been in our form of government? Nothing. What does it want? To become something. Dorian, for be sure he on his way to chaos, is in the thick of this, promulgates his deliberations, Deliberation à prendre pour les assemblées des béages, fathered by him, written by Laclos of the Liaison d'Angereuse, the result of which comes out simply, the third estate is the nation. 
On the other hand, Monsignor d'Artois, with other princes of the blood, publishes in solemn memorial to the king that if such things be listened to, privilege, nobility, monarchy, church, state, and strongbox are in danger. In danger, truly. And yet, if you do not listen, are they out of danger? It is the voice of all friends, this sound that rises, immeasurable manifold, as the sound of outbreaking waters. Wise were he who knew what to do in it, if not to fly to the mountains, and hide himself? How an ideal, all-seeing Versailles government, sitting there on such principles, in such an environment, would have determined to demean itself at this new juncture, may even yet be a question. Such a government would have felt too well that its long task was now drawing to a close, that, under the guise of these states-general, at length inevitable, a new omnipotent unknown of democracy was coming into being, in presence of which no Versailles government either could or should, except in a provisory character, continue extant, to enact which provisory character, so unspeakably important, might its whole faculties but have sufficed, and so a peaceable, gradual, well-conducted abdication and domine dimitas have been the issue. This for our ideal, all-seeing Versailles government, but for the actual, irrational Versailles government? Alas, that is a government existing there only for its own behoof, without right except possession, and now also without might. It foresees nothing, sees nothing, has not so much as a purpose, but has only purposes, and the instinct whereby all that exists will struggle to keep existing. Wholly a vortex, in which vain counsels, hallucinations, falsehoods, intrigues, and imbecilities whirl, like withered rubbish in the meeting of winds. The Oil de Boeuf has its irrational hopes, if also its fears, since hitherto all states-general have done as good as nothing. Why should these do more? The commons, indeed, look dangerous, but on the whole is not revolt, unknown now for five generations, an impossibility? The three estates can, by management, be set against each other. The third will, as heretofore, join with the king, will, out of mere spite and self-interest, be eager to tax and vex the other two. The other two are thus delivered bound into our hands, that we may fleece them likewise. Whereupon, money being got, and the three estates all in quarrel, dismiss them, and let the future go as it can. As good Archbishop Lomini was wont to say, there are so many accidents, and it needs but one to save us. How many to destroy us? Poor Necker, in the midst of such an anarchy, does what is possible for him. He looks into it with obstinately hopeful face, lauds the known rectitude of the kingly mind, listens indulgent-like to the unknown perverseness of the queenly and courtly, emits if any proclamation or regulation, one favoring the tiers etat, but settling nothing, hovering afar off rather, and advising all things to settle themselves. The grand questions, for the present, have got reduced to two. The double representation, and the vote by head. Shall the commons have a double representation? That is to say, have as many members as the noblesse and clergy united? Shall the states-general, when once assembled, vote and deliberate in one body, or in three separate bodies? Vote by head, or vote by class? Ordre, as they call it? These are the moot points now filling all France with jargon, logic, and eleutheromania, to terminate which, Necker bethinks him, might not a second convocation of the notables be fittest? Such second convocation is resolved on. On the 6th of November of this year, 1788, these notables accordingly have reassembled. After an interval of some eighteen months, they are Calon's old notables, the same hundred and forty-four, to show one's impartiality, likewise to save time. They sit there once again, in their seven bureaus, in the hard winter weather. It is the hardest winter seen since 1709, thermometer below zero of Fahrenheit, Seine River frozen over, cold, scarcity, and eleutheromaniac clamor. A changed world since these notables were organed out, in May gone a year. They shall see now whether, under their seven princes of the blood, in their seven bureaus, they can settle the moot points. To the surprise of patriotism, these notables, once so patriotic, seem to incline the wrong way, towards the anti-patriotic side. They stagger at the double representation, at the vote by head. There is not affirmative decision, there is mere debating, and that not with the best aspects. For indeed, were not these notables themselves mostly of the privileged classes? They clamored once, now they have their misgivings, make their dolorous representations. Let them vanish, ineffectual, and return no more. They vanish after a month's session, on this 12th of December, year 1788, the last terrestrial notables, not to reappear any other time, in the history of the world. And so the clamor still continuing, and the pamphlets, and nothing but patriotic addresses, louder and louder, pouting in on us from all corners of France, Necker himself some fortnight after, 
before the year is yet done, has to present his report. Rapport fait au roi dans son conseil, le 27 décembre 1788, recommending at his own risk that same double representation, nay almost enjoining it, so loud is the jargon and eleutheromania. What dubitating, what circumambulating, these whole six noisy months, for it began with Brienne in July, has not report followed report, and one proclamation flown in the teeth of the other? However, that first moot point, as we see, is now settled. As for the second, that of voting by head or by order, it unfortunately is still left hanging. It hangs there, we may say, between the privileged orders and the unprivileged, as a ready-made battle prize, and necessity of war, from the very first, which battle prize whosoever seizes it may thenceforth bear as battle flag, with the best omens. But so, at least, by royal edict of the 24th of January, Reglement du roi pour la convocation des états généraux à Versailles, reprinted, wrong dated, in Histoire parlementaire, I 262, does it finally, to impatient expectant France, become not only indubitable that national deputies are to meet, but possible, so far and hardly farther has the royal regulation gone, to begin electing them. End of section 22. The French Revolution, Volume 1, The Bastille, by Thomas Carlyle, Chapter 1.4.2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Thornton, Miranda, New Zealand. The Election. Up then, and be doing! The royal signal word flies through France as through vast forests the rushing of a mighty wind, at parish churches, town halls, and every house of convocation, by bailliages, by essential seas, in whatsoever form men convene, there, with confusion enough, are primary assemblies forming. To elect your electors, such is the form prescribed, then to draw up your writ of plaints and grievances, cahier de plaint et d'oléance, of which latter there is no lack. With such virtue works this royal January edict, as it rolls rapidly, in its leathern mails, along these frost-bound highways towards all the four winds, like some fiat or magic spell-word, which such things do resemble. For always, as it sounds out at the market cross, accompanied with trumpet-blast, presided by bailey, seneschal, or other minor functionary, with beef-eaters, or, in country churches, is droned forth after sermon, O prone de mes parosal, and is registered, posted, and let fly all over the world. You behold how this multitudinous French people, so long simmering and buzzing in eager expectancy, begins heaping and shaping itself into organic groups. Which organic groups, again, hold smaller organic grouplets, the inarticulate buzzing becomes articulate speaking and acting, by primary assembly and then by secondary, by successive elections and infinite elaboration and scrutiny, according to prescribed process, shall the genuine plaints and grievances be at length got to paper, shall the fit national representative be at length lay hold of. How the whole people shakes itself as if it had one life, and, in thousand-voiced rumour, announces that it is awake, suddenly out of long death sleep, and will thenceforth sleep no more. The long-looked-for has come at last, wondrous news of victory, deliverance, and franchisement, sounds magical through every heart. To the proud strong man it has come, whose strong hands shall no more be jived, to whom boundless, unconquered continents lie disclosed. The weary day-drudge has heard of it, the beggar with his crust moistened in tears. What? To us also has hope reached, down even to us? Hunger and hardship are not to be eternal? The bread we extorted from the rugged glebe, and, with the toil of our sinews, reaped and ground, and kneaded into loaves, was not wholly for another then, but we also shall eat of it, and be filled. Glorious news, answer the prudent elders, but all too unlikely. 
Thus, at any rate, may the lower people, who pay no money taxes and have no right to vote, assiduously crowd round those that do. The most halls of assembly, within doors and without, seem animated enough. Paris, alone of towns, is to have representatives, the number of them twenty. Paris is divided into sixty districts, each of which, assembled in some church or the like, is choosing two electors. Official deputations pass from district to district, for all is inexperience as yet, and there is endless consulting. The streets swarm strangely with busy crowds, pacific yet restless and loquacious. At intervals is seen the gleam of military muskets, especially about the palais, where Parlement, once more on duty, sits querulous, almost tremulous. Busy is the French world. In those great days, what poorest speculative craftsman but will leave his workshop, if not to vote, yet to assist in voting? On all highways is a rustling and bustling. Over the wide surface of France, ever and anon, through the spring months, as the sower casts his corn abroad upon the furrows, sounds of congregating and dispersing, of crowds in deliberation, acclamation, voting by ballot and by voice, rise discrepant towards the ear of heaven, to which political phenomenon add this economical one, that trade is stagnant, and also bread getting dear for before the rigorous winter there was, as we said, a rigorous summer with drought, and on the 13th of July with destructive hail. What a fearful day! All cried when that tempest fell. Alas, the next anniversary of it will be worse. Under such aspects is France electing national representatives. The incidents and specialities of these elections belong not to universal but to local or parish history, for which reason let not the new troubles of Grenoble or Bressancon, the blood shed on the streets of Rouen, and consequent march thither of the Breton young men, with manifesto by their mothers, sisters, and sweethearts, nor such like, detain us here. It is the same sad history everywhere, with superficial variations. A reinstated Parlement, as at Bressancon, which stands astonished at this behemoth of states-general, it is itself evoked starts forward with more or less audacity to fix a thorn in its nose, and, alas, is instantaneously struck down, and hurled quite out, for the new popular force can use not only arguments but brickbats, or else, and perhaps combined with this, it is an order of noblesse, as in Brittany, which will beforehand tie up the third estate, that it harm not the old privileges, in which act of tying them up, never so skilfully set about, there is likewise no possibility of prospering, but the behemoth, Briarius, snaps your cords like green rushes. Tie up? Alas, monsieur! And then, as for your chivalry, rapiers, valour, and wager of battle, think one moment, how can that answer? The plebeian heart, too, has read life in it, which changes not to paleness at a glance even of you, and the six hundred Breton gentlemen assembled in arms, seventy-two hours, in the Cordelier's cloister at Rouen have to come out again, wiser than they entered. For the Nantes youth, the Angers youth, all Brittany was astir, mothers, sisters, and sweethearts, shrieking after them, March! The Breton noblesse must even let the mad world have its way. Deux amis de liberté, 1, 105-128. to 128. In other provinces the noblesse, with equal good will, finds it better stick to the protests, to well-redacted carrière of grievances, and satirical writings and speeches, such as partially their course in Provence, whither indeed Gabriel Honore Riquetti, Comte de Mirabeau, has rushed down from Paris to speak a word in season. In Provence the privilege, backed by their A. Parmont, discover that such novelties, enjoined though they may be by royal edict, tend to national detriment, and what is still more indisputable, to impair the dignity of the noblesse. Whereupon Mirabeau, protesting aloud, this same noblesse, amid huge tumult within doors and without, flatly determines to expel him from their assembly. No other method, not even that of successive duels, would answer with him, the obstreperous, fierce, glaring man. Expelled he accordingly is. In all countries, in all times, exclaims he, departing, the aristocrats have implacably pursued every friend of the people, and with tenfold implacability, 
if such a one were himself born of the aristocracy. It was thus that the last of the Gracchi perished, by the hands of the patricians, that he, being struck with mortal stab, flung dusk towards heaven, and called on the avenging deities, and from this dust there was born Marius, Marius not so illustrious for exterminating the Cimbri, as for overturning in Rome the tyranny of the nobles, casting up which new curious handful of dust through the printing-press, to breed what it can and may. Mirabeau stalks forth into the third estate. That he now, to ingratiate himself with this third estate, opened a cloth-shop in Marseilles, and for moments became a furnishing tailor, or even the fable that he did so, is to us always among the pleasant memorabilities of this era. Stranger, Clothier never wielded the L-wand, and rent webs for men, or fractional parts of men. The fee adoptif is indignant at such disparaging fable, which nevertheless was widely believed in those days. Marat, ami du peuple, nous papa, in histoire parlementaire, two, one hundred and three, etc. But indeed, if Achilles, in the heroic ages, killed mutton, why should not Mirabeau, in the unheroic ones, measure broadcloth? More authentic are his triumph progresses through that disturbed district, with mob jubilee, flaming torches, windows hired for two louis, and voluntary guard of a hundred men. He is deputy-elect, both of I and of Marseilles, and will prefer I. He has opened his far-sounding voice, the depths of his far-sounding soul. He can quell, such virtue is in a spoken word, the pride tumults of the rich, the hunger tumults of the poor, and wild multitudes move under him, as under the moon do billows of the sea. He has become a world compeller and ruler over men. One other incident and speciality we note, with how different an interest. It is the Parlement of Paris, which starts forward like the others, only with less audacity, seeing better how it lay, to nose-ring that behemoth of a states-general. Worthy Dr. Guillotine, respectable practitioner in Paris, has drawn up his little plan of a cahier of doléances, as he had not, having the wish and gift, the clearest liberty to do, he is getting the people to sign it, whereupon the surly Parlement summons him to give an account of himself. He goes, but with all Paris at his heels, which floods the outer courts, and copiously signs the cahier, even there, while the doctor is giving account of himself within. The Parlement cannot too soon demiss Guillotin, with compliments, to be borne home high on a shoulder. This respectable Guillotin we hope to behold once more, and perhaps only once, Parlement not even once, but let it be engulfed unseen by us. Meanwhile such things, cheering as they are, tend little to cheer the national creditor, or indeed the creditor of any kind. In the midst of universal portentous doubt, what certainty can seem so certain as money in the purse, and the wisdom of keeping it there? Trading speculation, commerce of all kinds, has as far as possible come to a dead pause, a hand of the industrious lies idle in his bosom. Frightfully enough, when now the rigour of seasons has also done its part, and to scarcity of work is added scarcity of food. In the opening spring there come rumours of forestalment, there come king's edicts, petitions of bakers against millers, and at length, in the months of April, troops of ragged lackals, and fierce cries of starvation. These are the thrice-famed brigands, an actual existing, quantity, persons, who long reflected and reverberated through so many millions of heads, as in concave multiplying mirrors, become a whole brigand world, and, like a kind of supernatural machinery, wondrously move the epos of the revolution. The brigands are here, the brigands are there, the brigands are coming. Not otherwise sounded the clang of Phoebus Apollo's silver bow, scattering pestilence and pale terror, for this clang too was of the imagination, preternatural, and it too walked in formless immeasurability, having made itself like to the night, Greek. But remark at least, for the first time, the singular empire of suspicion, in those lands, in those days, if poor famishing men shall prior to death gather in groups and crowds, as the poor field fares and plovers do in bitter weather, were it but that they may chirp mournfully together, and misery look in the eyes of misery, if famishing men, what famishing fieldfares cannot do, should discover, once congregated, 
that they need not die while food is in the land, since they are many, and with empty wallets have right hands. In all this, what need were there of preternatural machinery? To most people none, but not to French people in a time of revolution. These brigands, as Turgos also were fourteen years ago, have all been set on, enlisted though without tuck of drum, by aristocrats, by democrats, by d'Orléans, d'Artois, and enemies of the public wheel. Nay, historians, to this day will prove it by one argument. These brigands, pretending to have no victual, nevertheless contrive to drink, nay, have been seen drunk, an unexampled fact. But on the whole, may we not predict that a people with such a width of credulity and of incredulity, the proper union of which makes suspicion, and indeed unreason generally, will see shapes enough of immortals fighting in its battle ranks, and never want for epical machinery. Be this as it may, the brigands have clearly got to Paris, in considerable multitudes, with sallow faces, lank hair, the true enthusiast complexion, with sooty rags, and also with large clubs, which they smite angrily against the pavement. These mingle in the election tumult, would fain sign Guillotin's cahier, or any cahier or petition whatsoever, could they but write. Their enthusiast complexion, the smiting of their sticks, bodes little good to any one, least of all to rich master manufacturers of the suburb Saint Antoine, with whose workmen they consort. End of chapter 1.4.2 The Election Section 24 of The French Revolution, Volume 1, by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Wayman. The French Revolution, by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 4, Chapter 3 grown electric but now also national deputies from all ends of france are in paris with their commissions what they call pouvoirs or powers in their pockets inquiring consulting looking out for lodgings at versailles the states-general shall open there if not on the first then surely on the fourth of may in grand procession and gala the salle des menus is all new carpentered bedizened for them their very costume has been fixed a grand controversy which there was as to slouch hats or slouched hats for the commons deputies has got as good as adjusted ever new strangers arrive loungers miscellaneous persons officers on furlough as the worthy captain dom martin whom we hope to be acquainted with these also from all regions have repaired hither to see what is toward our paris committees of the sixty districts are busier than ever it is now too clear the paris elections will be late on monday the twenty seventh of april astronomer bailly notices that the sieur reveillon is not at his post the sieur reveillon extensive paper manufacturer of the rue saint antoine he commonly so punctual is absent from the electoral committee and even will never reappear there in those immense magazines of velvet paper has aught befallen alas yes alas it is no montgolfier rising there to-day but drudgery rascality and the suburb that is rising was the sieur reveillon himself once a journeyman heard to say that a journeyman might live handsomely on fifteen sous a day some sevenpence halfpenny tis a slender sum or was he only thought and believed to be heard saying it by this long chafing and friction it would appear the national temper has got electric down in those dark dens in those dark heads and hungry hearts who knows in what strange figure the new political evangel may have shaped itself what miraculous 
communion of drudges may be getting formed. Enough. Grim individuals, soon waxing to grim multitudes, and other multitudes crowding to see, beset that paper warehouse, demonstrate in loud ungrammatical language, addressed to the passions too, the insufficiency of sevenpence halfpenny a day. The city watch cannot dissipate them, broils arise and bellowings, Réveillon at his wit's end entreats the populace, entreats the authorities, Bézenval, now in active command, commandant of Paris, does, towards evening, to Réveillon's earnest prayer, send some thirty guards Francaises. These clear the street, happily without firing, and take post there for the night, in hope that it may be all over. Not so. On the morrow it is far worse. Saint Antoine has arisen anew, grimmer than ever reinforced by the unknown tatterdemalion figures with their enthusiast complexion and large sticks the city through all streets is floating thitherward to see two cartloads of paving stones that happened to pass that way have been seized as a visible godsend another detachment of garde francaise must be sent bazenval and the colonel taking earnest counsel then still another they hardly, with bayonets and menace of bullets, penetrate to the spot. What a sight! A street choked up with lumber, tumult, and the endless press of men. A paper warehouse eviscerated by axe and fire, mad din of revolt, musket volleys responded to by yells, by miscellaneous missiles, by tiles raining from roof and window, tiles execrations and slain men the guard francaise like it not but have to persevere all day it continues slackening and rallying the sun is sinking and saint antoine has not yielded the city flies hither and thither alas the sound of that musket volleying booms into the far dining rooms of the chaussee d'antin alters the tone of the dinner gossip there Captain Dammartin leaves his wine, goes out with a friend or two to see the fighting. Unwashed men growl on him with murmurs of A bas les aristocrates, down with the aristocrats, and insult the cross of Saint Louis. They elbow him and hustle him, but do not pick his pocket, as indeed at Reveillon's too there was not the slightest stealing at fall of night as the thing will not end bezenval takes his resolution orders out the guard suisse with two pieces of artillery the swiss guards shall proceed thither summon that rabble to depart in the king's name if disobeyed they shall load their artillery with grape-shot visibly to the general eye shall again summon if again disobeyed fire and keep firing till the last man be in this manner blasted off and the street clear with which spirited resolution as might have been hoped the business is got ended at sight of the lit matches of the foreign red-coated switzers saint antoine dissipates hastily in the shades of dusk there is an encumbered street there are from four to five hundred dead men unfortunate reveillon has found shelter in the bastille does therefrom safe behind stone bulwarks issue plaint protestation explanation for the next month bold bezenval has thanks from all the respectable parisian classes but finds no special notice taken of him at versailles a thing the man of true worth is used to but how it originated this fierce electric sputter and explosion from d'orleans cries the court party he with his gold enlisted these brigands surely in some surprising manner without sound of drum he raked them in hither from all corners to ferment and take fire evil is his good from the court cries enlightened patriotism it is the cursed gold and wiles of aristocrats that enlisted them set them upon ruining an innocent sieur reveillon to frighten the faint and disgust men with the career of freedom 
Besenval, with reluctance, concludes that it came from the English, our natural enemies. Or, alas, might not one rather attribute it to Diana in the shape of hunger? To some twin Dioscuri, oppression and revenge, so often seen in the battles of men? Poor lack alls, all betoiled, besoiled, encrusted into dim defacement, into whom nevertheless the breath of the Almighty has breathed a living soul? To them it is clear only that Eleutheromaniac philosophism has yet baked no bread, that patriotic committee men will level down to their own level and no lower. Brigands, or whatever they might be, it was bitter earnest with them. They bury their dead with the title of Défenseurs de la Patrie, Martyrs of the Good Cause. Or shall we say, Insurrection has now served its apprenticeship, and this was its proof-stroke and no inconclusive one. It next will be a master-stroke, announcing indisputable mastership to a whole astonished world. Let that rock-fortress, tyranny's stronghold, which they name Bastille, or building, as if there were no other building, look to its guns. But in such wise, with primary and secondary assemblies and cahiers of grievances, with motions, congregations of all kinds, with much thunder of froth eloquence, and at last with thunder of platoon musketry, does agitated France accomplish its elections. With confused winnowing and sifting in this rather tumultuous manner, it has now, all except some remnants of Paris, sifted out the true wheat grains of national deputies, twelve hundred and fourteen in number, and will forthwith open its States General. End of section twenty four. The French Revolution, Volume One, by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Thornton, Miranda, New Zealand. Chapter 1.44 The Procession, Part 1. On the first Saturday of May, it is gala at Versailles, and Monday, fourth of the month, is to be a still greater day. The deputies have mostly got thither and sought out lodgings and are now successively, in long well-ushered files, kissing the hand of Majesty in the chateau. Supreme Usher de Bray's does not give the highest satisfaction. We cannot but observe that in ushering noblesse or clergy into the anointed presence, he liberally opens both his folding doors, and, on the other hand, for members of the third estate, opens only one. However, there is room to enter. Majesty has smiles for all. The good Louis welcomes his honourable members with smiles of hope. He has prepared for them the Hall of Menus, the largest near him, and often surveyed the workmen as they went on. A spacious hall, with raised platform for throne, court, and blood royal, space for six hundred common deputies in front, for half as many clergy on this hand, and half as many noblesse on that. It has lofty galleries, wherefrom dames of honour, splendent in gaze, door, foreign diplomacies, and other gilt-edged, white-frilled individuals, to the number of two thousand, may sit and look on. Broad passages flow through it, and outside the inner wall, all round it. There are committee rooms, guard rooms, robing rooms, really a noble hall, where upholstery, aided by the subject fine arts, has done its best, and crimson-tasseled cloths, an emblematic fleur-de-lis, are not wanting. The hall is ready. The very costume, as we said, has been settled, and the commons are not to wear the hated slouch hat, chapeau clabeau, but one not quite so slouch, chapeau rabatu. As for their manner of working, when all dressed, for their voting by head or by order, and the rest, this, which it were perhaps still time to settle, and in a few hours will be no longer time, remains unsettled, hangs dubious in the breast of twelve hundred men. But now, finally, the sun, on Monday the 4th of May, has risen. 
unconcerned as if it were no special day. And yet, as his first rays could strike music from the Memnon statue on the Nile, what tones were these, so thrilling, tremulous of preparation and foreboding, which he awoke in every bosom at Versailles? Huge Paris, in all conceivable and inconceivable vehicles, is pouring itself forth. From each town and village come subsidiary rills. Versailles is a very sea of men. But above all, from the church of St. Louis to the church of Notre Dame, one vast suspended billow of life, with spray scattered even to the chimney pots. On chimney tops, too, as over the roofs, and up thitherwards on every lamp iron signpost, break ned coin of vantage, sits patriotic courage, and every window bursts with patriotic beauty. For the deputies are gathering at St. Louis Church to march in procession to Notre Dame and hear sermon. Yes, friends, you may sit and look, boldly or in thought. All France and all Europe may sit and look, for it is a day like few others. Oh, one might weep like Xerxes. So many serried rows sit perched there, like winged creatures alighted out of heaven. All these, and so many more that follow them, shall have wholly fled aloft again, vanishing into the blue deep and the memory of this day still be fresh. It is the baptism day of democracy. Sick time has given it birth, the numbered months being run. The extreme unction day of feudalism, a superannuated system of society, decrepit with toils, for has it not done much, produced you, and what ye have, and know? And with thefts and brawls, named glorious victories, with profligacies, sensualities, and on the whole with dotage and senility, is now to die, and so, with death throes and birth throes, a new one is to be born. What a work, O oh, earth and heavens, what a work! Battles and bloodshed, September massacres, bridges of Lodi, retreats of Moscow, Waterloo's, Peterloo's, ten-pound franchises, tar-barrels and guillotines, and from this present date one might prophesy some two centuries of it still to fight. Two centuries, hardly less, before democracy go through its due, most baleful, stages of quackocracy, and a pestilential world be burnt up, and have begun to grow green and young again. Rejoice nevertheless, ye versile multitudes, to you, from whom all this is hid, and glorious end of it is visible. This day sentence of death is pronounced on shams, judgment of resuscitation, were it but far off, is pronounced on realities. This day it is declared aloud, as with a doom trumpet, that a lie is unbelievable. Believe that, stand by that, if more there be not, and let what thing or thing soever will follow, follow it. Ye can no other, God be your help, so spake a greater than any of you, opening his chapter of world history. Behold, however, the doors of St. Louis Church flung wide, and the procession of processions advancing towards Notre Dame. Shouts rend the air, one shout at which Grecian birds might drop dead. It is indeed a stately solemn sight. The elected of France, and then the court of France, they are marshalled and marched there, all in prescribed place and costume. Our commons in plain black mantle and white cravat, Noblesse in gold work, bright dyed cloaks of velvet, resplendent, rustling with laces, waving with plumes. The clergy in rocher, alb, or other best pontificabilius. Lastly comes the king himself, and king's household, also in their brightest blaze of pomp, their brightest and final one. Some fourteen hundred men blown together from all winds on the deepest errand. Yes. In that silent marching mass there lies futurity enough. No symbolic ark, like the old Hebrews, do these men bear, yet with them too is a covenant. They too preside at a new era in the history of men. The whole future is there, and destiny dim brooding over it. In the hearts and unshaped thoughts of these men it lies illegible, inevitable. Singular to think. They have it in them, yet not they, not mortal, only the eye above can read it as it shall unfold itself in fire and thunder, of siege and field artillery, in the rustling of battle-banners, the tramp of hosts, and in the glow of burning cities, 
the shriek of strangled nations. Such things lie hidden, safe wrapped in this fourth day of May. Say rather, had lain in some other unknown day, of which this latter is the public fruit and outcome. As indeed what wonders lie in every day, had we the sight, as happily we have not, to decipher it. For it is not every meanest day the conflux of two eternities. Meanwhile, suppose we too, good reader, should, as now without miracle Muse Cleo enables us, take our station also on some coin of vantage, and glance momentarily over this procession, this lifelong sea, with far other eyes than the rest do, namely with prophetic. We can mount and stand there without fear of falling. As for the life sea, or onlooking unnumbered multitude, it is unfortunately all too dim. Yet, as we gaze fixedly, do not nameless figures, not a few, which shall not always be nameless, disclose themselves, visible or presumably there? Young Baroness de Stael, she evidently looks from a window, among older honourable women. Her father is minister, and one of the gala personages, to his own eyes the chief one. Young spiritual Amazon, thy rest is not there, nor thy loved father's, as Malebranche saw all things in God, so Monsieur Necker sees all things in Necker, a theorem that will not hold. But where is the brown-locked, light-behaved, fire-hearted Demoiselle Theron, brown eloquent beauty, who, with thy winged words and glances, shall thrill rough bosoms, whole steel battalions, and persuade an Austrian Kaiser, I can help lie provided for thee in due season and, alas, also straight waistcoat, a long lodging in the Salpetriere. Better hadst thou stayed in native Luxembourg, and been the mother of some man's brave children. But it was not thy task, it was not thy lot. Of the rougher sex, how, without tongue or hundred tongues of iron, enumerate the notabilities? Has not Marquis Valardi hastily quitted his Quaker broad brim, his Pythagorean Greek in Wapping, and the city of Glasgow? de Morand from his career de l'Europe, Lingray from his Annal, they looked eager through the London fog, and became ex-editors, that they might feed the guillotine and have their due. Does Louvet stand a tiptoe, and Brissot, Height de Warville, friend of the blacks, he with Marquis Concorsé and Clavier de Genevese, have created the Moniteur newspaper, or about creating it, Able editors must give an account of such a day. Or seest thou with any distinctness, low down probably, not in places of honour, a Stanislas Maillard riding tipstaff of the Châtelet, one of the shiftiest of men, a Captain Ulau of Geneva, Captain Ellie of the Queen's Regiment, both with an air of half pay, sure down with tile coloured whiskers, not yet with tile beard, an unjust dealer in mules? He shall be, in a few months, draw down the headsman, and have other work. Surely also, in some place not of honour, stands or sprawls up querulous, that he too, though short, may see, one squalidest, bleared mortal, redolent of suit and horse drugs, Jean-Paul Marat of Neustal. O oh, Marat, renovator of human science, lecturer on optics, O oh, thou remarkable horse-leech, once in Dartois' stables, as thy bleared soul looks forth, through thy bleared, dull, acrid, woe-stricken face, what sees it in all this? Any faintest light of hope, like day-spring after Nova Zembla night? Or is it but blue sulphur light, and spectres? Woe, suspicion, revenge without end? Of Draper Le Quanta, how he shut his cloth-shop hard by, and stepped forth, one hard needly speak, nor of Santerre, the sonorous brewer from the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, Two other figures, and only two, we signalised there, a huge brawny figure, through whose black brows and rude flattened face there looks a waste energy, as of Hercules, not yet furibund. He is an Assyrian, unprovided advocate. Danton by name, him Mark. Then that other, his slight-billed comrade and crafter brother, he with the long curling locks, with the face of the dingy blackguardism, wondrously irradiated with genius, as if a naphtha lamp burned within it. That figure is Camille Desmoulins, a fellow of infinite shrewdness, wit, nay humour, 
one of the sprightliest, clearest souls in all these millions. Thou, poor Camille, say of thee what they may. It were but falsehood to pretend one did not almost love thee, thou headlong, lightly sparkling man. But the brawny, not yet furibund figure, we say, is Jacques Danton, a name that shall be tolerably known in the Revolution. He is president of the electoral Cordelier district of Paris, or about to be it, and shall open his lungs of brass. We dwell no longer on the mixed shouting multitude, for now, behold, the Commons deputies are at hand. Which of these six hundred individuals in plain white cravat that have come up to regenerate France might one guess would become their king? For a king or leader they, as all bodies of men, must have. Be their work what it may, there is one man there who, by character, faculty, position, is fittest of all to do it. That man, as future not yet elected king, walks there among the rest. He with thick black locks will it be? With the hewer, as himself calls it, or black boar's head, fit to be shaken as a senatorial portent, through whose shaggy beetle brows and rough hewn, seamed carbuncled face, there look natural ugliness, small tox, incontinence, bankruptcy, and burning fire of genius, like comet fire, glaring, fuliginous, through murkiest confusions. It is Gabriel Honore Riquette de Mirabeau, the world compeller, man-ruling deputy of I. According to the Baroness de Stael, he steps proudly along, though looked at askance here, and shakes his black chevelure, or lion's mane, as if prophetic of great deeds. Yes, reader, that is the type Frenchman of this epoch, as Voltaire was at the last. He is French in his aspirations, acquisitions, in his virtues, in his vices, perhaps more French than any other man, and intrinsically such a mass of manhood too. Mark him well. The National Assembly were all different without that one. Nay, he might say with the old despot, the National Assembly, I am that. Of a southern climate, of wild southern blood, for the Riquettis or Arighettis had to fly from Florence and the Guelphs long centuries ago, and settled in Provence, where from generation to generation they have ever approved themselves a peculiar kindred, irascible, indomitable, sharp-cutting, true, like the steel they wore, of an intensity and activity that sometimes verged towards madness, yet did not reach it. One ancient Riquetti, in mad fulfilment of a mad vow, chains two mountains together, and the chain, with its iron star of five rays, is still to be seen. May not a modern Riquetti unchain so much and set it drifting, which also shall be seen? Destiny has worked for that swart burly-headed Mirabeau. Destiny has watched over him, prepared him from afar. Did not his grandfather, stout Colonel Dargeon, silver stock so they named him, shattered and slashed by seven and twenty wounds in one fell day, lie sunk together on the bridge at Cassano, while Prince Eugene's cavalry galloped and regalloped over him, only the flying sergeant had thrown a camp-kettle over that loved head, and Vendôme, dropping his spy-glass, moaned out, Mirabeau is dead, then! Nevertheless he was not dead. He awoke to breathe a miraculous surgery, for Gabriel was yet to be. With his silver stock he kept his scarred head erect, through long years, and wedded, and produced tough Marquis Victor, the friend of men, whereby at last, in the appointed year, 1749, this long-expected rough-hewn Gabriel Honore did likewise see the light, roughest lion's whelp ever littered on that rough breed. How the old lion! For our old Marquis, too, was lion-like, most unconquerable, kingly genial, most perverse, gazed wonderingly on his offspring, and determined to train him as no lion had yet been. It is in vain, O Marquis! This cub, though thou slay him and flay him, will not learn to draw in dog-cart of political economy, and be a friend of men. He will not be thou, must and will be himself, another than thou. Divorce lawsuits, whole families save one in prison, and threescore lettres de cachet for thy own sole use, do but astonish the world. Our luckless Gabriel, sinned against and sinning, has been in the Isle of Ray, and heard the Atlantic from his tower in the castle of Eve and heard the Mediterranean at Marseilles, 
he has been in the fortress of Jou, and forty-two months, with hardly clothing to his back, in the dungeon at Vincennes, all by lettre de cachet from his lion father. He has been in Pontalier jails, self-constituted prisoner, was noticed fording estuaries of the sea at low water in flight from the face of men. He has pleaded before I Parlement to get back his wife. The public gathering on roofs to see since they could not hear, the clatter teeth, snarl singular old Mirabeau, discerning in such admired forensic eloquence nothing but two clattering jawbones and a head vacant, sonorous, of the drum species. But as for Gabriel Honore, in these strange wayfarings, what has he not seen and tried, from drill sergeants to prime ministers, to foreign and domestic booksellers, all manner of men he has seen, all manner of men he has gained, for at bottom it is a social loving heart, that wild unconquerable one, more especially all manner of women, from the archer's daughter at Saint, to that fair young Sophie Madame Monnier, whom he could not but steal, and be beheaded for, in effigy, for indeed hardly since the Arabian prophet lay dead to Ali's admiration was there seen such a love hero with the strength of thirty men. In war again he has helped to conquer Corsica, fought duels, irregular brawls, horse-whipped calumnious barons. In literature he has written on despotism, on lettres de cachet, erotic sapphic verterian, obscenities, profanities, books on the Prussian monarchy, on Cagliostro, on Calon, on the water companies of Paris, each book comparable, we will say, to a bituminous alarum fire, huge, smoky, sudden. The firepan, the kindling, the bitumen were his own, but the lumber of rags, old wood, and nameless combustible rubbish, for all is fuel to him, was gathered from Huxter, an ass pannier, of every description under heaven, whereby indeed Huxter's enough have been heard to exclaim, out upon it, the fire is mine. Nay, consider it more generally. Seldom had man such a talent for borrowing. The idea, the faculty of another man he can make his, the man himself he can make his. All reflex and echo, snarls old Mirabeau, who can see but will not. Crabbed old friend of men, it is his sociality, his aggregative nature, and will now be the quality of all for him. In that forty years' struggle against despotism, he has gained the glorious faculty of self-help, and yet not lost the glorious natural gift of fellowship, of being helped. Rare union! This man can live self-sufficing, yet lives also in the life of other men, can make men love him, work with him, a born king of men. But consider further how, as the old Marquis still snarls, he has made away with all formulas, a fact which, if we meditate it, will in these days mean much. This is no man of system, then. He is only a man of instincts and insights, a man, nevertheless, who will glare fiercely on any object and see through it and conquer it, for he has intellect, he has will, force beyond other men. A man not with logic spectacles, but with an eye, unhappily without decalogue, moral code or theorem of any fixed sort, yet not without a strong living soul in him, and sincerity there, a reality, not an artificiality, not a sham, and so he, having struggled forty years against despotism, and made away with all formulas, shall now become the spokesman of a nation bent to do the same. For is it not precisely the struggle of France, also to cast off despotism, to make away with her old formulas, having found them naught, worn out, far from the reality? She will make away with such formulas, and even go bare, if need be, till she have found new ones. End of the section The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Thornton, Miranda, New Zealand. The French Revolution, Chapter 1.44, The Procession, Part 2. Towards such work, in such manner, marches he, this singular Riquetti Mirabeau, in fiery rough figure, with black Samson locks under the slouch hat, he steps along there, a fiery, fuliginous mass, which could not be choked and smothered, but would fill all France with smoke. And now it has got air, 
it will burn its whole substance, its whole smoke atmosphere too, and fill all France with flame. Strange lot! Forty years of that smouldering, with foul fire damp and vapour enough, then victory over that, and like a burning mountain he blazes heaven high, and, for twenty-three resplendent months, pours out, in flame and molten fire torrents, all that is in him, the pharos and wonder sign of an amazed Europe, and then lies hollow, cold for ever. Pass on, thou questionable Gabriel Anare, the greatest of them all, in the whole national deputies, in the whole nation, there is none like and none second to thee. But now, if Mirabeau is the greatest, who of these six hundred may be the meanest? Shall we say that anxious, slight, ineffectual-looking man under thirty in spectacles there? His eyes, with the glasses off, troubled, careful, with upturned face, snuffling dimly the uncertain future time. Complexion of a multiplex atrabilier colour, the final shade of which may be the pale sea-green. That greenish-coloured individual is an advocate of Arras. His name is Maximilien Robespierre, the son of an advocate. His father founded mason lodges under Charles Edward, the English prince or pretender. Maximilien, the first-born, was thriftily educated. He had brisk Camille de Moulin for schoolmate in the college of Louis le Grand at Paris, but he begged our famed necklace cardinal, Rohan the patron, to let him depart thence and resign in favour of a younger brother. The strict-minded Max departed, home to paternal Arras, and even had a law-case there, and pleaded not unsuccessfully, in favour of the first Franklin thunder-rod. With a strict painful mind, an understanding small but clear and ready, he grew in favour with official persons, who could foresee in him an excellent man of business, happily quite free from genius. The bishop, therefore, taking counsel, appoints him judge of his diocese, and he faithfully does justice to the people. Till, behold, one day a culprit comes whose crime merits hanging and the strict-minded Max must abdicate, for his conscience will not permit the dooming of any son of Adam to die. A strict-minded, straight-laced man, a man unfit for revolutions, whose small soul, transparent, wholesome-looking as the small ale, could by no chance ferment into virulent Aligar, the mother of ever-new Aligar, till all France had grown acetous virulent. We shall see. Between which two extremes of grandest and meanest so many grand and mean roll on, towards their several destinies in that procession. There is Casal, the learned young soldier, who shall become the eloquent orator of royalism, and earn the shadow of a name. Experience Molnier, experience Malloway, whose presidential parliamentary experience the stream of things shall soon leave stranded. A petition has left his gown and briefs at Chartres for a stormier sort of pleading. Has not forgotten his violin, being fond of music. His hair is grizzled, though he is still young. Convictions, beliefs, placid, unalterable are in that man, not hindmost of them. Belief in himself. A Protestant clerical, Rabo saint Etienne, a slender young, eloquent and vehement Barnave, will help to regenerate France. There are so many of them young. Till thirty the Spartans did not suffer a man to marry, but how many men here under thirty, coming to produce not one sufficient citizen, but a nation and a world of such. The old to heal up rents, the young to remove rubbish. Which latter, is it not, indeed, the task here? Dim formless from this distance, yet authentically there, thou notest the deputies from Nantes? To us mere clothes-screens, with slouch hat and cloak, but bearing in their pocket a cahier of dolences with this singular clause, and much such in it that the master wig of Nantes be not troubled with new guild brethren, the actually existing number of ninety-two being more than sufficient. The round people have elected Farmer Gerard, a man of natural sense and rectitude, without any learning. He walks there, with solid step, unique, in his rustic farmer clothes, which he will wear always, careless of short cloaks and costumes. The name Gerard, or Père Gerard, Father Gerard, as they please to call him, will fly far, borne about in endless banter, in royalist satires, in republican didactic almanacs. As for the man Gerard, being asked once what he did, after trial of it, candidly think of this parliamentary work, I think, answered he, that there are a good many scoundrels among us. So walks Father Gerard, 
solid in his thick shoes, whithersoever bound. And worthy Dr. Guillotin, who we hope to behold one other time, if not here, the doctor should be here, and we see him with the eye of prophecy, for indeed the Parisian deputies are all a little late. Singular Guillotin, respectable practitioner, doomed by a satiric destiny to the strangest immortal glory that ever kept obscure mortal from his resting place, the bosom of oblivion. Guillotin can improve the ventilation of the hall. In all cases of medical police and hygiene be a present aid, but, greater far, he can reproduce his report on the penal code, and reveal therein a cunningly devised beheading machine, which shall become famous and world-famous. This is the product of Guillotin's endeavours, gained not without meditation and reading, which product popular gratitude or levity Christians by a feminine derivative name, as if it were his daughter, La Guillotine. With my machine, messieurs, I whisk off your head, in a twinkling, and you have no pain, whereat they all laugh. Unfortunate doctor, for two and twenty years he, unguillotined, shall near nothing but guillotine, see nothing but guillotine, then dying, shall through long centuries wander, as it were, a disconsolate ghost, on the wrong side of Styx and Lethe, his name likely to outlive Caesar's. C. Bailey, like Coyence of Paris, time-honoured historian of astronomy, ancient and modern. Poor Bailey, how thy serenely beautiful philosophing, with its soft moonshiny clearances and thinness, ends in foul thick confusion, of presidency, mayorship, diplomatic officiality, rabid triviality, and the throat of everlasting darkness. Far was it to descend from the heavenly galaxy to the drapeau rouge, beside that fatal dung-heap, on that last hell-day, thou must tremble, though only with cold, de froid. Speculation is not practice, to be weak is not so miserable, but to be weaker than our task. Woe the day when they mounted thee, a peaceable pedestrian, on that wild hippogriff of a democracy, which, spurning the firm earth, nay, lashing at the very stars, no yet known Astolfo could have written. In the Commons, deputies, there are merchants, artists, men of letters, three hundred and seventy-four lawyers, and at least one clergyman, the Abbe Sie. Him also Paris sends, among its twenty, behold him, the light thin man, cold but elastic, wiry, instinct with the pride of logic, passionless, or with but one passion, that of self-conceit. If indeed that can be called a passion, which, in its independent concentrated greatness, seems to have soared into transcendentalism, and to sit there with a kind of godlike indifference, and look down on passion. He is the man, and wisdom shall die with him. This is the C.A., who shall be system-builder, constitution-builder-general, and build constitutions as many as wanted, sky-high, which shall all unfortunately fall before he get the scaffolding away. La politique, said he to Dumont, polity is a science, I think I have completed. What things, O C.A., with thy clear assiduous eyes, art thou to see? But were it not curious to know how C.A., now in these days, for he is said to be still alive, looks out on all that constitution masonry through the roomy soberness of extreme age? Might we hope, still with the irrefragable transcendentalism, the victorious cause pleased the gods, the vanquished one pleased C.A.? Thus, however, amid sky-rending vivats and blessings from every heart, as the procession of the commons deputies rolled by. Next follow the noblesse, and next the clergy, concerning both of whom it might be asked what they specially have come for. Specially, little as they dream of it, to answer this question, put in a voice of thunder, What are you doing in God's fair earth and task garden, where whatsoever is not working is begging or stealing? Woe, woe to themselves and to all, if they can only answer, collecting tithes, preserving game. Remark, meanwhile, how Dorlian affects to stop before his own order, and mingle with the commons. For him are vivats, few for the rest, though all waving plumed hats of a feudal cut, have sword on thigh, though among them is Dantregru, the young Languedocian gentleman. Indeed, many appear more or less noteworthy. There are Liancourt and La Rochefoucauld, the liberal Anglomaniac dukes, there is a filially pious Lally, a couple of liberal Lameths. Above all, there is a Lafayette, 
whose name shall be Cromwell Grandison, and fill the world. Many a formula has this Lafayette too made away with, yet not all formulas. He sticks by the Washington formula, and by that he will stick, and hang by it, as by sure bower anchor hangs, and swings the tight warship, which, after all changes of wildest weather and water, is still found hanging. Happy for him, be it glorious or not. Alone of all Frenchmen he has a theory of the world, and right mind to conform thereto. He can become a hero and perfect character, were it but the hero of one idea. Note further our old parliamentary friend, Crispin Catalan d'Espremenil. He has returned from the Mediterranean islands, a red-hot royalist, repentant to the finger-ends, unsettled-looking, whose light, dusky glowing at best, now flickers foul in the socket, whom the National Assembly will by and by, to save time, regard as in a state of distraction. Note lastly that the globular younger Mirabeau, indignant that his elder brother is among the commons, it is Viscomte Mirabeau, named Ofna Mirabeau Tonneau, on account of his rotundity, and the quantities of strong liquor he contains. There then walks our French noblesse, all in the old pomp of chivalry, and yet, alas, how changed from the old position, drifted far down from their native latitude, like arctic icebergs, got into the equatorial sea, and fast thawing there. Once these chivalry deuces did actually lead the world, were it only towards battle spoil, where lay the world's best wages then. Moreover, being the ablest leaders going, they had their lion's shares, those deuces, which none could grudge them. But now, when so many looms, improved ploughshares, steam engines, and bills of exchange have been invented, and for battle ruling itself, men hire drill sergeants at eighteen pence a day. What mean these gold mantled chivalry figures, walking there in black velvet cloaks, in high plumed hats of a feudal cut, reeds shaken in the wind? The clergy have got up, with Cahia for abolishing pluralities, enforcing residence of bishops better payment of tithes. The dignitaries, we can observe, walk stately, apart from the numerous undignified, who indeed are properly little other than commons disguised in curate frocks. Here, however, though by strange ways, shall the precept be fulfilled, and they are greatest, much to their astonishment, become least. For one example, out of many, mark the plausible Gregoire. One day, Cure Gregoire shall be a bishop when the now stately are wandering, distracted, as bishops in partibus. With other thought, mark also the Ab Maori, his broad, bold face, mouth accurately primmed, full eyes that ray out intelligence, falsehood, the sort of sophistry which is astonished you should find it sophistical. Skilfulest vamper up of old rotten leather, to make it look like new. Always a rising man, he used to tell Mercier, you will see, I shall be in the academy before you. Likely indeed, thou skilfulest Maori. Nay, thou shalt have a cardinal's hat, and plush and glory, but alas also in the long run, mere oblivion, like the rest of us, and six feet of earth. What boots it, vamping rotten leather on these terms? Glorious in comparison is the livelihood thy good old father earns, by making shoes, one may hope in a sufficient manner. Maori does not want for audacity, he shall wear pistols by and by, and at death cries of the lamp iron answer coolly, Friends, you will see better there. But yonder, halting lamely along, thou notice next Bishop Talleyrand Perigord, his reverence of Altun. A sardonic grimness lies in that irreverent reverence of Altun. He will do and suffer strange things, and will become surely one of the strangest things ever seen, or like to be seen a man living in falsehood, and on falsehood, yet not what you can call a false man. There is the speciality. It will be an enigma for future ages, one may hope. Hitherto such a product of nature and art was possible only for this age of ours. Age of paper, and of the burning of paper. Consider Bishop Talleyrand and Marquis Lafayette as the topmost of their two kinds, and say once more, looking at what they did, and what they were, O Tempus Ferax Rerum! On the whole, however, has not this unfortunate clergy also drifted in the time-stream, far from its native latitude? 
an anomalous mass of men, of whom the whole world has already a dim understanding that it can understand nothing. They were once a priesthood, interpreters of wisdom, revealers of the holy that is in man, a true clerus, or inheritance of God on earth, but now they pass silently with such cahier as they have been able to redact, and none cries, God bless them. King Louis with his court brings up the rear. He cheerful, in this day of hope, is saluted with plaudits. Still more necker his minister. Nor so the queen, on whom hope shines not steadily any more. Ill-fated queen! Her hair is already grey with many cares and crosses. Her first-born son is dying in these weeks. Black falsehood has ineffectably soiled her name. Ineffectably, while this generation lasts. Instead of vive le Rhin, voices insult her with vive d'Orléans. Of her queenly beauty little remains except its stateliness, not now gracious, but haughty, rigid, silently enduring. With a most mixed feeling, wherein joy has no part, she resigns herself to a day she hoped never to have seen. Poor Marie Antoinette! With thy quick, noble instincts, vehement glancings, vision all too fitful narrow for the work thou hast to do oh there are tears in store for thee bitterest wailings soft womanly meltings though thou hast the heart of an imperial theresa's daughter thou doomed one shut thy eyes on the future and so in stately procession have passed the elected of france some towards honour and quick fire consummation most towards dishonour not a few towards massacre, confusion, emigration, desperation, all towards eternity. So many heterogeneities cast together into the fermenting vat, there with incalculable action, counteraction, elective affinities, explosive developments, to work out healing for a sick, moribund system of society. Probably the strangest body of men, if we consider well, that ever met together on our planet on such an errand. So thousandfold complex a society, ready to burst from its infinite depths, and these men, its rulers and healers, without life rule for themselves. Other life rule than a gospel according to Jean-Jacques. To the wisest of them, what we must call the wisest, man is properly an accident under the sky. Man is without duty round him, except it be to make the constitution. He is without heaven above him, or hell beneath him. He has no God in the world. What further or better belief can be said to exist in these twelve hundred? Belief in high-plumed hats of a feudal cut, in heraldic scutcheons, and the divine right of kings, in the divine right of game-destroyers? Belief, or what is still worse, canting half-belief, or worst of all, mere Machiavellic pretense of belief in consecrated dough-wafers, and the godhood of a poor old Italian man. Nevertheless, in that immeasurable confusion and corruption, which struggles there so blindly to become less confused and corrupt, there is, as we said, this one salient point of a new life discernible, the deep, fixed determination to have done with shams, a determination which, consciously or unconsciously, is fixed, which waxes ever more fixed, into very madness and fixed idea, which in such embodiment as lies provided there, shall now unfold itself rapidly, monstrous, stupendous, unspeakable, new for long thousands of years. How has the heaven's light, oft times in this earth, to clothe itself in thunder and electric murkiness, and descend as molten lightning, blasting, if purifying? Nay, is it not rather the very murkiness and atmospheric suffocation that brings the lighting and the light? The new evangel, as the old had been, was it to be born in the destruction of a world? But how the deputies assisted at high mass, and heard sermon, and applauded the preacher, church as it was, when he preached politics, how next day with sustained pomp they are for the first time installed in their salle de menus hall no longer of amusements and becomes a states general readers can fancy for themselves the king from his estrade gorgeous as solomon in all his glory 
runs his eye over that majestic hall. Many plumed, many glancing, bright tinted as a rainbow, in the galleries and near side spaces where beauty sits reigning bright influence. Satisfaction, as of one that after long voyaging had got to port, plays over his broad simple face. The innocent king! He rises and speaks with sonorous tone, a conceivable speech, with which, still more with the succeeding one hour and two hour speeches of Garde de Scot and Monsieur Necker, full of nothing but patriotism, hope, faith, and deficiency of the revenue, no reader of these pages shall be tried. We remark only that, as His Majesty, on finishing the speech, put on his plumed hat, and the noblesse, according to a custom, imitated him, our tiers attack deputies did mostly, not without a shade of fierceness, in like manner clap on, and even crush on their slouched hats, and stand there awaiting the issue. Thick buzz among them, between the majority and minority of Corez-vous, décorez-vous, hats off, hats on, to which His Majesty puts end by taking off his own royal hat again. The session terminates without further accident or omen than this, with which, significantly enough, France has opened her States General. Here ends the chapter. Section 27. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olga Bulova. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 5, Chapter 1, Inertia. That exasperated France, in the same National Assembly of hers, has got something, nay, something great, momentous, indispensable, cannot be doubted. Yet still the question were especially what, a question hard to solve even for calm onlookers at this distance, wholly insoluble to actors in the middle of it. The States General, created and conflated by the passionate effort of the whole nation, is there as a thing high and lifted up. Hope, jubilate, and cries aloud that it will prove a miraculous brazen serpent in the wilderness, whereon whosoever looks, with faith and obedience, shall be healed of all woes and serpent bites. We may answer, it will at least prove a symbolic banner, round which the exasperating complaining twenty-five millions, otherwise isolated and without power, may rally and work, what it is in them to work. If battle must be the work, as one cannot help expecting, then shall it be a battle banner, say an Italian gonfalon and its old republican carroccio, and shall tower up, carborne, shining in the wind, and with iron tongue peel forth many a signal a thing of prime necessity, which whether in the van or in the centre, whether leading or led and driven, must do the fighting multitude incalculable services. For a season, while it floats in the very front, nay, as it were, stands solitary there, waiting where the force will gather round it, this same national carroccio and the signal peals it strains are a main object with us. Force will gather round it, this same national carroccio and the signal peals it strains are a main object with us. The omen of the slouch hats clapped on shows the common deputies to have made up their minds on one thing, that neither noblesse nor clergy shall have precedence of them, hardly even majesty itself. To such length has the contrat social and force of public opinion carried us. For what is majesty but the delegate of the nation, delegated and bargained, with even rather tightly, in some very singular posture of affairs, which Jean-Jacques has not fixed the date of, Coming, therefore, into their hall, on the morrow, an inorganic mass of six hundred individuals, these commons deputies perceive, without terror, that they have it all to themselves. Their hall is also the grand, or general hall, for all the three orders. But the noblesse and clergy, it would seem, have retired to their two separate apartments, or halls, and are there verifying their powers, not a conjoint, but in a separate capacity. They are to constitute two separate, perhaps separately voting orders, then? It is as if both noblesse and clergy had silently taken for granted that they already were such. Two orders against one, and so the third order to be left in a perpetual minority? 
much may remain unfixed, but the negative of that is a thing fixed, and the slouch-hatted heads in the French nation's head. Double representation and all else hitherto gained were otherwise futile, null. Doubtless the powers must be verified. Doubtless the commission, the electoral documents of your deputy must be inspected by his brother deputies and found valid. It is the preliminary of all, neither in this question and of doing it separately or doing it conjointly a vital one. But if it lead to such, it must be resisted. Wise was that maxim, resist the beginnings. Nay, were a resistance inadvisable, even dangerous, yet surely pause is very natural. Pause, with twenty-five millions behind you, may become resistance enough. The inorganic mass of common deputies will restrict itself to a system of inertia, and for the present remain inorganic. Such method, recommendable alike for sagacity and to timidity, do the common deputies adopt. And not without adroitness, and with ever more tenacity, they persist in it, day after day, week after week. For six weeks there are histories of the kind named Baron, which indeed, as philosophy knows, is often the fruitfulest of all. These were their still creation days wherein they sat incubating. In fact, what they did was to do nothing, in a judicious manner. Daily the inorganic body reassembles, regrets that they cannot get organization, verification of powers in common, and begin regenerating France. Headlong motions may be made, but let such be repressed. Inertia alone is at once unpunishable and unconquerable. Cunning must be met by cunning, proud pretension by inertia, by a low tone of patriotic sorrow, low but incurable, unalterable, wise as serpents, harmless as doves. What a spectacle for France! Six hundred inorganic individuals, essential for its regeneration and salvation, sit there, on their elliptic benches, longing passionately towards life, in painful durance, like souls waiting to be born. Speeches are spoken, eloquent, audible within doors and without. Mind agitates itself against mind. The nation looks on with ever deeper interest. Thus do the commons deputies sit, incubating. There are private conclaves, supper parties, consultations. Breton club, club of Viroflay, germs of many clubs. Holy an element of confused noise, dimness, angry heat. Wherein, however, the heiress egg kept at the fit temperature may hover safe unbroken till it be hatched in your mounier malway le chapelier in science sufficient for that fervour in your barnave rabot at times shall come an inspiration from royal mirabeau he is no wise yet recognised as royal nay he was grand at when his name was first mentioned but he is struggling toward recognition in the course of the week, the commons having called their eldest to the chair, and furnished him with yon stronger lung assistance, can speak articulately, and in audible lamentable words declare, as we said, that they are an inorganic body, longing to become organic. Letters arrive, but an inorganic body cannot open letters. They lie on the table unopened. The eldest may at most procure for himself some kind of list or muster all to take the votes by, and wait what will betide. Noblesse and clergy are all elsewhere. However, an eager public crowds all galleries and vacancies, which in some comfort. With effort, it is determined now that a deputation shall be sent, for how can an inorganic body send deputations, but that certain individual commons members shall, in an accidental way, stroll into the clergy chamber, and then into the noblesse one, and mention there, as a thing they have happened to observe, that the commons seem to be sitting waiting for them in order to verify their powers. That is the wiser method. The clergy, among whom are such a multitude of undignified, of mere commons in curates' frocks, depute instant respectful answer that they are, and will now more than ever be, in deepest studies to that very matter. Contrarywise, the noblesse, in a cavalier attitude, reply, after four days, that they, for their part, are all verified and constituted, which they had trusted the commons also were, such separate verification being clearly the proper constitutional wisdom of ancestors' method, as they, the noblesse, will have much pleasure in demonstrating by a commission of their number, if the commons will meet them, commission against commission. 
directly in the rear of which comes the deputation of clergy reiterating in their insidious conciliatory way the same proposal. Here, then, is the complexity. What will wise commons say to this? Warily, inertly, the wise commons, considering that they are, if not a French third estate, at least an aggregate of individuals pretending to some title of that kind, determine, after talking on its five days, to name such a commission, though, as it were, with proviso not to be convinced. A sixth day is taken up and naming it, a seventh and an eighth day in getting the forms of meeting, place, hour, and the like settled so that it is not till the evening of the 23rd of May that the Noblesse Commission first meets Commons Commission. Clergy acting as conciliators, and begins the impossible task of convincing it. One other meeting on the 25th will suffice. The Commons are inconvincible, the Noblesse and clergy are fragilely convincing. The Commissions retire, each order persisting in its first pretensions. Thus have three weeks passed. For three weeks the third estate Carocio with far-seen Gonfalon has stood stock still, flout in the wind, waiting what force would gather round it. Fancy can conceive the feeling of the court, and how council met council, the loud-sounding inanity whirled in the distracted vortex where wisdom could not dwell. Your cunningly devised taxing machine has been got together, set up with incredible labor, and stands there, its three pieces in contact, its two flywheels of noblesse and clergy, its huge working wheel of tiers etat. The two flywheels whirl in the softest manner, but prodigious to look upon, the huge working wheel hangs motionless, refuses to stir. The cunningness engineers are at fault. How will it work when it does begin? Fearfully, my friends, and to many purposes, but to gather taxes, or grind court meal, one day apprehend never. Could we but have continued gathering taxes by hand? Messieurs d'Artois, Conti, Condé, named Corsin Virat, they of the anti-democratic Memoire au Roi, has not their foreboding proof true? They may wave reproachfully their high heads, they may beat their poor brains, but the cunningest engineers can do nothing. Necker himself, where he even listened to, begins to look blue. The only thing one sees advisable is to bring up soldiers. New regiments, two and a battalion of a third, have already reached Paris. Others shall get in march. Good were it in all circumstances to have troops within reach. Good that the command were in sure hands. Let Broglie be appointed. Old Marshal Duke de Broglie, veteran disciplinarian of a firm drill surgeon morality, such as may be depended on. For alas, neither are the clergy or the very noblesse what they should be, and might be, when so menaced from within, entire, undivided within. The noblesse, indeed, have their Catalin or Crispin d'Espermanil, dusky glowing, all in renegade heat, their boisterous barrel mirabeau, but also they have their Lafayettes, lion cords, lamas, above all their Dorleans, now cut forever from his court moorings, and musing drowsily of high and highest sea prices, for is not he too a son of Henri IV and partial potential Yves Apparent, on his voyage towards chaos? From the clergy again, so numerous are the curers, actual deserters have run over. Two small parties, and the second party, Cure, Cure Gringoire. Now there is talk of a whole hundred and forty-nine of them about to desert in mass and only restrained by an archbishop of Paris. It seems a losing game. But judge of France, if Paris sat idle all this while, addresses from far and near flow in, for our commons have now grown organic enough to be open letters, or indeed to cavil at them. Thus poor Marquise de Brez, supreme usher, master of ceremonies, or whatever his title was, writing about this time on some ceremonial matter, sees no harm in winding up with a Monsieur yours with sincere attachment. To whom does it address itself, the sincere attachment, inquires Mirabeau, to the dean of the tiers etat? There is no man in France entitled to write that, rejoins he, where read the galleries and the world will not be kept from applauding. Poor de Brez, these commons have a still older grudge on him, nor has he yet done with them. In another way, Mirabeau has had a protest against the quick suppression of his newspaper, Journal of the States General, and to continue it's under a new name in which act of valour the Paris electors, still busy redacting their cahiers, could not but support him, by address to his majesty. 
They claim utmost provisory freedom of the press. They have spoken even about demolishing the Bastille and directing a bronze patriot cane on it his side. These are the rich burghers. But now consider how it went, for example, with such loose miscellany, now all grown yellow theromanic, of loungers, prowlers, social nondescripts, and the distilled rascality of our planet, as wheels forever in the Palais Royal, or what low infinite groan, first changing into a growl, comes from Saint Antoine and the twenty five millions in danger of starvation. In the Palais Royal there has been erected, apparently by subscription, a kind of wooden tent en planche de bois, most convenient where select patriotism can now redact resolutions, deliver harangues with comfort, let the weather but, but as it will. Lovely is that satin at home. On his table, on his chair, in every cafe, stands a patriotic orator. A crowd round him within, a crowd listening from without, open-mouthed through open door and window, with thunders of applause for every sentiment of more than common hardness. In M. de Saint's pamphlet shop, close by, you cannot without strong elbowing get to the counter. Every hour produces its pamphlet, or litter of pamphlets. There were thirteen today, sixteen yesterday, ninety-two last week. Think of tyranny and scarcity, fervid eloquence, rumor, pamphleteering. Société Publicale, Breton Club, Enraged Club. And whether every tap room, coffee room, social reunion, accidental street group over white France was not an enraged club. To all which the Commons deputies can only listen with a sublime inertia of sorrow, reduced to busy themselves with their internal police. Sure, a position no deputies ever occupied, if they keep it with skill. Let not the temperature rise too high. Break not the arrow's egg till it be hatched, till it break itself. An eager public crowds all galleries and vacancies. Cannot be restrained from applauding. The two privileged daughters, the noblesse all verified and constituted, may look on with what face they will, not without a secret tremor of heart. The clergy, always acting the part of conciliators, make a clutch at the galleries and the popularity there, and miss it. Deputation of them arrives with dolorous message about the dearth of grains and the necessity there is of casting aside vain formalities and deliberating on this. An insidious proposal, which, however, the commons, moved thereto by C. Green Robespierre, dexterously accept as a sort of hint, or even pledge, that the clergy will forthwith come over to them, constitute the States General, and so cheapen grains. Finally, on the twenty sixth seventh, sorry, day the May Mirabeau, judging the time now nearly come, proposes that the inertia cease, that leaving the noblesse to their own stuff ways, the clergy be summoned, in the name of the God of peace, to join the commons and begin. To which summons, if they turn a deaf ear, we shall see, are not one hundred and forty nine of them ready to desert? O triumvirate of princes, new garde du Sobarantin, Thou home secretary Breteuil, Duchess Polignac and Queen, eager to listen. What is now to be done? This third estate will get in motion with the force of all France in it. Clergy machinery and noblesse machinery, which were to serve as beautiful counterbalances and drags, will be shamefully dragged after it and take fire along with it. What is to be done? The eau de boeuf waxes more confused than ever. Whisper and counter whisper, a very tempest of whispers. Leading men from all the three orders are nightly spirited thither. Conjure as many of them. But can they conjure this? Necker himself were now welcome, could he interfere to purpose. Let Necker interfere, then, and in the king's name. Happily that incendiary god of peace message is not yet answered. The three orders shall again have conferences. Under this patriot minister of theirs, somewhat may be hailed, clued up, we meanwhile get in forward Swiss regiments and a hundred pieces of filled artillery. This is what the Eau de Boeuf for its part resolves on. But as for Necker, alas, poor Necker, thy obstinate third estate, has one first last word, verification in common, as the pledge of voting and deliberating in common. Halfway proposals from such a tried friend, they answer with a stare. The tardy conferences speedily break up. The third estate, now ready and resolute, the whole world back in it, returns to his hall of the three orders, and Necker to the Eau de Boeuf, with the character of a disconjured conjurer there, 
fit only for this missile. And so the commons deputy are at last on their own strength getting underway. Instead of chairman or dean, they have now got a president, astronomer Bailly, underway with a vengeance, with endless vociferous and temperate eloquence, born in newspaper winds to all lands, they have now, on the seventeenth day of June, determined that their name is not Third Estate, but National Assembly. They then are the nation, triumvirate right of princes, queen, refractory noblesse and clergy. What then are you? A most deep question, scarcely answerable in living political dialects. All regardless of which, our new National Assembly proceeds to appoint a committee of subsistences, dear to France, though we can find little or no grain. Next, as if our National Assembly stood quite firm on its legs, to appoint four other standing committees, then to settle the security of the national debt, then that of the annual taxation, all within eight and forty hours. At such rate of velocity it is going, the conjurers of the haut de boeuf may well ask themselves, whither? End of section 27 Section 28 of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 5, Chapter 2, Mercury Debris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Now surely were the time for a god from the machine, there is an artist worthy of one. The only question is, which god? Shall it be Mars de Broly, with his hundred pieces of cannon? Not yet, answers Prudence. So soft, irresolute, is King Louis. Let it be messenger Mercury, our supreme usher de Breeze. On the morrow, which is the 20th of June, these hundred and forty-nine false curates, no longer restrainable by his grace of Paris, will desert in a body. Let de Brie intervene and produce closed doors. Not only shall there be royal session in that salle de menu, but not meeting, nor working, except by carpenters till then. Your third estate, self-styled National Assembly, shall suddenly see itself extruded from its hall by carpenters in this dexterous way, and reduced to do nothing, not even to meet or articulately lament, till Majesty with seance royale and new miracles be ready. In this manner shall de Bries, as Mercury ex machine intervene, and, if the oil de Boeuf mistake not, work deliverance from the notice. Of poor debris we can remark that he has yet proposed in none of his dealings with these commons. Five weeks ago, when they kissed the hand of, of majesty, the mode he took got nothing but censure. And then his sincere attachment, how was it scornfully whiffed aside? Before supper this night, he writes to President Bailey a new letter to be delivered shortly after dawn tomorrow in the king's name. Which letter, however, Bailey, in the pride of office, will merely crush together into his pocket like a bill he does not mean to pay. Accordingly, on Saturday morning of the 20th of June, shrill-sounding heralds proclaim through the streets of Versailles that there is to be a séance royale next Monday and no meeting of the States General till then. And yet we observe President Bailey, in sound of this, and with Debris' letter in his pocket, is proceeding with National Assembly at his heels to the accustomed salle de menu as if breeze and heralds were mere wind. It is shut, this salle, occupied by a guard francais. Where is your captain? The captain shows his royal order. Workmen, he is grieved to say, are all busy setting up the platform for his majesty's seance. Most unfortunately, no admission. Admission at furthest for president and secretaries to bring away papers, which the joiners might destroy. President Bailey, enters with secretaries and returns bearing papers alas within doors instead of patriotic eloquence there is now no noise but hammering sawing and operative screeching and rumbling a profanation without parallel the deputies stand grouped on the paris road on this umbrageous avenue de versailles complaining about the aloud of the indignity done them courtier it is supposed look from their windows and giggle the morning is none of the most comfortable raw it is even drizzling a little but all travellers pause patriot gallerymen miscellaneous spectators increase the groups wild councils alternate some desperate deputies propose to go and hold sessions on the great outer staircase at marley 
under the king's windows for his majesty it seems has driven over thither others talk of making the chateau for court what they call place de arms a runny mead a new champ de maille of free frenchmen nay of awakening to sounds of indignant patriotism the echoes of the oil de boeuf itself notice is given that president bailey aided the judicious guillotine and others has found place in the tennis court of the rue saint francois thither in long drawn files horse jingling like cranes on wing the commons deputies angrily went strange sight was this in the rue saint francois view versailles a naked tennis court as the pictures of that time still give it four walls naked except aloft some poor wooden penthouse or roof spectators gallery hanging round them on the floor not now an idle teeing of snapping of balls and rackets but the bellowing din of an indignant national representation scandally exiled hither however a cloud of witnesses looks down on them from wooden penthouse from wall top from adjoining roof and chimney rolls toward them from all the quarters with passionate spoken blessings some tables can be procured to write on some chair if not to sit on then to stand on the secretaries undo their tapes bailey has constituted the assembly experience mounier not wholly new to such things in parliamentary revolts which has seen or heard of thinks that it were well in these lamentable threatening circumstances to unite themselves by an oath universal acclamation as from smouldering bosoms getting vent the oath is redacted pronounced aloud by president bailey and indeed in such sonorous tone that the cloud of witnesses even outdoors hear it and bellow response to it six hundred right hands raised with president bailey's to take god above to witness that they will not separate from man below but will meet in all places under all circumstances wheresoever two or three can get together till they have made the constitution made the constitution friends that is a long task six hundred hands meanwhile will sign as they have sworn six hundred save one one loyalist abdiel still visible by this sole light point and nameable for m martin duke from Castellandry in languedoc him they permit to sign or signify refusal they even save him from the cloud of witnesses by declaring his head deranged at four o'clock the signatures are all appended new meeting is fixed for monday morning earlier than the hour of the royal session that our hundred and forty-nine clerical deserters be not balked we shall meet at the recoyet church or elsewhere in hope that our hundred and forty-nine will join us and now it is time to go to dinner this then is the session of the tennis court from seance de jeu de palm the fame of which has gone forth to all lands this is mercury the breeze's appearance as do ex machina this is the fruit it brings the giggle of courtier in the versailles avenue has already died into gaunt silence did the distracted court with garde de sceaux barentine triumvirate and company imagine that they could scatter six hundred national deputies big with a national constitution like as much barn door poultry big with next to nothing by the white or black rod of a supreme usher barn door poultry fly cackling but national deputies turn around lion faced and with an uplifted right hand swear an oath that makes the four corners of france tremble president bailey has covered himself with honor which shall become rewards the national assembly is now doubly and trebly the nation's assembly not militant martyred only but triumphant insulted and which could not be insulted paris disembogues itself once more to witness with grim looks the seance royale which by a new felicity is postponed till tuesday the hundred and forty-nine and even with bishops among them all in processional mass have had free leisure to march off and solemnly join the commons sitting waiting in their church the commons welcome them with shouts with embracings nay with tears for it is a growing life and death matter now as for the seance itself the carpenters seem to have accomplished their platform but all else remains unaccomplished futile we may say fatal was the whole matter king louis enters through seas of people all grim silent angry with many things for it is a bitter rain too enters to a third estate likewise grim silent which has been wedded waiting under mean porches at back doors while court and privilege were entering by the front king and garde de so there is no necker visible make known 
not without long-windedness, the determinations of the royal breast. The three orders shall vote separately. On the other hand, France may look for considerable constitutional blessings, as specified in these 530 articles, which Gardesau is waxing hoarse and with reading, which 5 and 30 articles adds His Majesty again rising. If the three orders most unfortunately cannot agree together to effect them, I myself will effect. Sur je ferai le bien de mes bepères, which being interpreted may signify you contentious deputies of the state general have probably not long to be here but in fine all shall now withdraw for this day and meet again each order in its separate place to-morrow morning for a dispatch of business this is the determination of the royal breast pithy and clear and here with king retinue noblesse majority of clergy file out as if the whole matter were satisfactorily completed these file out through grim silent seas of people one of the common deputies file not out but stand there in gloomy silence uncertain what they shall do one man of them is certain one man of them discerns and dares it is now that king mirabeau starts to the tribune and lifts up his lion voice barely a word in season for in such scenes the moment is the mother of ages had not gabriel honore been there one can well fancy how the commons deputies affrighted at the perils which now yawn dim all around them and waxing ever paler in each other's paleness might very naturally one after one have glided off and the whole corpse of european history have been different but he is there list to the brule of that royal forest voice sorrowful low fast swelling to a roar eyes kindle at the glance of his eye national deputies were missioned by a nation they have sworn an oath but lo while the lion's voice roars louderest what apparition is this apparition of mercury de Bries, muttering somewhat speak out cry several messieurs shrill de Bries, repeating himself you have heard the king's orders mirabeau glares on him with fire flashing face shakes the black lion's mane yes monsieur we have heard what the king was advised to say and you who cannot be the interpreter of his orders to the states general you who have neither place nor right of speech here you are not the man to remind us of it go monsieur tell those who sent you that we are here by the will of the people and that nothing shall send us hence but the force of bayonets and poor debris shivers forth from the national assembly and also finally from the page of history Hapless debris, doomed to survive long ages in man's memory in this faint way with tremulent white rod, he was true to etiquette, which was his faith here below. A martyr to respective persons, short woolen cloaks, could not kiss Majesty's hand as long velvet ones did. Nay, lately, when the poor little dolphin lay dead and some ceremonial visitation came, he was, he was not punctual to announce it, even to the dolphin's dead body. Monseigneur, a deputation of the States General, soon lacrim in rerum. But what does the oil de bouffe now when debris shivers back thither? Dispatch the same force of bayonets? Not so. The seas of people still hang multitudinous, intent on what is passing. Nay, rush and roll, loud billowing, into the courts of the chateau itself, for a report has risen that Necker is to be dismissed. Worst of all, the guards Francais seem indisposed to act. Two companies of them do not fire when ordered. Necker, for not being at the seance, shall be shouted for, carried home in triumph, and must not be dismissed. His grace of Paris, on the other hand, has to fly with broken coach panels, and owe his life to furious driving. The guard de corps, which you were drawing out, had better be drawn in again. There is no sending of bayonets to be thought of. Instead of soldiers, the oil de boeuf sends carpenters to take down the platform. Ineffectual shift. In few instances, the very carpenters cease wrenching and knocking at their platform, stand on it, hammer in hand, and listen open mouthed. The third estate is decreeing that it is, was, and will be nothing but a national assembly, and now, moreover, an, an inviolable one. All members of it inviolable, infamous treacherous towards the nation and guilty of capital crime is any person body corporate tribunal 
court or permission that now or henceforth during the present session or after it shall dare to pursue interrogate arrest or cause to be arrested detain or cause to be detained any on whose part soever the same be commanded which done one can wind up with this comfortable reflection from the abbe messieurs you are today what you were yesterday courtiers may shriek but it is and remains even so their well-charged explosion has exploded through the touch-hole covering themselves with scorches confusion and unseemly soot poor triumvirate poor queen and above all poor queen's husband who means well had he any fixed meaning folly is that wisdom which is wise only behindhand a few months ago these thirty-five concessions had filled france with a rejoicing which might have lasted for several years now it is unavailing the very mention of it slighted majesty's express orders said it not all france is in a roar a sea of persons estimated at ten thousand whirls all this day to the palace royal the remaining clergy and likewise some forty-eight noblesse d'orleans among them have now forthwith gone over to the victorious commons by whom as is natural they are received with acclamation the third estate triumphs versailles town shouting round at it ten thousand whirling all day in the palais royal and all france standing a tiptoe not unlike whirling let the oil de boeuf look to it as for king louis he will swallow his injuries will temporize keep silence will at all costs have present peace it was tuesday the twenty third of june when he spoke that peremptory royal mandate and the week is not done till he has written to the remaining obstinate noblesse that they also must oblige him and give in does bremeno rages his last beryl mirabeau breaks his sword making a vow which he might as well have kept the triple family is now therefore complete the third erring brother the noblesse having joined it erring but pardonable soothed so far as possible by sweet eloquence from president bailey so triumphs the third estate and states general are become national assembly and all france may sing to doom by wise inertia and wise cessation of inertia great victory has been gained it is the last night of june all night you meet nothing on the streets of versailles but men running with torches and shouts of jubilation from the second of may when they kiss the hand of majesty to this thirtieth of june when men run with torches we count seven weeks complete for seven weeks the national carroccio has stood far seen ringing many a signal and so much having now gathered round it may hope to stand this is the end of section twenty eight volume one book five chapter two section twenty nine of the french revolution this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeremiah Sutherland, Victoria, British Columbia. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 5, Chapter 3, Broly the War God. The court feels indignant that it is conquered, but what then? Another time it will do better. Mercury descended in vain. Now has the time come for Mars. The gods of the Eau de Boeuf have withdrawn into the darkness of their cloudy Ida, and sit there shaping and forging what may be needful, be it billets of a new national bank, munitions of war, or things forever inscrutable to men. Accordingly, what means this apparatus of troops? The National Assembly can get no furtherance for its committee of subsistences, can hear only that at Paris the baker's shops are besieged that in the provinces people are living on meal husks and boiled grass but on all highways there hover dust clouds with the march of regiments with the trailing of cannon foreign pandour of fierce aspect salis samad esther hazy royal allemand so many of them foreign to the number of thirty thousand which fear can magnify to fifty all wending towards paris and versailles already on the heights of montmartre is a digging and delving too like a scarping and trenching the effluence of paris is arrested versailles word by a barrier of cannon at sevres bridge from the queen's muse cannon stand pointed on the national assembly hall itself the national assembly has its very slumbers broken by the tramp of soldiery swarming and defiling endless or seemingly endless all round those spaces at dead of night without drum music without audible word of command what means it 
shall eight or even shall twelve deputies our mirabeaus barnaves at the head of them be whirled suddenly to the castle of ham the rest ignominiously dispersed to the winds no national assembly can make the constitution with cannon levelled on it from the queen's mews what means this reticence of the oeil de Beth, broken only by nods and shrugs in the mystery of that cloudy ida what is it that they forge and shape such questions must distracted patriotism keep asking and receive no answer but an echo enough of themselves but now above all while the hungry food year which runs from august to august is getting older becoming more and more a famine year with meal husks and boiled grass brigands may actually collect and in crowds at farm and mansion howl angrily food food it is in vain to send soldiers against them. At sight of soldiers they disperse, they vanish as underground, then directly reassemble elsewhere for new tumult and plunder. Frightful enough to look upon, but what to hear of, reverberated through twenty-five millions of suspicious minds. Brigands and Broly, open conflagration, preternatural rumor are driving mad most hearts in France. What will the issue of these things be? At Marseilles, many weeks ago, the townsmen have taken arms for suppressing of brigands and other purposes. The military commandant may make of it what he will. Elsewhere, everywhere, could not the like be done? Dubious on the distracted patriot imagination, wavers as a last deliverance some foreshadow of a national guard. But conceive above all the wooden tent in the Palais Royal, a universal hubbub there, as of dissolving worlds their loudest bellows the mad mad-making voice of rumour their sharpest gazes suspicion into the pale dim world whirlpool discerning shapes and phantasms imminent bloodthirsty regiments camped on the champ de mars dispersed national assembly red-hot cannonballs to burn paris the mad war-god and bellona's sounding thongs to the calmest man it is becoming too plain that battle is inevitable inevitable silently nod messeigneur and broly inevitable and brief your national assembly stopped short in its constitutional labors may fatigue the royal ear with addresses and remonstrances those cannon of ours stand duly leveled those troops are here the king's declaration with its thirty-five too generous articles was spoken was not listened to but remains yet unrevoked he himself shall effect it seul il fera as for broly he has his headquarters at versailles all as in a seat of war clerks writing significant staff officers inclined to taciturnity plumed aides de camp scouts orderlies flying or hovering he himself looks forth important impenetrable listens to besenval commandant of paris and his warning and earnest counsels for he has come out repeatedly on purpose with a silent smile the parisians resist scornfully cry messeigneur as a meal mob may they have sat quiet these five generations submitting to all their mercier declared in these very years that a parisian revolt was henceforth impossible stand by the royal declaration of the twenty third of june the nobles of france valorous chivalrous as of old will rally round us with one heart and as for this which you call third estate and which we call canaille of unwashed sans culottes of patelins scribblers factious spouters brave broly with a whiff of grape-shot salve de canon if need be will give quick account of it thus reason they on their cloudy ida hidden from men men also hidden from them good is grape-shot messeigneur on one condition that the shooter also were made of metal but unfortunately he is made of flesh under his buffs and bandoliers your hired shooter has instincts feelings even a kind of thought it is his kindred bone of his bone this same canaille that shall be whiffed he has brothers in it a father and mother living on meal husks and boiled grass his very doxy not yet dead in the spittle drives him into military heterodoxy declares that if he shed patriot blood he shall be accursed among men the soldier who has seen his pay stolen by rapacious foulon his blood wasted by soubise pompadour and the gates of promotion shut inexorably on him if he were not born noble is himself not without griefs against you your cause is not the soldier's cause but as would seem your own only and no other gods nor man's for example the world may have heard now at bethune lately when there rose some riot about grains of which sort there are so many and the soldiers stood drawn out and the word fire was given 
Not a trigger stirred. Only the butts of all muskets rattled angrily against the ground, and the soldiers stood glooming with a mixed expression of countenance, till clutched each under the arm of a patriot householder, they were all hurried off, in this manner to be treated and caressed, and have their pay increased by subscription. Neither have the Garde Française, the best regiment of the line, shown any promptitude for street firing lately. They return grumbling from Réveillon, and have not burnt a single cartridge since, nay, as we saw, not even when bid. A dangerous humour dwells in these Garde. Notable men, too, in their way. Valadi, the Pythagorean, was at one time an officer of theirs. Nay, in the ranks, under the three-cornered felt and cockade, what hard heads may there not be, and reflections going on, unknown to the public. One head of the hardest we do now discern there, on the shoulders of a certain Sergeant Hoche, Lazar Hoche, that is the name of him. He used to be about the Versailles royal stables, nephew of a poor herb woman, a handy lad, exceedingly addicted to reading. He is now Sergeant Hoche, and can rise no farther. He lays out his pay in rushlights, and cheap editions of books. On the whole, the best seems to be, consign these Gardes Françaises to their barracks, so Bessonval thinks and orders. Consigned to their barracks, the God Francaise do but form a secret association, an engagement not to act against the National Assembly. Debauched by Valadi the Pythagorean, debauched by money and women, cry Bessonval and innumerable others. Debauched by what you will, or in need of no debauching, behold them, long files of them, their consignment broken, arrive, headed by their sergeants, on the 26th day of June, at the Palais Royal. Welcome with viva, with presents, and a pledge of patriot liquor, embracing and embraced, declaring in words that the cause of France is their cause, next day and the following days the like. What is singular, too, except this patriot humor and breaking of their consignment, they behave otherwise with the most rigorous accuracy. They are growing questionable, these gaud. Eleven ringleaders of them are put in the abbe prison. It boots not in the least. The imprisoned eleven have only, by the hand of an individual, to drop towards nightfall a line in the Café de Foy, where patriotism harangues loudest on its table. Two hundred young persons, soon waxing to four thousand, with fit crowbars, roll towards the abbé, smite us under the needful doors, and bear out their eleven with other military victims, to supper in the Palais Royal Garden, to board and lodging in camp beds in the Théâtre de Variété other national pritoneum as yet not being in readiness. Most deliberate, nay, so punctual were these young persons, that finding one military victim to have been imprisoned for real civil crime, they returned him to his cell with protest. Why new military force was not called out? New military force was called out. New military force did arrive, full gallop with drawn sabre. But the people gently laid hold of their bridles. The dragoons sheathed their swords, lifted their caps by way of salute, and sat like mere statues of dragoons. Except, indeed, that a drop of liquor being brought them, they drank to the king and nation with the greatest cordiality. And now ask in return why Messeigneur Ambroli, the great god of war, on seeing these things, did not pause and take some other course, any other course. Unhappily, as we said, they could see nothing. Pride, which goes before a fall, wrath, if not reasonable, yet pardonable, most natural, had hardened their hearts and heated their heads. So, with imbecility and violence, ill-matched pair, they rushed to seek their hour. All regiments are not Garde Française, or debauched by Valadi, the Pythagorean. Let fresh undebauched regiments come up. Let Royal Allemand, Salah Samad, Swiss Chateau, Vieux, come up, which can fight but can hardly speak except in German gutturals. Let soldiers march, and highways thunder with artillery wagons. Majesty has a new royal session to hold, and miracles to work there. The whiff of grapeshot can, if needful, become a blast and tempest. In which circumstances, before the red-hot balls begin raining, may not the hundred and twenty Paris electors, though their cahier is long since finished, see good to meet again daily as an electoral club, they meet first in a tavern, where the largest wedding party cheerfully give place to them. But latterly they meet in the Hôtel de Ville, in the town hall itself. Flessel, provost of merchants, with his four échevins, could not prevent it. Such was the force of public opinion. He, with his échevins, and the six-and-twenty town councillors, all appointed from above, may well sit silent there in their long gowns, and consider with awed eye what prelude this is of convulsion coming from below, 
and how themselves shall fare in that. End of section 29. Section 30 of the French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeremiah Sutherland, Victoria, British Columbia. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle, Volume 1, Book 5, Chapter 4, To Arms. So hangs it, dubious, fateful, in the sultry days of July. It is the passionate printed advice of Monsieur Marat to abstain of all things from violence. Nevertheless, the hungry poor are already burning town barriers, where tribute on eatables is levied, getting clamorous for food. The 12th July morning is Sunday. The streets are all placarded with an enormous sized de par le roi, inviting peaceable citizens to remain within doors, to feel no alarm, to gather in no crowd. Why so? What mean these placards of enormous size? above all what means this clatter of military dragoons hussars rattling in from all points of the compass towards the place louis quinze with a staid gravity of face though saluted with mere nicknames hootings and even missiles besaval is with them swiss guards of his are already in the champs elysees with four pieces of artillery have the destroyers descended on us then from the bridge of sevres to utmost vincennes from saint denis to the champ de mars we are begirt alarm of the vague unknown is in every heart the palais royal has become a place of awestruck interjections silent shakings of the head one can fancy with what dolorous sound the noontide cannon which the sun fires at the crossing of his meridian went off there bodeful like an inarticulate voice of doom are these troops verily come out against brigands where are the brigands what mystery is in the wind hark a human voice reporting articulately the job's news necker people's minister saviour of france is dismissed impossible incredible treasonous to the public peace such a voice ought to be choked in the waterworks had not the news-bringer quickly fled nevertheless friends make of it what you will the news is true necker is gone necker hies northward incessantly in obedient secrecy since yesternight we have a new ministry Broly the war god, aristocrat de Breteuil, Foulon, who said the people might eat grass. Rumor, therefore, shall arise in the Palais Royal and in broad France. Paleness sits on every face, confused tremor and fremescence, waxing into thunder peals of fury stirred on by fear. But see Camille Desmoulins from the Café de Foy rushing out, sibylline in face, his hair streaming, in each hand a pistol. He springs to a table. The police satellites are eyeing him. Alive they shall not take him. Not they alive, him alive. This time he speaks without stammering. Friends, shall we die like hunted hares, like sheep hounded into their pinfold, bleating for mercy where is no mercy but only a wetted knife? The hour is come, the supreme hour of Frenchman and man, when oppressors are to try conclusions with oppressed, and the word is swift death or deliverance forever. Let such hour be well come us meseems one cry only befits to arms let universal paris universal france as with the throat of the whirlwind sound only to arms to arms yell response of the innumerable voices like one great voice as of a demon yelling from the air for all faces wax fire-eyed all hearts burn up into madness in such or fitter words does camille evoke the elemental powers in this great moment friends continues camille some rallying sign cockades green ones the color of hope as with the flight of locusts these green tree leaves green ribbons from the neighboring shops all green things are snatched and made cockades of camille descends from his table stifled with embraces wetted with tears has a bit of green ribbon handed him sticks it in his hat and now to courteous image shop there to the boulevards to the four winds and rest not till france be on fire france so long shaken and wind parched is probably at the right inflammable point as for poor courteous who one grieves to think might be imperfectly paid he cannot make two words about his images the wax bust of necker the wax bust of dolion helpers of france these covered with crape as in funeral procession or after the manner of suppliants appealing to heaven to earth and tartarus itself a mixed multitude bears off for a sign 
as indeed man with his singular imaginative faculties can do nothing or nothing without signs thus turks look to their prophet's banner also osier mannequins have been burnt and necker's portrait has erewhile figured aloft on its perch in this manner march they a mixed continually increasing multitude armed with axes staves and miscellanea grim many sounding through the streets be all theatres shut let all dancing on planked floor or on the natural greensward cease instead of a christian sabbath and feast of ganget tabernacles it shall be a sorcerer's sabbath and paris gone rabid dance with the fiend for piper however besenval with horse and foot is in the place louis quinze mortals promenading homewards in the fall of the day saunter by from chaillot or passy from flirtation and a little thin wine with sadder step than usual will the bus procession pass that way behold it behold also prince lambesque dash forth on it with his royal en main shots fall and sabre strokes busts are hewn asunder and alas also heads of men a sabre procession has nothing for it but to explode along what streets alleys tuileries avenues it finds and disappear one unarmed man lies hewed down a garde francaise by his uniform bear him or bear even the report of him dead and gory to his barracks where he has comrades still alive but why not now victorious lambesque charge through that tuileries garden itself where the fugitives are vanishing not show the sunday promenaders too how steel glitters besprent with blood that it be told of and men's ears tingle tingle alas they did but the wrong way victorious lambesque in this his second or tuileries charge succeeds but in overturning call it not slashing for he struck with the flat of his sword one man a poor old schoolmaster most pacifically tottering there and is driven out by a barricade of chairs by flights of bottles and glasses by execrations in bass voice and treble most delicate is the mob queller's vocation wherein too much may be as bad as not enough for each of these bass voices and more each treble voice borne to all points of the city rings now nothing but distracted indignation will ring all another the cry to arms roars tenfold steeples with their metal storm voice boom shut as the sun sinks armorers shops are broken open plundered the streets are a living foam sea chafed by all the winds such issue came of lambesque's charge on the tuileries garden no striking of salutary terror into chaillot promenaders a striking into broad wakefulness of frenzy and the three furies which otherwise were not asleep for they lie always those subterranean eumenides fabulous and yet so true in the dullest existence of man and can dance brandishing their dusky torches shaking their serpent hair lambesque with royal allemand may ride to his barracks with curses for his marching music then ride back again like one troubled mind vengeful garde francaise sacreing with knit brows start out on him from their barracks in the chaussee d'antan pour a volley into him killing and wounding which he must not answer but ride on counsel dwells not under the plumed hat if the humanities awaken and broglie has given no orders what can a besenval do when the garde francaise with palais royal volunteers roll down greedy of more vengeance to the place louis quinze itself they find neither besenval lambesque royal allemand or any soldier now there gone is military order on the far eastern boulevard of saint antoine the chasseurs normandie arrive dusty thirsty after a hard day's ride but can find no billet master see no course in this city of confusions cannot get to besenval cannot so much as discover where he is normandy must even bivouac there in its dust and thirst until some patriot will treat it to a cup of liquor with advices raging multitudes surround the hotel de ville crying arms orders the six-and-twenty town councillors with their long gowns have ducked under into the raging chaos shall never emerge more besenval is painfully wriggling himself out to the champ de mars he must sit there in the cruelest uncertainty courier after courier may dash off for versailles but will bring back no answer can hardly bring himself back for the roads are all blocked with batteries and pickets with floods of carriages arrested for examination such was broglie's one sole order the oeil de boeuf hearing in the distance such mad din which sounded almost like invasion 
will before all things keep its own head whole. A new ministry with, as it were, but one foot in the stirrup, cannot take leaps. Mad Paris is abandoned altogether to itself. What a Paris when the darkness fell! A European metropolitan city hurled suddenly forth from its old combinations and arrangements, to crash tumultuously together, seeking new. Use and wont will now no longer direct any man. Each man, with what of originality he has, must begin thinking, or following those that think. Seven hundred thousand individuals, on the sudden, find all their old paths, old ways of acting and deciding, vanish from under their feet. And so there go they, with clangor and terror, they know not as yet whether running, swimming, or flying, headlong into the new era. With clangor and terror, from above, Broly the war-god impends preternatural with his red-hot cannonballs, and from below, a preternatural brigand world menaces with dirk and firebrand, madness rules the hour. Happily, in place of the submerged twenty-six, the electoral club is gathering, has declared itself a provisional municipality. On the morrow it will get Provost Flessel, with an échevin or two, to give help in many things. For the present it decrees one most essential thing, that forthwith a Parisian militia shall be enrolled. Depart, ye heads of districts, to labor in this great work, while we here in permanent committee sit alert. Let fencible men, each party in its own range of streets, keep watch and ward all night. Let Paris court a little fever sleep, confused by such fever dreams of violent motions at the Palais Royal, or from time to time start awake and look out palpitating in its nightcap at the clash of discordant, mutually unintelligible patrols, on the gleam of distant barriers going up all too ruddy towards the vault of night. End of section 30of the French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Allen. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 5, Chapter 5. Give us arms. On Monday, the huge city has awoke, not to its weekday industry, what a different one! The working man has become a fighting man, has one want only, that of arms. The industry of all crafts has paused, except it be the smiths, fiercely hammering pikes, and in a faint degree, the kitcheners cooking off-hand victuals, or boucher, bas toujours. Women, too, are sewing cockades, not now of green, which being d'artois color, the hôtel de ville, has had to interfere in it, but a red and blue are old Paris colors. These, once based on a ground of constitutional white, are the famed tricolors, which, if prophecy err not, will go round the world. All shops, unless it be the bakers and vintners, are shut. Paris is in the streets, rushing, foaming, like some Venice wine glass into which you would drop poison. The toxin, by order, is peeling madly from all steeples. Arms! Ye elector municipals! Thou flicel with thy eschvin! Give us arms! Flicel gives what he can, fallacious, perhaps insidious promises of arms from Charville. Order to seek arms here, order to seek them there. The new municipals give what they can some three hundred and sixty in different firelocks, the equipment of the city watch. A man in wooden shoes, and without coat, directly clutches one of them, and mounts guard. Also, as hinted, an order to all smiths to make pikes with their whole soul. Heads of districts are in fervent consultation. Subordinate patriotism roams distracted, ravenous for arms. Hitherto, at the Hôtel de Ville, was only such modicum of indifferent fireworks as we have seen. At the so-called arsenal, there lies nothing but rust, rubbish, and saltpeter, overlooked too by the guns of the Bastille, His Majesty's repository, what they call Garde Mouib, is forced and ransacked, tapestries enough, and gauderies, 
but of serviceable fighting gear, small stock. Two silver-mounted cannons there are, an ancient gift from His Majesty of Siam to Louis the Fourteenth, gilded sword of the good Henri, antique chivalry arms and armor. These and such as these, a necessitous patriotism snatches greedily for want of better. The Siamese cannons go trundling on an errand they were not meant for. Among the indifferent firelocks are seen tourney lances, the princely helm and hauberk glittering amid ill-hatted heads, as in a time when all times and their possessions are suddenly sent jumbling. At the Maison de saint Lazare, Lazare house once, now a correction house with priests, there was no trace of arms, but, on the other hand, born, plainly to a culpable extent. Out with it! to market, in this scarcity of grains? Heavens, will fifty-two carts in long row hardly carry it to Hallog Bled? Well, truly, ye reverend fathers, was your pantry filled, fat are your larders, over-generous your wine-bins, ye plotting exasperators of the poor, traitorous for stallers of bread. Vain is protesting, entreaty on bare knees. The house of St. Lazarus has that in it, which comes not out by protesting. Behold how, from every window it vomits, mere torrents of furniture, of bellowing and hurly-burly, the cellars also leaking wine, till, as was natural, smoke rose, kindled, some say, by the desperate St. Lazarites themselves, desperate of other riddance, and the establishment vanished from this world in flame. Remark, nevertheless, that a thief, set on or not, by aristocrats, being detected there, is instantly hanged. Look at the Chatelet prison. The debtor's prison of La Force is broken from without, and they that sat in bondage to aristocrats go free, hearing of which the felons at the Chatelet do likewise dig up their pavement and stand on the offensive with the best prospects, had not patriotism passing that way fired a volley into the Fenlon world, and crushed it down again under hatches. Patriotism consorts not with thieving and felony. Surely also punishment this day hitches, if she still hitch, after crime, with frightful shoes of swiftness. Some score or two of wretched persons, found prostrate with drink in the cellars of that same Lazare, are indignantly haled to prison. The jailer has no room whereupon other place of security not suggesting itself, it is written, On les pendis they hang them. Brief is the word, not without significance, be it true or untrue. In such circumstances the aristocrat, the unpatriotic rich man, is packing up for departure. But he shall not get departed. A wooden-shod force has seized all barriers, burnt or not, all that enters. All that seeks to issue is stopped there and dragged to the Hôtel de Ville. Coaches, tumbrils, plate, furniture, many meal sacks. In time, even flocks and herds encumber the palace de Grieve. And so it roars and rages and brays, drums beating, steeples peeling, friars rushing with handbells. Quote, Oyez, Oyez, all men to their districts to be enrolled. Unquote. The districts have met in gardens. Open squares are getting marshaled into volunteer troops. No red-hot ball has yet fallen from Besenval's camp. On the contrary, deserters with their arms are continually dropping in. Nay now, joy of joys! At two in the afternoon, the guard Francais, being ordered to send a knee, and flatly declining, have come over in a body. It is a fact worth many. 3,600 of the best fighting men, with complete accoutrement, with cannoneers even, and cannon, their officers are left standing alone, could not so much as succeed in spiking the guns. The very Swiss, it may now be hoped, Chateau Vieux and the others will have doubts about fighting. Our Parisian militia, which some think it were better to name National Guard, is prospering as heart could wish. It promised to be 48,000, but will in a few hours double and quadruple that number. Invincible, 
if we had only arms. Let's see the promised Charleville boxes, marked artillery. Here then are arms enough. Conceive the blank face of patriotism when it found them filled with rags, foul linen, candle ends, and bits of wood. Provost of the merchants, how is this? Neither at the Chartreux convent, whither we were sent with signed order, is there, or ever was there, any weapon of war. Nay, here, in the Seine boat, safe under tarpaulings, had not the nose of patriotism been of the finest? Are five thousand weight of gunpowder not coming in, but surreptitiously going out? What meanst thou, Flacelles? Tis a ticklish game, that of amusing us. Cat plays with captive mouse, but mouse with enraged cat, with enraged national tiger. Meanwhile, the faster, O ye black apron smiths, smite with strong arm and willing heart. This man and that, all stroke from head to heel, shall thunder alternating, and ply the great forge hammer, till stithy reel and ring again, while ever and anon, overhead, booms the alarm cannon, for the city has now got gunpowder. Pikes are fabricated, fifty thousand of them, in six and thirty hours. Judge whether the black aproned have been idle. Dig trenches, unpave the streets, ye others, assiduous, man and maid, cram the earth in barrel barricades, at each of them volunteer sentry. Pile the white stone in window sills and upper rooms. Have scalding pitch, at least boiling water ready. You weak old women, to pour it and dash it on royal alamand. With your old skinny arms, your shrill curses along with it will not be wanting. Patrols of the newborn National Guard bearing torches, scour the streets all that night, which otherwise are vacant, yet illuminated in every window by order. Strange looking, like some naphtha lighted city of the dead, with here and there a flight of perturbed ghosts. O oh, poor mortals, how you make this earth bitter for each other, this fearful and wonderful life, fearful and horrible, and Satan has his place in all hearts. Such agonies and ragings and wailings ye have, and have had, in all times, to be buried all in so deep silence, and the salt sea is not swollen with your tears. Great, meanwhile, is the moment when tidings of freedom reach us, when the long-enthralled soul from amid its chains and squalid stagnancy arises. Were it still only in blindness and bewilderment, and swears by him that made it, that it will be free, free! Understand that well. It is the deep commandment, dimmer or clearer, of our whole being to be free. Freedom is the one purport, wisely aimed at or unwisely, of all man's struggles, toilings, and sufferings in this earth. Yes, supreme is such a moment, if thou have known it. First vision, as of a flame-girt Sinai, and this our waste pilgrimage, which thenceforth wants not its pillar of cloud by day, and pillar of fire by night. Something it is, even, nay, something considerable, when the chains have grown corrosive, poisonous, to be free from oppression by our fellow man. Forward, ye maddened sons of France, be it towards this destiny or towards that. Around you is but starvation, falsehood, corruption, and the calm of death. Where ye are is no abiding. Imagination may imperfectly figure how Commandant Benceval in the Champs de Mars has worn out these sorrowful hours insurrection all around, his men melting away. From Versailles to the most pressing messages comes no answer, or once only some vague word or answer which is worse than none. A council of officers can decide merely that there is no decision. Colonels inform him, weeping, that they do not think their men will fight. Cruel uncertainty is here, war God. Brogley sits yonder, inaccessible in his Olympus, does not descend terror-clad, does not produce his whiff of grape-shot, sends no orders. Truly, in the Chateau of Versailles, all seems mystery, 
in the town of Versailles, were we there, all is rumor, alarm, and indignation. An august National Assembly sits, to appearance menaced with death. Endeavoring to defy death, it is resolved that Necker carries with him the regrets of the nation. It is sent solemn deputation over to the chateau, with entreaty to have these troops withdrawn. In vain, his majesty, with a singular composure, invites us to be busy rather with our own duty, making the constitution, foreign pandors and such like, go pricking and prancing, with a swashbuckler air, with an eye too probably to the salle de menu, were it not for the grim-looking countenances that crowd all avenues there. Be firm, ye national senators, the sinusure of a firm, grim-looking people. The august national senators determine that there shall, at least, be permanent session till this thing end. Wherein, however, consider that worthy Lefranc de Pompignon, our new president, whom we have named Bailey's successor, is an old man, wearied with many things. He is the brother of that Pompignon, who meditated lamentably on the Book of Lamentations. Savez-vous pourquoi Jérôme, c'est le monté toute sa vie, c'est qu'il a prévoyé que Pompignon de tradire. Poor Bishop Pompignon withdraws, having got Lafayette for helper or substitute. This latter, as nocturnal vice-president, with a thin house and disconsolate humor, sits sleepless, with lights unsnuffed, waiting what the hours will bring. So at Versailles, but at Paris, agitated Bensonville, before retiring for the night, has stepped over to old Monsieur de Sombrio of the Hôtel des Invalides. Hard by Monsieur Sombrio has what is a great secret. Some eight and twenty thousand stand of muskets deposited in his cellar there but no trust in the temper of his invalide. This day, for example, he sent twenty of the fellows down to unscrew those muskets, lest sedition might snatch at them, but scarcely in six hours had the twenty unscrewed twenty gun locks, or dog's heads, chien, of locks. Each invalide is dog's head. If ordered to fire, they would, he imagines, turn their cannon against himself, Unfortunate old military gentleman, it is your hour, not of glory. Old Marquis de Lunier, too, of the Bastille, has pulled up his drawbridges long since and retired into his interior, with sentries walking on his battlements under the midnight sky, aloft over the glare of illuminated Paris, whom a national patrol, passing that way, takes the liberty of firing at. Seven shots toward twelve at night, which do not take effect. This was the 13th day of July, 1789. A worse day, many said, than the last 13th was, when only hail fell out of heaven, not madness rose out of Tophet, ruining worse than crops. In these same days, as chronology will teach us, hot old Marquis Mirabeau lived stricken down at Argentuil, not within sound of these alarm guns, for he properly is not there, and only the body of him now lies, deaf and cold forever. It was on Saturday night that he, drawing his last life breaths, gave up the ghost there, leaving a world which would never go to his mind, now broken out, seemingly, into deliration and the culbut general. What is it to him, departing elsewhither, on his long journey, the old Chateau Mirabeau stands silent, far off on its scarped rock, in that gorge of two windy valleys, a pale fading specter now of a chateau. This huge world riot in France and the world itself fades also, like a shadow on the great still mirror sea, and all shall be as God wills. Young Mirabeau sat of heart, for he loved this crabbed brave old father, sad of heart and occupied with sad cares, is withdrawn from public history. The great crisis transacts itself without him. End of section 31
Section 32 of The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Allen. The French Revolution by Thomas Carlyle. Volume 1, Book 5, Chapter 6. Storm and Victory. But to the living and the struggling, a new fourteenth morning dawns. Under all roofs of this distracted city is the notice of a drama, not untragical, crowding toward solution. The bustling and preparings, the tremors and menaces, the tears that fell from old eyes. This day, my sons, ye shall quit you like men, by the memory of your father's wrongs, by the hope of your children's rights. Tyranny impends in red wrath. Help for you is none, if not in your own right hands. This day ye must do or die. From earliest light, a sleepless permanent committee has heard the old cry, now waxing almost frantic, mutinous. Arms! Arms! Provost Placel, or what traitors there are among you, may think of those Charville boxes, a hundred and fifty thousand of us and but the third man furnished with so much as a pike. Arms are the one thing needful. With arms we are unconquerable, man-defying National Guard. Without arms, a rabble to be whiffed with grape-shot. Happily the word has arisen, for no secret can be kept, that there lie muskets at the Hôtel des Invalides. Thither will we. Kings, procure Monsieur Ethi de Corny, and whatsoever authority a permanent committee can lend shall go with us. The Senville's camp is there. Perhaps he will not fire on us. If he kill us, we shall but die. Alas, poor Venceville, with his troops melting away in that manner, has not the smallest humor to fire. At five o'clock this morning, as he lay dreaming, oblivious in the école militaire, a figure stood suddenly at his bedside with face rather handsome, eyes inflamed, speech rapid and curt, air audacious. Such a figure drew Priam's curtains. The message and monition of the figure was that resistance would be hopeless, that if blood flowed, woe to him who shed it. Thus spoke the figure and vanished. Withal, there was a kind of eloquence that struck one. The Senville admits that he should have arrested him, but did not. Who this figure, with inflamed eyes, with speech rapid and curt, might be, Vencival knows, but mentions not. Camille de Moline? Pythagorean Marquis Villati, inflamed with violent motions all night at the Palais Royal. Fame names him Young Monsieur Maillard, then shuts her lips about him forever. In any case, behold, about nine in the morning, our national volunteers, rolling in long, wide flood, southwestward to the Hôtel des Invalides, in search of the one thing needful. King's procureur, Monsieur Athies de Corny, and officials are there. The curé of saint Antoine du Mont marches on Pacific at the head of his militant parish. The clerks of the Bazouche in red coats we see marching, now volunteers of the Bazouche the volunteers of the Palais Royal, national volunteers, numerable by tens of thousands, of one heart and mind, the king's muskets are the nation's. Think, old Monsieur de Sombreil, how, in this extremity, thou wilt refuse them. Old Monsieur de Sombreil would fain hold parley, send couriers, but it skills not. The walls are scaled, no invalid firing a shot. The gates must be flung open. Patriotism rushes in, tumultuous, from Grunsel up to Ridge Tile, through all rooms and passages, rummaging distractedly for arms. What cellar, or what cranny can escape it? The arms are found, all safe there, lying packed in straw, apparently with a view to being burnt. More ravenous than famishing lions over dead prey the multitude with clangor and vociferation, pounces on them, struggling, dashing, clutching. To the jamming up, 
to the pressure, fracture, and probably extinction of the weaker patriot. And so, with such protracted crash of deafening, most discordant orchestra music, the scene is changed. And eight and twenty thousand sufficient firelocks are on the shoulders of so many national guards, lifted thereby out of darkness into fiery light. Let Bensonful look at the glittering of these muskets as they flash by. Gars Francais, it is said, have cannon leveled on him, ready to open if need were. From the other side of the river, motionless sits he, astonished, one may flatter oneself, at the proud bearing of the Parisians. And now to the Bastille, ye intrepid Parisians! Their grape-shot still threatens, Thither all men's thoughts and steps are now treading. Old de Launay, as we hinted, withdrew into his interior soon after midnight of Sunday. He remains there ever since, pampered, as all military gentlemen now are, in the saddest conflict of uncertainties. The Hôtel de Ville invites him to admit national soldiers, which is a soft name for surrendering. On the other hand, His Majesty's orders were precise, his garrison is but eighty-two old invalides, reinforced by thirty-two young Swiss. His walls, indeed, are nine feet thick. He has cannon and powder, but alas, only one day's provision of victuals. The city, too, is French. The poor garrison, mostly French. Rigorous old de Launier, think what thou wilt do. All morning, since nine, there has been a cry everywhere. To the Bastille! Repeated deputations of citizens have been here, passionate for arms, whom de Launier has got dismissed by soft speeches through portholes. Towards noon, Elector Thoroy de la Roserie gains admittance, finds de Launier indisposed for surrender, nay, disposed for blowing up the place rather. Thoroy mounts with him to the battlements, heaps of paving stones, old iron and missiles lie piled, cannon all duly leveled. In every embrasure, a cannon, only drawn back a little. But outwards, behold! O oh, Thoroy, how the multitude flows on, welling through every street, toxin furiously peeling, all drums beating the general, the suburb Saint Antoine rolling hitherward, holy, as one man, such vision, spectral yet real, though, O oh, Thoroy, as from thy mount of vision, Beholdest in this moment, prophetic of what the phantasmagories and loud gibbering special realities which thou yet beholdest not, but shall. Quote, que voulez-vous? Unquote, said de Lognier, turning pale at the sight and with an air of reproach, almost of menace. Quote, Major, said Thoroy, rising into the moral sublime, what mean you? Consider if I could not precipitate both of us from this height, unquote. say only a hundred feet, exclusive of the walled ditch, whereupon de Launier fell silent. The right shows himself from some pinnacle to comfort the multitude becoming suspicious, commencing, and then descends, departs with protest, with warning addressed also to the invalide, on whom, however, it produces but a mixed indistinct impression. The old heads are none of the clearest. Besides, it is said that de Launier has been profuse of beverages. Prodigioix de Bossum. They think they will not fire. If not fired on, if they can help it, but must, on the whole, be ruled considerably by circumstances. Woe to thee, de Launier. In such an hour, if thou canst not, taking some one firm decision, rule circumstances. Soft speeches will not serve. Hard grape-shot is questionable, but hovering between the two is unquestionable. Ever wilder swells the tide of men, their infinite hum waxing ever louder into imprecations, perhaps into crackle of stray musketry, which latter, on walls nine feet thick, cannot do execution. The outer drawbridge has been lowered for Thoroy. New deputation of citizens, it is the third and noisiest of all, penetrates that way into the outer court. Soft speeches produce no clearance of these. De Lognier gives fire, pulls up his drawbridge, 
a slight sputter, which has kindled the too combustible chaos, made it a roaring fire chaos, burst forth insurrection at sight of its own blood, for there were deaths by that sputter of fire, into endless rolling explosion of musketry, distraction, execration, and overhead from the fortress, let one great gun with its grape shot go booming to show what we could do. The Bastille is besieged! On then, all Frenchmen, that have hearts in their bodies, roar with all your throats of cartilage and metal, ye sons of liberty, spur spasmatically whatsoever of utmost faculty is in you, soul, body, or spirit, for it is the hour. Smite thou, Louis Tournay, Cartwright of the Marais, old soldier of the regiment Dauphine, smite at that outer drawbridge chain, though the fiery hail whistles round thee, never, over knave or fellow, did thy axe strike such a stroke. Down with it, man, down with it to Orcus. Let the whole accursed edifice sink thither, and tyranny be swallowed up forever. Mounted, some say, on the roof of the guard room, some on bayonets struck into joints of the wall. Louis Tournay smites. Brave Aubin Bommeray, also an old soldier, seconding him. The chain yields, breaks. The huge drawbridge slams down, thundering. Avec fracas. Glorious! And yet, alas, it is still but the outworks. The eight grim towers with their invalid musketry, their paving stones and cannon mouths, still soar aloft intact. Ditch yawning impassable, stone faced, the inner drawbridge with its back towards us. The Bastille is still to take. To describe this siege of the Bastille, thought to be one of the most important in history, perhaps transcends the talent of mortals. Could one but after infinite reading get to understand so much as the plan of the building? But there is open esplanade at the end of the Rue Saint Antoine. There are such four courts. Cour Avage, Cour de Lume, arched gateway, where Louis Tournay now fights. Then new drawbridges, dormant bridges, rampart bastions, and the grim eight towers, a labyrinthic mass, high frowning there, of all ages from twenty years to four hundred and twenty, beleaguered in this its last hour, as we said, by mere chaos come again. Ordinance of all calibers throats of all capacities, men of all plans, every man his own engineer. Seldom since the war of pygmies and cranes was there seen so analogous a thing. Half pay Ellie is home for a suit of regimentals. No one would heed him in the colored clothes. Half pay Hui is harangued, guards Francais in the Palais de Grave. Frantic patriots pick up the grape shot, bear them, still hot, or seemingly so, to the Hôtel de Ville. Paris, you perceive, is to be burnt. Flessel is pale to the very lips, for the roar of the multitude grows deep. Paris wholly has got the acme of its frenzy, whirled always by panic madness. At every street barricade there whirls simmering, a minor whirlpool, strengthening the barricade, since God knows what is coming and all minor whirlpools play distractedly into that grand fire maelstrom which is lashing round the Bastille. And so it lashes and it roars. Chaudla, the wine merchant, has become an impromptu cannoneer. C. Georget, of the marine service, fresh from Brest, by the king of Siam's cannon. Singular, if we were not used to the like. Georget lay, last night, taking his ease at his inn. The king of Siam's cannon also lay, knowing nothing of him for a hundred years. Yet now, at the right instant, they have got together and discourse eloquent music. For hearing what was toward, Georges sprang from the breast de Légion and ran. Guards Francais also will be here, with real artillery. Were not the walls so thick? Upwards from the esplanade, horizontally from all neighboring roofs and windows, flashes one irregular deluge of musketry, without effect. The invalid lie flat, firing comparatively at their ease from behind stone, hardly through portholes, show the tip of a nose. We fall, shot, and make no impression. 
Let conflagration rage of whatever is combustible. Guard rooms are burnt, invalid mess rooms. A distracted peruke maker with two fiery torches is for burning the saltpeters of the arsenal. Had not a woman run screaming, had not a patriot with some tincture of natural philosophy instantly struck the wind out of him, butt of musket on the pit of stomach, overturned barrels, and stayed the devouring element. A young beautiful lady seized escaping in these outer courts, and thought falsely to be de Launay's daughter, shall be burnt in de Launay's sight. She lies swooned on a palace, but again a patriot. It is brave or bon Marie. The old soldier dashes in and rescues her. Straw is burnt, three carloads of it, hauled thither, go up in white smoke, almost to the choking of patriotism itself, so that Ellie had, with singed brow, to drag back one cart, and Riol, the gigantic haberdasher, another. Smoke, as of Tophet, confusion, as of Babel, noise, as of the crack of doom. Blood flows the ailment of new madness. The wounded are carried into houses of the Rue Sereseub. The dying leave their last mandate not to yield till the accursed stronghold falls. And yet, alas, how fall? The walls are so thick. Deputations, three in number, arrive from the Hôtel de Ville. Abbe Fouchet, who was of one, can say, with what almost superhuman courage of benevolence, these wave their town flag in the arched gateway and stand, rolling their drum, but to no purpose. In such crack of doom, de Launier cannot hear them, dare not believe them. They return with justified rage, a few of lead still singing in their ears. What to do? The firemen are here, squirting with their fire pumps on the invalid cannon to wet the touch holes. They unfortunately cannot squirt so high. Or produce only clouds of spray. Individuals of classic knowledge propose catapults. Santin, the sonorous brewer of the suburb Saint Antoine, advises rather that the place be fired by a mixture of phosphorus and oil of turpentine spouted up through forcing pumps. O Spinola Santin, hast thou the mixture ready? Every man his own engineer! And still the fire deluge abates not. Even women are firing, and Turks, at least one woman, with her sweetheart, and one Turk. Guards Francais have come, real cannon, real cannoneers. Usher Maillard is busy, half pay Elie, half pay Ula, rage in the midst of thousands. How the great Bastille clock ticks, inaudible, in its inner court there, at its ease, hour after hour, as if nothing special for it or the world, were passing. It told, one when the firing began, and is now pointing towards five, and still the firing slakes not. Far down in their vaults, the seven prisoners hear muffled din, as of earthquakes. Their turnkeys answer vaguely. Woe to thee, de Launier, with thy poor hundred invalides. Broy is distant, and his ears heavy. Bezenville hears, but can send no help. One poor troop of hussars has crept, reconnoitering cautiously along the quays, as far as the Pont Neuf. Quote, we are come to join you, unquote, said the captain, for the crowd seemed shoreless. A large-headed dwarfish individual, of smoke-bleared aspect, shambles forward, opening his blue lips, for there is sense in him and croaks, quote, alight then, and give up your arms, unquote. The hussar captain is too happy to be escorted to the barriers and dismissed on parole. Who the squat individual was? Men answer, it is Major Merat, author of the excellent Pacific Avis au People. Great truly, O thou remarkable dog leech, is this thy day of emergence and new birth? And yet this same day come four years. But let the curtains of the future hang. What shall de Launier do? One thing only de Launier could have done. What he said he would do. Fancy him sitting for the first, with lighted taper, within arm's length of the powder magazine, motionless, 
like old Roman senator or bronze lamp holder, coldly appraising the Roy and all men by a slight motion of his eye, what his resolution was. Harmless, he sat there, while unharmed, but the king's fortress, meanwhile, could, might, would, or should, in no wise be surrendered, save to the king's messenger. One old man's life worthless, so it be lost with honor. But think, ye brawning can I, how will it be when a whole bastille springs skyward? In such statuesque, taper-holding attitude, one fancies de Lognier might have left the Roy. The red clerks of Bazoche, Curie of St. Stephen, and all the tag-red and bobtail of the world, to work their will. And yet, withal, he could not do it. Hast thou considered how each man's heart is so tremulously responsive to the hearts of all men? Hast thou noted how omnipotent is the very sound of many men? How long their shriek of indignation palsies the strong soul? Their howl of contumely withers with unfelt pangs? The Ritter Gluck confessed that the ground tone of the noblest passage in one of his noblest operas was the voice of the populace he had heard at Vienna, crying to their Kaiser, Bread! Bread! Great the combined voice of men the utterance of their instincts, which are truer than their thoughts. It is the greatest a man encounters among the sounds and shadows which make up this world of time. He who can resist that has his footing somewhere beyond time. De Lunier could not do it. Distracted, he hovers between the two, hopes in the middle of despair, surrenders not his fortress, declares that he will blow it up, seizes torches to blow it up, and does not blow it up. Unhappy old Delonier, it is the death agony of thy Bastille and thee. Jail, jailering, and jailer, all three, such as they may have been, must finish. For four hours now has the world bedlam roared. Call it the world chimera, blowing fire. The poor invalid have sunk under their battlements, or rise only with reversed muskets. They have made a white flag of napkins, go beating the chamad, or seeming to beat, for one can hear nothing. The very Swiss at the portcullis look weary of firing, disheartened in the fire deluge. The porthole at the drawbridge is open, as by one that would speak. See Auger Maillard, the shifty man, on his plank swinging over the abyss of that stone ditch, plank resting on parapet, balanced by weight of patriots. He hovers perilous, such a dove toward such an ark. Deftly, thou shifty Ushier. One man already fell and lies smashed, far down there against the masonry. Ushier Maillard falls not. Deftly unerring he walks, with outspread palm. The Swiss holds a paper through his porthole. The shifty Usher snatches it and returns. Terms of surrender. Pardon. Immunity to all. Are they accepted? Quote, For d'officer, on the word of an officer, unquote, answers half-pay Huyin, or half-pay Eli, for men do not agree on it. Quote, they are, unquote. Boucher Maillard, bolting it when down, rushes in the living deluge. The Bastille is fallen! Victory! The Bastille breeze! End of part 32